This is the Art of Darkness podcast with Kevin Kautzman and Brad Kelly. We're a couple of very online writers interested in the dark side of what drives creative people to create against all odds. This show is about art and the people who make it, what it costs them, and what it takes to bring something unique and impactful into the world. Each episode, we excavate the life and work of an artist you might think you know. Don't worry, they're all safely dead. On every episode, we try and find out just what the hell was wrong with them and how they worked through their darkness to create something that lives on after them and continues to move culture. Find us online at artofdarkpod.com and on Twitter at artofdarkpod. We are back with another episode of... Heart of Darkness, a podcast about the dark side of creativity, and I am as sober as I've ever been. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's good. I, yeah, I think I don't know. Right, depends, I've been, depends on who you ask. Yeah, I have been re- uh, listening, listening. I've been reading a lot too, mm. listening to the Moody Blues. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, Timothy Leary's dead. No, 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 no. He's out on the outside looking oh. in. Yeah. And mm, that's creepy. Mm. That's a creepy. Mm. Yeah. The, it's, the, the song is a little, a little creepy. It's a vibe. The mm-hmm. song. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll get to it. I think I'm going to read the lyrics to that song because today, tonight, what is time? What is space? <laughs> What is what was the sixties? <laughs> Even uh, mm-hmm. we are going to be talking about the guru of psychedelia, the acid man himself, Mister Come Together. Right now, over me, Timothy Leary, Doctor Timothy. Oh yes, Leary. don't forget the doctor. That's mm-hmm. right. That's right. yeah, the good, the good doctor. Yeah. Uh yeah. We're gonna. So yeah, buckle up. This is gonna be. Yeah, a this long is gonna be it. This is gonna be a trip. <clears throat> Nah. Mm, indeed yes it is yeah we're, we're gonna go for all of those uh low-hanging uh, all it. of yeah. that low-hanging fruit yeah, yeah. uh <laughs> you're gonna want to tune in turn on and pot out today <laughs> <laughs> and uh it's nice it's we're going back to our roots here as we yeah. prepare for, for season three it's just brad and me we it's we cozy. have our in- it's cozy it in is. here it's cozy yeah. we mm-hmm. are we're lighting the incense we are we've got the the Beatles knockoff music for the, the six and a half minute long songs uh <laughs> playing. There's flute, there's strings, <laughs> there's there's an Irish jig in the middle. Right. It's right. it's whatever you want. Yeah. None of it makes a lot of sense. None of it's particularly good, but it's there. <laughs> Indeed. It's that song's <laughs> actually a banger. Which uh, one is that? Come uh, together? No, well, come together is an all-time come great banger, but I'm banger. talking about yeah. the the Moody Blues song about Timothy. Oh Moody. yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, it's funny. I put it on uh, a few minutes ago. I was doing show prep and getting ready, and I had my uh, my headphones here, and the song starts, and it's coming out of one side at the mm. beginning, and I'm mm. going, oh, "Am I having a technical problem? No, it's just 1968 and the headphones, <laughs> and then it's." <laughs> And then as soon as they start singing, it comes yeah. out of my little whoa. Oh, uh, right. Because you're supposed to be on a beanbag with this thing <laughs> on headphones, yeah. stoned mm-hmm. out of your mind. And, you know, mm-hmm. yes. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. I, you've picked it up by now. Our subject is Timothy Leary. A man President Richard Nixon once called the most dangerous man in America. He would later say, Leary, uh, that his avowed aim is to bring down the American empire. Uh, so so, he kind of was. I mean, mm, maybe not the most, but mm, right? I mean, in a certain way. Yeah. Indeed. So this episode is about a lot more than drugs, man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, first, a little bit of business, a little bit of housekeeping. Please support the pod on Patreon, patreon.com slash art of dark pod the entry rate right now to get in is three dollars it's going to five on january 1st 2023 we will grandfather you in if you come in before then at the three dollar level though of course we hope you will support the pod generously in 2023 we are launching bookends which is our book club and all that information is going to be on patreon we have a very special guest for our kickoff book which is brad 
Our kickoff book is Heart of Darkness by the great Joseph Conrad, the inspiration for the name of the show. Um, and I don't know, we want to say who our special guest is going to be that we're going to help is going to help us out with the book club. Our special guest is the judge himself, Aaron Gwynn, who is <laughs> yes, <he'd> like that. <laughs> uh, yeah. making a name for himself as a blood meridian expert. He teaches yeah. that and is beginning to, he has he now has his own, uh, is it a sub stack or a Patreon? It is a sub stack. Yeah. And it's good. I mean, he, he's just getting started, but he is off to the races. He's got two posts out now. If you're in the blood meridian, go check it out. It's great. And we're going to close the year next year with Blood Meridian as part as part of the yeah. the book club. And Aaron will join us for that. We're going to read Aaron's book. We're going to read a lot of other books that are germane to the subjects that we intend to cover next year. All the information about next year is in a, a, a toy ninety second uh, trailer that Brad created. You yeah. can find it at the website along with all of the other pertinent links at artofdarkpod.com. And please don't sleep on our Telegram, which is a, it's a chat app if you don't know it. A lot of fun stuff happening in there. Very active mm -hmm. chat. Mm -hmm. We love hearing from people. You'll find me there. You can torture Brad on Twitter uh, at Art of Dark pod how's that for housekeeping you feel good brad yeah no i think that's okay. i think that does it yeah let's let's get all into right. it yeah i'm i'm all warmed up <laughs> i'm coming up brad I'm, <laughs> the walls are melting my, <laughs> my but my outline is still here i can still oh, read Thank that's goodness. all that matters that's all mm. that matters yes well let's start with the opening question for every art of darkness core episode brad Brad Kelly, what do you know about Timothy Leary? I know quite a bit about Timothy Leary, not uh, as much as you do right now, I'm sure. But um, I am uh, I'm familiar with that whole scene. So Timothy Leary was a uh, Harvard psychologist. So he taught and did research at Harvard. Um, he was hang on, hang on research well yeah, <laughs> go yeah, on yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're right you're right i i don't know much about his origins sort of before that like i don't know really his sort of childhood or anything or what part of the country he's from i assume he's a sort of an east coaster or a coastal of some kind um he was at uh was at harvard got introduced to uh mushrooms by gordon wasson who is sort of the american quote unquote discoverer of psychedelic mushrooms and from there got into the world of acid uh he and richard alpert who would become ramdas and a few other people um tried to sort of bring this into the academic realm uh, the boundaries between academia and spirituality and religion and as he's starting a cult and all of these things got very blurry. Uh, I don't know if Timothy Leary got kicked out of Harvard or if he left on purpose, but I know that Richard Alpert was fired um, from, from academia and they both, Timothy Leary being sort of the more dangerous of the two as in terms of, you know, the perspective of society kind of went on to, to, uh, you know, get acid or probably Timothy Leary in particular is probably m responsible for getting acid into as many hands as any other person, I would say, uh, was, uh, other than maybe like you could argue that a chemist, Owsley Stanley or somebody like that's more responsible, but in terms of mimetically bringing it out into the conversation, that's Tim Leary. So as much as the sixties are about acid, the sixties are about Tim Leary, I think. I'm just, I've closed my outline and I'm going to let you finish the episode, Brad. <laughs> okay. There's a lot more to it. I know there's ins and outs. You went to prison and all of these things, but uh -huh. uh, yeah, yeah. And we're going to get into all of it. <laughs> good, uh, good. I am very excited. He did popularize acid through the Beatles is what mm. I will say. The Beatles, okay. when they dropped acid and he turned them on, he's sort of the reason Then it was lights out. Yeah. Here we go. And of course- right. This this episode is going to touch on some very spooky stuff. We're oh, definitely good. MK Ultra adjacent here. We're yes. three letter agencies adjacent here, and it's way weirder than what you might expect. I'm gonna. I'm mm -hmm. so glad because this is this is there are you know something on this show. There's sort of a bingo. We we joke about A of D, A of D bingo, right? Mm. And one of those bingo cards is like 
three letter agency stuff, right? And yes. it comes up more often than you might think, uh, maybe because mm -hmm. we're slightly paranoid and those are the subjects we like, but it's always there. It's it's fr very frequently lurking in the background. So I'm glad it would appear that anybody that. who gets achieves any kind of platform does uh, receive a handler right. rather early. So right. Our DMs looking are at, open. Yeah, looking at and, you, Twitter. There's, I've had a couple suspicious messages on Twitter mm -hmm, lately that may or mm -hmm. may not be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Well, this is where I tease the After Dark episode. Every uh, episode we do gets an additional 20 or 30 minutes. This one might go even a little longer. Uh, for Patreon subscribers, patreon.com slash artofdarkpod. On the After Dark today, we are going to do three things and just sort of you know, wrap a little bit, just talk about what happened, how, uh, you know, come down. We're going to come down. Yeah. On we're going to come <laughs> together important. and then we're going to come down on yeah. the After Dark. Uh, we're going to talk about Leary and the song Come Together from Abbey Road, the the greatest bass line in all of the Beatle, Beatles catalog. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about when Timothy Leary met Charles Manson oh. in prison. Mm -hmm. Oh. And we're going to, oh, what? and we're gonna talk about leary's uh last words oh cool uh, okay good and uh, there were a total of three last words uh <laughs> with a little uh interlude between the first one and the, uh, the last two and i'll just tease that so if you want to hear that stuff if you want to hear brad rap on one of the <laughs> after dark back catalog in our deep deep back catalog we have now yeah get the page some episodes yeah yeah yep all right okay cool we're gonna get into the bio here now but i just really quickly have to mention the source material that we're gonna work from so uh as as ever uh, i lean somewhat on the wikipedia bio uh there's there's just so much life to cover and leary's one of these guys where as soon as you start clicking through the links you could get a fair education in a week on the 60s just mm -hmm. by clicking around through the wikipedia starting with good old good old timmy leary mm -hmm. uh but we are not a biography podcast uh podcast we are a profiling podcast which is a great carl rollison uh clarified for us and without the biographers who write the material that we uh, work on we wouldn't have anything so if you're interested in uh, Timmy Leary, these are the books that I'm I'm referring to today. I've got the great biography from Robert Greenfield, Timothy Leary, a biography. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I have three books from Leary himself. I've got Flashbacks, which is a funny name for his autobiography, <laughs> Flashbacks. It's got a great, great cover. It's this sort of yellow. Oh, yeah. He's just there grinning at you. He's yep. a bit of a Pied Piper character here. Mm -hmm. uh, and you may fall on one side of the fence. You may think, ah, it's the, the degenerate hour here on Art of Darkness. And you wouldn't entirely be wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's there. He, he was, how to say this? He was a vanguard in the culture war. Let's just say that. Um, he was in the vanguard. Then I've got The Delicious Grace of Moving One's Hand, which is his book on sex. Because the the stuff at Harvard was sort of almost as much about sex as it was drugs. Or it was oh, like interesting. a near second. Yeah. Hmm. And then the final book I have, and these last two books I'll only pull from sparingly. Um, and, but the final book is called Timothy Leary, Chaos and Cyberculture. Does that one got like a foil leaf cover mm -hmm. on it? Oh, yeah, wow. It's very okay. tricky. Uh, okay. uh, it is. You can see Leary's sense of design was perhaps yeah. in, in, influenced by uh, certain chemicals. Hmm. Uh, yeah, with guest appearances by William Gibson, Winona Ryder, William S. Burroughs, and David Byrne in this book. Uh, so, yeah, that's the, the, the level we're playing at here. There's a William Gibson quote on the cover that says, the 90s are here. And the doctor is in. <laughs> <laughs> Love me some William Gibson. Mm -hmm. The uh, yeah, he, he got very interested in technology uh, and, and the internet at the end of his uh, toward the end of his life and his career. So we will dip a little bit into that. All right, we're ready to go. All right, I got my uh, okay. Here we go. I'm just gonna get a little Strap piece of paper in. here. Just yeah. dab <laughs> it on my tongue. And <laughs> all right, so let's do it. Oh, I've broken this into three parts. So first part is birth and death. And this is the beginning. Timothy Francis Leary was born on October 22nd of 1922. 
He was an American psychologist and author known for his strong advocacy of psychedelic drugs. Evaluations of Leary are polarized, ranging from bold oracle to publicity hound. Bit of a grifter. Bit of a cult guy. He was a hero of American consciousness, according to Allen Ginsberg, and Tom Robbins called him a brave neuronaut. Now, curiously, the Wikipedia on his early life is pretty thin. Hmm. Leary was born in Springfield, Massachusetts, an only child to an Irish Catholic household. Now, <clears throat> Brad, who's the other neuronaut that we covered? And uh, what Terrence was McKenna. Mm. And what Terrence was he, what was his? Mm. Oh yeah, he was an Irishman. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. He was the he was the he was the sort of rightful heir to Timothy Leary in in a number of ways. I would say. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, there's something, it, and they were both a little uh, kind of sprightly in stature. Right. And kind of verbose. Right. Sort of. Yeah. Yeah. They're mm. both yeah, they're You know, if they were one eighth fairy and I don't mean that in terms of orientation, I mean that in terms of <laughs> 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 you wouldn't you wouldn't yeah. be that surprised if fairies are a real thing. And 100 percent the gift of, of gab. Mm. And Leary was acute was acutely aware of his Irishness. Uh, later in life, he would say, I watched some material. I watched some videos and things online, some movies. He would say that you one doesn't even ever need to travel to Ireland if you're Irish to be an outsider, to feel mm. like an outsider inside the culture. And I think we'll see. Uh, he was plagued by some of the cliches that uh, that we Irish uh, sort of suffer from. Uh, Brad mm. Kelly, his his father uh, was Timothy Tote Leary, who was a dentist uh, and an alcoholic. Mm. So we're going to get into that stuff now. His own biography flashbacks starts when he turned 35 but he flashes back throughout the biography Ah. so like that i'm going to skip around some although i do have a fairly linear biography here but if we move back and forth in time a bit just roll with it uh pretend you're pretend you're tripping yeah Uh, yeah. don't (laughs) fight don't fight it the worst thing you can do is fight it yeah Yeah, don't hold on too tight (laughs) uh here is a scene We'll see why he starts at 35. He came to this stuff pretty late. Uh, mm-hmm. he, he wasn't really doing, I mean, he. you have to understand too, like maybe for people in our culture, psychedelics are kind of a, a, a rite of passage that can happen. Don't do drugs, kids. Don't do heroin. Yeah. Uh, for sure. But, you know, you do, you maybe you do them when you're a teenager or you're in college, right? Fair to say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think if right. you're going to do them, right? Yeah, that that wasn't an option for Leary, so yeah. he only came to this later in life. Yeah, Here he was a, of a he was of a generation. Nobody in his generation's dad had done psychedelics, and they, right? they were it's, all yeah, right. Yeah, it's like it, this is a new thing, basically. Yeah, and they were all everybody was a drunk. They would drink. yeah. yeah. Or amphetamines and things. Mm-hmm. Um, so here's his uh, prologue to his uh, bi- uh, biography, his autobiography. <clears throat> my conception of my conception. We're going to find out he had a very funny writing style. I was conceived on a military reservation, West Point, New York, on the night of January 17, 1920. On the preceding day, alcohol had become an illegal drug. Academy records revealed that there was a dance that Saturday night at the officer's club. Now that booze was illegal, the ingestion of ethyl alcohol took on glamorous, naughty implications. The roaring 20s are about to begin. My mother, Abigail, often recalled that during her pregnancy, the smell of distilling moonshine and bathtub gin hung like a rowdy smog over officer's row. My father, Timothy, known as Tote, was about to convert from social drinking to alcohol addiction. In training me for future life, he often told me that prohibition was bad, but not as bad as no booze at all. It was a very good night. Dress blue uniforms, white gloves, long gowns, Antoine de Paris, mannish st- uh, shingle bobs. The flirtatious but virtuous Abigail, by all accounts, was the most beautiful woman on the post. Jet black hair, milky soft white skin, curvy Gibson girl figure. Tote was behaving arrogantly as usual. Always the sportsman, he stood at the bar, tall, slim, pouring an illegal recreational drug from a silver pocket flask into the glasses of Captain Omar Bradley, Captain Jeffrey Prentice, and Lieutenant George Patton. Abigail, that's interesting, Lieutenant George Patton, 
<laughs> Abigail abandoned. That's what's going to happen too with Leary's. We're just going mean, to name that name. That was the George, the George Patton. I take it. Uh, I assume I, that, that, that would yeah, make sense that be, he mentioned right? it. Yeah, right, yeah, right. We're talking about 1920. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Abigail abandoned at a linen covered candlelit table, talked to her friend, General Douglas MacArthur, superintendent of the military academy, who asked her to dance. The orchestra played just a Japanese sandman. Lieutenant Patton, a, noria, a notorious womanizer, cut in. Afterwards, Toad approached Abigail's table, swaying a bit to the Missouri waltz. My father said, look at you sitting there as proper as the Virgin Mary. I'm going to take you for a little annunciation. Ah, little heresy early in the episode. <laughs> yeah, jeez. <laughs> yeah, wow. Abigail, her elegant poise compromised only by the faintest flush, folded her fan, rose gracefully, waved gaily to her companions, and walked to the cloakroom. Turning the page... Captain Timothy Leary drove his Packard unsteadily at, at a little dr uh, drunk driving. Great. Yeah. To the mind. house on officer's row humming, somebody stole my gal. My mother retired to the bedroom, changed her nightgown, knelt beside the bed and prayed. Uh, huh. He goes on to, he has this style of breaking because he's a scientist. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't stress enough that he was a credible scientist who influenced people even before uh, the the psychedelics took over. You don't get into Harvard uh, right. as a as a professor if you if you haven't accomplished something. And yeah, he really we'll, did. We'll get to it. He like wrote some standard uh, personality tests and things like that yes. that were used. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. When he was in prison, which we'll come to later, uh, <laughs> and I think we'll see. You know why he he ended up there. Uh, I think we might already begin to see why uh, mm -hmm. uh, he. He had to take a personality to, uh, personality test that was one of the uh, the ones that he had devised. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, Tim, it looks like you are a perfect human being. This is incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so here here's here's him describing his own conception. At the moment of climax, Tote deposited over 400 million spermatozoa into my mother's quote unquote reproductive tract. Opinions still vary in scientific circles about what then transpired. According to traditional biological scenarios, the 400 million sperm, one of which was carrying half of me, immediately engaged in some Olympic swimming race, jostling, bumping, frantically twisting an Australian crawl or flagellating tail stroke to win the competition to rate poor docile receptive Miss Egg. Reproduction allegedly occurred when the successful jock sperm forcibly penetrated the ovum. I passionately reject this theory of conception. I was not reproduced. I was created by an intelligent teleological process of natural election. Disreputable, goofy Lamarck turns out to be right at the important level of RNA. Like you, I was precisely intelligently recreated to play a role necessary for the evolution of our gene pool. The selection of the fertilizing sperm and the decision about the final chromosome division was made by the egg. It was the she of me that had the final say. <laughs> oh, yeah. okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. We're, we're, you could, mm -hmm. This is the kind of guy we're dealing with. All right. <laughs> He's definitely true. He, he wants to flip everything on its head. Now, look, I don't I don't necessarily agree with this guy. I, I found myself as I was going into this kind of backing off a little bit because now it's 2022 and we know yeah. what all of this led to mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and, and like where we are now. Mm -hmm. So I come to this with a bit of skepticism, but we're going to have fun with this and uh, and enjoy uh, Timothy Leary's craziness. Well, uh, and, and I think, you know, maybe it's a good time to note. It's like you can disagree with him intensely and think he was a scourge on American culture. But like through this episode, we're going to actually figure out who this guy was. And I think that's worth knowing no matter what you think of him. Right. You know, it's cause same, he's so it, he's, mm -hmm. yeah, he's, every, he's everywhere. He's, he's, it's a, he's a Crowley like figure in that way. Well, and we're going to come to his, to Crowley influencing <clears throat> him and, mm -hmm. uh, and that that's a key thing to say about this pod is that yeah, we don't in, like or endorse e e every one of our subjects. And sometimes we come away with a with a real sense of revulsion and a kind of a, a quality of monstrousness. And that's mm -hmm. definitely there with Tim Timothy Leary. I think we'll we'll see. Um although I he there are qualities to be admired for sure. certain. Yeah. Well, I think one thing to remember too is the rebel outsider is different in every 
every age. There's going to be a different political stripe. There's going to be a different approach uh, mm -hmm. against mm -hmm. what they're bucking. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is uh, the first reading from the Robert Greenfield biography. Uh, late at night, a young boy lies in bed in his room. By all rights, he should be sleeping. Outside his window, the streets of Springfield, Massachusetts, a small industrial city 90 miles west of Boston, are quiet. All the movie theaters have already let out for the night. The restaurants have long since locked their doors. Even the trolleys have stopped running because prohibition has been the law of the land for more than a decade. There are no boisterous downtown nightclubs or loud neighborhood bars where people can drink legally. Yet, as everywhere in a nation that professes one code of morals in public while practicing another in private, many of the good citizens of Springfield are out drinking all the same. Unable to sleep, the boy waits. Will his father come home? And if he does, how will it be? The usual sound of stumbling followed by the front door slamming loudly and then the heavy tread of his feet on the creaking stairs as he makes his way to his bedroom. Or will it be worse? As he lies awake in bed, the boy dreams of heroes. Huck Finn smoking a corncob pipe with Jim as they float down the Mississippi. Horatio at the bridge. Lancelot setting off to find the Holy Grail. Tom Swift in his magic flying machine. Each week, the boy checks out and reads 10 books from the public library, a big granite and marble building constructed with Carnegie money. His library card is both a passport and a round-trip ticket, allowing him to travel freely through the realms of gold. But sooner or later, even the greatest tale of heroism and adventure in some faraway place has to end, and then the boy finds himself lying in bed late at night, surrounded by silence and darkness, waiting for his father to come home. Flesh of the same flesh and blood of the same blood, the boy and his father, Timothy Francis Leary, uh, the boy and his father, his father has the same name, Timothy Francis Leary, called Tote, by all who know him in this city where he was born and who now works as a dentist, share the same name. In speakeasies all over Springfield where people drink openly but not legally, Tote is well known. Late at night, after the speakeasies close, he can often be found buying liquor on the darkened front porches of nearby houses in Winchester Square where bootleggers live. What began as a fondness for drink has become, for Tote Leary in the past few years, something darker and more destructive. One more para here. Already the boy has made up his mind that he will never be like his father. He will be a hero. Strong and courageous as Socrates at the moment he was offered hemlock. Brave and bold as Ulysses returning home after a 20-year absence. But there's also something heroic about running away from it all, like Huck and Jim, floating down a river like a child adrift from all cares and responsibilities. As the boy lies in bed, unable to sleep, he considers his choices. At the moment, all he can do is wait. So... Yeah rather well written and um it is yeah poignant um and and tragic uh yeah no that's a the yeah i mean there is a sort of there is a a moment uh for a boy or a girl when your parents aren't quite you know great role models for you where you kind of choose whether you're gonna follow them or react against it in some way and it sounds like he's trying to position himself in a sort of mythological arc and i don't know i respect that you know at least sure. as the first step yeah well and it's so important to remember that the hippies really positioned themselves as anti-alcoholic in a lot of ways and they had been coming out of a of a culture where alcohol was uh this absolutely dominant force and there's drugs are always political and so there's this mm -hmm. tug of war going on so i could see why growing up with that fear uh he would <clears throat> he would go so hard the way he did especially after what happens later which we'll see so i'm going to read a little more here about him and his family uh, no child chooses his place of birth or the family into which he is born every child does however select the adults after whom he patterns himself Early in his childhood, Tim Leary made a conscious decision to identify with his father's family. To him, they seemed urban, urbane, well-to-do, and glamorous. Far more than his father, it was his paternal grandfather, Dennis, that Tim Leary would most closely resemble as an adult. A watchmaker by trade, Dennis Leary conducted his business for 45 years in a jewelry store on State Street in downtown Springfield. Eight feet wide and 36 feet deep, the store housed the extensive collection of theater programs, 
uh, an extension, uh, extensive collection, excuse me, including one for our American cousin on the night Abraham Lincoln was assassinated by John Wilkes, Wilkes Booth in Ford's Theater. Dennis also collected old baseball guides. He filled scrapbooks with articles that interested him. At his death, he had 120 of them. A great student of Shakespeare, Dennis often journeyed to Boston to take in shows starring such actors as E.L. Davenport, Edwin Booth, and Edwin Forrest at the Boston and Howard Theaters. Until the end of his life, he could recite from memory long passages from his father's uh, favorite, uh, excuse me, from his favorite plays. At the age of 75, Dennis liked to embarrass his teenage granddaughters and their boyfriends by yanking aside the velvet curtain separating the front hall from the parlor in his fine Victorian house. Stepping forward as though on stage, he would launch without preamble into Othello's final uh, soliloquy. <laughs> Plunging an imagine that's grandpa. Plunging that's an imaginary dagger into his chest, he would end his impromptu performance by falling dead to the floor. <laughs> That's great. Nice. I like that. Yeah. More than 60 years after his death, one of his great, great granddaughters affectionately described him as a little eccentric and given to theatrical moments. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we'll go, we'll go a little further here because this relationship is important. It was on the top floor of his house where Dennis kept uh, his large theatrical library that his grandson first remembered meeting him. On a wintry evening, 10-year-old Tim Leary sat on the floor reading a copy of Mark Twain's Life on the Mississippi as Dennis complained about his children, calling them all hell-raising illiterates, praising Tim for being the only one in the family who really liked to read. Dennis told his grandson never to do anything like anyone else. He urged mm -hmm. him to find his own way and to be one of a kind. Embroidered on a heraldic shield, the words could have served as the Leary family motto. For Dennis never did anything by half, neither would his grandson. Mm. So. Uh, yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Yeah. Very good. And uh, he had an uncle named Arthur who, uh, this is a good paragraph here. Tim also learned from Arthur about the power of media. Arthur Leary's stories stores were so successful because he advertised them over the radio. He owned a set of stores. Uh, it looks like he sold uh, women's cloaks, suits, and furs while he was uh, <laughs> traveling in Europe. He was a local celebrity, uh, which is quite which is quite fun. Mm. Uh, invented the same year Tim was born, radio had by the time he was ten years old become America's principal source of news information and entertainment and here we are again we're yeah. making radio That's let's right. go we're mass communicating uh <laughs> even uh tim's pious mother and aunt were impressed when the voice of pope pius the 11th speaking in latin came over the radio for the very first time thoroughly Ooh, modern in every yeah, way i imagine that mm -hmm. was sorry i imagine that was powerful if you're a deeply yes. believing catholic and oh wow interesting mm -hmm. I never yes of that. here's the, here's the pope uh Right. So Arthur was a um, uh, a pioneer on that front in terms of advertising. <clears throat> so one more little bit about the Leary family. There could not have been a family more unlike the outgoing. This is about the other the other side. Unlike the outgoing gregarious, reckless Leary's than the quiet and pious Ferris clan from which Tim's mother, Abigail, came. The shining star of the Ferris family was Abigail's maternal uncle, Father Michael Cavanaugh. Born in 1873, he graduated first in his class at Holy Cross and then studied for the priesthood in Rome at the Pontifical Vatican Seminary. Returning home, he became a Monsignor, a parochial mm -hmm. power broker with connections throughout New England. Father Michael traveled to Europe each summer. It uh, must have been rough. In Springfield, he was driven everywhere by a chauffeur. Ah, if this is poverty, give me chastity. <laughs> One of his closest friends was the United States Senator from Massachusetts, David Ignatius Walsh, a, cl a classmate from Holy Cross. For as long as they lived, both Abigail and her sister Mary, called May, worshipped Father Michael. I'm sure they worshipped Jesus, but they, they probably uh, really res respected <laughs> Father Michael. Right. <laughs> Five times, <laughs> hey, pick your verbs, <laughs> right? Five times they went with him to Europe in search of culture and spiritual inspiration. Abigail chose her uncle to perform her marriage ceremony among the Catholic elite in New England, the one true faith. Mm. Uh, being married by a priest who was a close relative was considered a special honor. 
Whether or not Tim ever really understood their enduring influence on him, the men upon whom he modeled himself were his grandfather, Dennis, his great uncle, Father Michael, his uncle, Arthur, and his father, Tote. They all shared a single trait. None was what he seemed to be. Mm -hmm. I like that. Oh yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. You see the two, you see the two halves coming together, though. You see the sort of okay. He's got this sort of serious, fairly serious intellectual, religious at side, and then you've got this sort of theatrical side, the it, the uh, the extrovert side. The yeah, interesting. Yeah, he definitely did not fall too far from the tree uh, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, similar to Crowley, where you go, wait, this guy came from an evangelical family. Well, yeah, <laughs> let's look at what they were. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I'm going to read about a defining moment with his father uh, and then about uh, his grandfather's death. The defining moment in Tim's relationship with his father occurred during the same year, 1932. Uh, this is the father's coming home drunk uh, and slamming doors, right? Awakened by his weeping mother, Tim emerged from his bedroom to find his father drunk and carrying on downstairs. Sounding very much like a father, the 12-year-old boy yelled, Hey, we're trying to sleep up here. Uh, quickly becoming a son again, he added, Please let me sleep. Uh, sleep. I have school in the morning. Slowly making his way up the stairs, Tote threatened to teach his son a thing or two then and there. As Tote's face came level with Tim's knees, the boy reached down with his hand and very gently shoved his father backward. In slow motion, Tote tumbled into the banister and then fell head over heels down the stairs crashing into the telephone stand and breaking his eyeglasses. Humiliated by his son in front of Abigail, Tote glared at the boy. I'll get you for that, he said as he headed back up the stairs. Frightened, Tim threw open the hall window and escaped onto the roof, as he had done so many times before while pretending to be Tom Sawyer. Hiding behind the chimney, Tim watched his father poke his head out the window and curse. Then Tote slammed the window shut and locked it. Feeling sad and guilty, but also somehow free, Tim stayed on the roof until his mother waved at him, at him through the window, signaling it was now safe for him to come back inside since Tote had fallen asleep. That's wow. uh, that's pretty hardcore. Yeah. 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 Mm. Uh, right. So Tim Leary would celebrate his father for having never uh, stunted me with expectations. Dad remained for me a model of the loner, a disdainer of the conventional way. Tote dropped out following the ancient Hibernian practice of getting in the wind, escaping the priest run village, heading off for the far land like one of the wild geese of Irish legend. Throughout his life as an adult, Tim Leary favored the same technique. We're going to see he was rather peripatetic. Mm -hmm. uh, rather than stand and fight, he would run away just as his father had done before him. Invariably, those he left behind were women. <laughs> We're going to get to the the many wives of, of Timothy Leary will be by the time we hit number five, effectively number six, I think you'll yeah. know we're coming to the end of the life. Okay. <laughs> One of these guys. Yeah. Not yeah. a happy home. Not yeah. a happy home. Mm. Um, so going to go on a little more here. As the depression continued to worsen, we're in the 30s here. Factories and small businesses in Springfield began shutting down. Massachusetts, the state that once produced a third of America's cloth and half of its shoes, was hit harder than most of the nation. One by one, the mill towns began to die. Uh, Tote had not lost his job. He had simply, as a dentist. Oh, and by the way, he he gave Timmy nitrous when he was a kid. <laughs> so I don't think it was a yeah. routine thing, but that right. was, that was his first exposure. Hey, try a little bit of this kid. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. What ah. else is out there? Yeah. 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 Right. So Franklin Delano Roosevelt is president in 1932, but by 1933, uh, the vicious cycle of chronic alcoholism had taken control of Tote's life. Going on three day benders, Tote would drink until he passed out, wake up and then begin drinking again. Patients who went to see Dr. Leary in the middle of an afternoon to have an aching tooth extracted often found his office shut. In order to pay his drinking debts, Tote soon closed his office and sold all the equipment, a dentist without equipment from drinking. Oh my God. <sighs> Taking pity on his son, Dennis, the grandfather, set him up in business again. Tote went on another bender, 
closed his office, and again sold all his equipment. Once more, Dennis stepped in to help Tote back on his feet. Despite the grim reality of their situation, both Tote and Abigail believed they would eventually be saved by the huge sum of money Dennis would leave them when he died. Not a great way to live. No, Not just, a great wait, way to live. just waiting for that. Is, yeah, uh, it's, it's poison. Yeah, Poison and degrading for everybody involved. Yep. On the day after Christmas in 1933, 13-year-old Tim stood at the top of the stairs listening to his mother sobbing on the phone. At 92, Dennis had passed away. Male relatives were sent to find Tote, who was on yet another bender and had to be sobered up for the funeral, a noisy affair attended by the Boston branch of the Leary family, as well as those who still lived in Springfield. Uh, so you're, you got to be sobered up to go to a, an Irish funeral. <laughs> and, then, and yeah, okay, great. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, After the funeral came the reading of the will. In his autobiography, Tim Leary would recall that he was out in the street playing the game uh, of solitary baseball he invented when the tax that's sad when a taxi pulled up in front of his house tote stepped from the back uh, back seat and told the driver to leave the motor running he handed his son a hundred dollar bill an enormous sum of money uh, at the time walked inside gave abigail one thousand dollars and announced that he had business in new york tote then climbed back into the cab and left and left tim would not see his father again for 23 years whoa <clears throat> Wow. We got some uh we got some daddy issues. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. Huh. Mm-hmm. And uh he did not Tote did not do well uh in, in New York City. It didn't last long, but he he burned through the money. It was a disaster. I'm so sure, uh, I'm sure. Jeez. Gotta catch that stuff before it gets to that degree. Yeah. Uh so now with Tote gone, Aunt May moved in with Abigail and Tim. Like the Ferris home in nearby Indian Orchard, the house on Tarrant Street was soon transformed into a reliquary of religious art, the Long House. Mm -hmm. Tim was now surrounded by vivid color reproductions of the Madonna, saints, and martyrs. Aunt May also appointed herself the household's official censor, looking for what she called funny business. <laughs> she scanned every picture in every magazine that came over the transom to protect tim from the evil corrupting influence of sex yeah uh, well that worked mm. in response <laughs> tim began the unceasing pattern of rebellion against all forms of authority that would dominate his entire life yeah and of course tool the patron band of the show <laughs> in my mind mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. one of the bands is uh mm -hmm. they very famously sure. have their have their live version of uh third eye where mm -hmm. they they use an, a, a saying from timothy leary in his voice think for yourself question mm -hmm. authority think for yourself question mm -hmm. authority mm -hmm. so we're already there with with little timmy yeah uh, right for right. sure yeah, no, that, and that makes, I mean, uh, clearly he had that personality type, but, you know, you're also dealing with a kid whose father just left him, and, uh, yeah, why is he going to take somebody else's rules? You know, it's, it's you guys, yeah, interesting. And it all makes sense, though, so far, in a way, you know? Mm-hmm, yeah. Um, yeah, it, very interesting. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going to read a little bit now from the delicious grace of moving one's hand, which is something he would write much later, but I think we'll give an insight into his thinking. Uh, he quotes uh, Huey Lewis in the news. I want a new, new drug at the top of this chapter. <laughs> <laughs> this chapter is called the long search for the male sex elixir. At a very early age, after comparing the rather routine existence of my family with the heroic adventures I read about in books, I concluded that the well-lived life would necessarily involve quests, holy grail adventures for fabled goals to save the human race. During these younger years, I dreamed of becoming a warrior, an explorer, a great scientist, a wise sage. During adolescence, a new noble challenge emerged. It was sex. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to save the world, but... <laughs> <laughs> these things are not mutually exclusive. No, you really can yeah. do both. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. That's true. Mm -hmm. Uh, and here I ran into an annoying paradox. Although sex was obviously important to a happy life, I did not have perfect control over my erections. Apparently, many other males shared this same inefficiency. The first problem was that the erections came when I couldn't use them, producing the terrible embarrassment of the unexpected arousal. 
in social situations and the inability to get up and walk across the room because of that mind of its own acting up down there. Mm -hmm. Later came the nervousness of making out, the wild excitement of foreplay, the unbuttoning of the bra, the removal of the panties, the wiggling into positions in the back seat of the car. Would you believe a rumble seat? The zipper, the arrangement of the contraceptive, the heavy breathing, the anxieties. Do you hear someone coming? The maneuvering for penetration. Phew! <laughs> what happened to my units? <laughs> <laughs> the interaction between the busy mind and the willful body suddenly became a most critical issue. And in Puritanical 1936, there were no manuals on the care and use of this complex equipment. I consulted the dictionary and discovered that something called an aphrodisiac increased sexual performance. I rushed to the library and consulted every encyclopedia available, not a mention of aphrodisiac. How curious that such an important topic was totally ignored. Oh, well, here was another unexplained, mysterious facet of adult life. Lindbergh could fly the Atlantic. We could put a man on the South Pole, but we couldn't get control of the most important part of our body. After I, so you know, he's talking about after graduating from college, sure. uh, but that's his, those are his <laughs> recollections of sort of yeah, his, that's hilarious. his, uh, his sex life. So <laughs> he would go on and attend classical high school in Springfield in 1933. And then he would go into college at Holy Cross, which of course was in the family. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to read a little bit from the biography now. That gets into uh, the story here. Had Abigail Leary truly wanted her only son to become a priest, she would have sent him to Cathedral High, where the sons of Springfield's Irish laborers went before moving on to play football at Holy Cross or Notre Dame. Because Abigail, excuse me, blah, blah, blah. Because <laughs> Abigail had something grander in mind for Tim, she sent him instead to Classical High School, a four story yellow brick building with a long vaulted rooftop with steeples and a green copper trim that looked like part of the Sorbonne. Behind the high wrought iron fence, stately steps led up to three sets of glass doors above which the words Classical High were carved in stone. At the time Tim enrolled as a freshman, there were no more prestigious high schools in the country. Alumni mm -hmm. of Harvard, Yale, and Princeton regularly named Classical High as the number one college preparatory school in the nation. Among its graduates were William, uh, William Manchester, the noted historian and biographer, Theodore Geisel, a.k.a. Dr. Seuss. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, Larry O'Brien. Hmm. Uh, so let's see here. I want to... So this was a very, very, fan, you know, big deal. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, a, lot, a lot of blue <laughs> links on the Wikipedia page. Mm-hmm. Yeah. During his freshman and sophomore years, Tim was, by his own admission, withdrawn socially and confused academically. He studied diligently, but without comprehension, especially in Latin class, where he was alternately aroused and irritated by girls from the well-to-do suburb of Longsmeadow, who, unlike him, could <laughs> decline nouns with great precision. Although Tim tried out for various teams, he was too scrawny to make the cut. Despite scoring 127 on the, thir on the Terman IQ test, that's a pretty high score. Mm -hmm. Tim's, uh, he's not a midwit. Yeah. Tim's sophomore midterms, gra midterm grades were a C in English, a C in Latin, and a D in plain geometry. He did, however, get an A in English history and a B in physical training. <laughs> he did, did okay in gym. Yeah, all right. The, the turning point in his high school career occurred when he became friendly with the smart, brash, funny, worldly, earth, earthly, and playful, well-to-do Jewish kids from Longmeadow. Mm. Those Longmeadow girls... The only mm. Christian in their social set, Tim played poker and tennis with them and discussed what ha had already become his central concern in life, sex. sex. Right. <laughs> her dress was up to her neck and I could see what she had for breakfast, was a phrase he heard them use at least three times a day. <laughs> so he's, he's hanging out with, mm, yeah. That's not even, that's a, yeah. just, that's a weird thing to say. That's not even, <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> that that's they're going real hard. Yeah, that is not. Yeah, they, these are not good Catholic boys and girls. No. Although, of course, no. the, the Catholics the Catholics are known to get down, though. So, no. as, oh, we, yeah. as we will see, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> At sixteen, Tim obtained his driver's license and began earning pocket money by making deliveries for Phil Shea at the women's store. Tim's driver's license helped him find what he would later call the sophisticated girlfriend he had been seeking for so long. 
Hell of a euphemism, Tim. Mm -hmm. One night, she led him to her family's sun porch, reclined on the couch, and held out her arms to him. The two began kissing madly. Moving her hips, she guided him, as he would later write, into my first fuck on on their porch. Wow. Goodness. Yeah. Woo! Going on. Uh, Jeez. In his autobiography, Leary calls the girl Rosalind, but her real name was Rosamund Larson, nicknamed Rosie. In a memo to himself, written at the age of 74, entitled Women Teachers, Timothy Leary described her as the wildest, sexiest, coolest girl in New England. I was offended when this Yale guy demeaned her. In a Springfield bar, she said, the man of Carstairs whiskey goes upstairs. Sex, sex, sex. (laughs) Yeah. Thank you, Rosie Larson. Uh, (laughs) With Rosalind's help, Tim, Tim transformed himself from a shy, reserved youth into a brash, confident extrovert. The two quickly became popular stars in the adolescent social life. Within six months, Tim was president of the school senate and editor of the school newspaper. He got a little copy. He found his yeah. e-girl, our IRL, yeah. Yeah. and uh, she she introduced him to the party. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, this is a, an often misunderstood part of why young men are so eager to have a girlfriend. Uh, mm. at, at times it isn't necessarily always about the sex. There's a great deal of social acceptance that comes along with it. Maybe yeah, it's obvious sure. to people, but it's, yeah, it's a real thing. For sure. But there's also this thing where it's like, <clears throat> if you were getting some of that need met, then you don't spend 100% of your mental energy on it anymore. Right. You're like sex, 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 sex. And then you get a little bit, you're like, <laughs> okay, I can now think. 20% of my mental energy can go somewhere else because <laughs> I've sort of crossed that line. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I never had that problem. So I don't know what no? you're talking about. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Just, <right. laughs> uh, so, right. Tim's pho- photograph appeared on the front page of the June 4th, 1937 edition of the Classical Recorder, wearing a dotted tie, a white shirt, and a spread collar, and a nifty looking sports jacket. I like that word nifty. We got to mm-hmm. return to nifty. Mm hmm. His crew cut, making his ears appear large and prominent, he stared out at the world with his mouth set in a look of youthful determination. The accompanying article announcing his uh, appointment as editor-in-chief identified him as a member of the golf team, the Senate, the Glee Club, the Assembly Committee, and the Traffic Squad, and said that he was interested in journalism and had, to his credit, several lead news articles and and a number of the best editorials of the year. With cheery high school optimism, the article concluded... He seems to be a safe person to entrust with the higher standard of efficiency the recorder has been trying to achieve. So he really, really came out uh, yeah, quite a lot, yeah. quite a lot of fun. Uh, it was Hill's custom uh, to welcome. Uh, this is uh, William C. Hill, uh, the principal. <clears throat> It was Hill's custom to welcome each new fresh, freshman class to Classical High by elaborating on the school motto. No one has a right to do that, which if everyone did would destroy society. In his autobiography, Timothy Leary calls this the Kantian categorical imperative. Although Kant phrases the concept in different ways, the actual categorical imperative reads, act only on that maxim that you can at the same time will to be a universal law. For for Kant, the Kant or Kant? Kant. I think it's um, Kant. Kant. Not my philosophy degree. It's been too long for Kant. (laughs) I can't, I can't, I can't read. Uh, The categorical imperative was the supreme principle of morality, a philosophical uh, rephrasing of the golden rule. Mm -hmm. Well, (laughs) escorting adult visitors around the school, Hill would often stop students in the hallway and have them repeat the school motto from memory. Ugh. As editor in chief of the school newspaper, Tim wrote that he would later what he would later call a particularly fiery editorial suggesting that the categorical imperative was totalitarian and un-American in glorifying mm. the welfare of the state over the rights of the individual individual. Mm. <laughs> well, he's got a point that it's hard for change to occur. If the rubric is you only do things that everybody else can, should do. It's, I mean, mm. He's got a, kind of a point, I think. Um, yeah, it's the anyway. categorical imperative for a reason. It's categorical, right? Uh, right, right. So right. it's it's a bit much. Yeah. All right. So we're moving forward to 1938. We know what's coming, of course. Mm-hmm. The big one mm-hmm. on June 14th, 1938, when Timothy Francis Leary graduated from Classical High, he had already been rejected by every Ivy League college to which he had applied. Huh. A lesser young man 
with a lesser mother might have given up right then and there. In order to ensure that Tim would become a success, Abigail Leary persuaded Father Michael Cavanaugh to intervene on her son's behalf. All right. Mm. So now uh, he he gets into Holy Cross. Okay. Uh, which, yeah. Shout out to moms. Mm. All right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 We're we're mom respecters on this pod. Absolutely. Shout out to 100%. all the moms. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You need that, especially if dad's gone on a 23 year drunk. Right. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. So Leary would go on to attend the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, Mass from 38 to 40, uh, mm-hmm. to 1940. So now I have a bit about what happened at Holy Cross and how he got kicked out. <laughs> ah, yes. Well, <laughs> mm-hmm. we're going to see that Timothy Leary somehow managed to uh, ingratiate himself or, or at least maneuver his way into institutions and mm-hmm. then find a way to get kicked out. <laughs> this is a thing that he to the point where he, he actually finally, well, the final time he was really well, one of the final times he was really institutionalized, he also got out. But we're going to find out. Okay, uh, interesting. Yeah, that's a little different. Sure. Um, he quite literally escaped. Uh, <clears throat> nice. Okay, so this is quite important. Um, by his second semester at Holy Cross, Tim found someone who shared his true feelings about the school. Together, they began accepting bets on stakes races and sporting events. So he's, Tim, this is a Catholic college. He's obviously mm-hmm. going to be frustrated. Yeah, he's coming. He's, he's turning into a bookie, basically. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Mm-hmm. okay. Tim won enough money from running a continuous poker game to buy himself a secondhand Model A Ford. <laughs> All right, <laughs> he bought a car. All right, he bought he bought crypto or he bought early. Nice. Uh, regularly, Tim and his new friend went over the wall after bed check to frequent local bars where they often picked up shop girls. In a note mm-hmm. written to in pencil to Tim, a girl named Elaine wondered if it was not too much bother of not taking him out of his way and not taking him out of his way, whether he could see them that night because she had something to tell him. Hoo-hoo. Uh-oh. Very subtle. She hope, hoped he would not be angry at her for writing to him like this. Below her signature, she added, please don't think I am a bad girl. I really am not. Mm-hmm. Probably that is why you're sore on me. Now that he had a car, Tim began going to Boston and in, in New York. His archives contain a pamphlet from Southland, a nightclub located at 76 Warrington Street in Boston, where the tall, sensational karaoke zombie costs a dollar and the management uh, reserved the right to serve no more than two to a customer. On the front is a photo of an exotic young woman with long black hair who looks like Dorothy L'Amour. Arms clasped over her head. She strikes a seductive pose, her breasts bejeweled but otherwise bare. Man, oh man, they don't they don't do it like they used to. No. <laughs> um, so let's see here. During the summer of his freshman year at Holy Cross, Tim took the entrance examination for both service academies. After achieving what he would later describe as the highest score, whether in his district or the state, he doesn't say. <laughs> he was offered his choice of Annapolis, so the Navy, or West Point. Uh, because another qualified candidate in Springfield had his heart set on the Naval Academy and Abigail wanted her son to become a cadet at the school where she and Toad had once been so happy, Tim chose West Point. Abigail's plan had now been executed to perfection. Tim would enter West Point as a member of the class of 1944. Believing there was no reason for him to return to Holy Cross, he planned to move to New York, find a job, and enjoy the high life there with his friends. Fearing what might happen if her son did this, Abigail promptly sent him back to Holy Cross. Unwillingly, Tim returned to Worcester. As a sophomore, Tim was const sophomore. Tim was constantly in trouble, ignoring notes sent to him by the Office of Discipline. He regularly cut classes and violated curfew to go over the wall so he could see girls in town. He broke the front window of a liquor store in Worcester with a brick so he could steal beer for a party in his room in Loyola Loyola, Loyola Hall. <laughs> it's like a warm oh Loyola Hall. Loyola Hall. Uh, uh, in the words of one of his friends, he drinks like a fish and fucks like a fool. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, base department. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, didn't learn anything from his dad, did he? No, no. At wit's end, Abigail wrote t- Tim a scolding letter. Since she had gone to work to help put Tim through school and had been able to swing his expenses 
expenses without financial assistance from anyone. Uh, she told him the least he could do was cooperate and attend classes. She had to get up every morning early enough to be at her desk by 830. Your job isn't har any harder than that, is it? Tim's third quarter grades answered her question. 50 in Latin and li mm. Latin literature, 60 in rhetoric, incomplete in art history of, of uh, excuse me, in, in history of English literature, 63 in religion, Ooh, 63 in That's, religion, oof. and 54 in mathematics. At the end of the year, Tim received conditional failures in Latin literature, English literature, history of English literature, and religion. Absent in Latin composition and mathematics, a C in history and a B plus in French. There's probably a probably a girl in class, right? right. Uh, or or there's a girl you wanted to impress with French. Um, mm. He did, however, intercept the letter bearing his grade so that his mother would not get the bad news. That's Lindy right there. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. although the reporting card, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. classic. This is classic <laughs> stuff. Although Abigail must have known how poorly Tim had done during his sophomore year, she did not pursue the matter with much conviction. Her son was headed for West Point. As America prepared to go to war, Tim Leary was finally being given what he had always wanted so badly as a boy, a chance to become a storybook hero. Mm -hmm. So he did not get kicked out of Holy Cross, but he kind of, he almost flunked out. He wouldn't have lasted if it hadn't been for the fact that he, he was moving. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I mean, that is certainly a prior generation because if you got those kinds of grades in undergraduate, you in now you don't end up at Harvard in any capacity. Yes. Right. Yes. It just doesn't happen anymore that you've ruined that opportunity. So interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, there's a bit of a secure, mm. circuitous path for him to finally arrive at Harvard, which I think you're going to find surprising. Mm. Uh, we're coming up to a major incident here now, uh, which has echoes of something that happened to, to Crowley. We've got Crowley on our mind because it was a big, long episode recently, mm. but there are these weird synergies. You know, uh, so go back and listen to the back catalog if you haven't yet. We've got Somebody, yeah. so, somebody on Twitter today posted how many hours of Art of Darkness did he listen to this year? <laughs> how many was it? Oh, I, I don't. I think it was in the sixties. Hours sixty. I yeah. think it was in the sixties. It was yeah. like sixty-six hours, and, and and that was not including the Patreon. So I'm yeah. like, yeah. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot. Cool. But, but we've had yeah. that much content. I mean, we probably yeah. have a uh, hundred and eighty. Yeah, maybe not. I don't know how many uh, hours. It's a, it's a over a hundred hours. Of hours. Of content, for yeah, sure. it's a lot of hours. What's important is that. We put in the work. This is an effort mm -hmm. pod. Support mm -hmm. your favorite effort pod at patreon.com slash art of dark pod, please. Mm -hmm. All right. So moving forward, under pressure from his father, he became a cadet in the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York. In the first month, you see, this is under pressure from his father. I think this is Wikipedia. I think they're wrong. I think it's from his mother. Sometimes Wikipedia is wrong. Yeah, kids. I've encountered you got this it. too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. in, the in his first months as a plebe, he received numerous demer demerits for rule infractions and then got into serious trouble for failing to report rule breaking by cadets he supervised. Ooh. He was also accused of going on a drinking binge and failing to admit it and was asked by the honor committee to resign. He refused wow. and was silenced. That is shunned by fellow cadets. Wow. It's very similar to Crowley and Crowley yeah. being put into... Uh, what was it? Uh, Coventry is what they mm -hmm. called that. Very similar mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Uh, sure. He was acquitted by a court martial, but the silencing continued as well as the onslaught of demerits for small rule inf infractions. All right. Mm -hmm. So it got so serious. This is West Point we're talking about, too. Yeah. This is yeah. serious. This business. is you follow it's the rules. still serious yeah. business. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and this is a beautiful area of the country. Mm -hmm. Um I once lost a wallet in the rain uh, over there near West Point, and yeah. I got a call. This is a bit of a tangent, but I sure. I, I came home, found out that I, my wallet was lost, started to go, oh, no, what am I going to do? The sheriff had found me online, sent me an email and said, uh, it looks like you're a writer. You're you're in town, huh? You lost your wallet. A West Point cadet brought it back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A, a West Point cadet, uh, his platoon, lo they lost three lives bringing your wallet back. Yeah. Like, I was so happy. <laughs> and awesome. this, this sheriff yeah. wanted to pick me. He had like a nephew who wants to be a writer. So I oh, sat with the sheriff for 20 minutes and I was oh, trying okay. like. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm. That's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. That was in Cornwall on Hudson. Yeah, beautiful huh. little area on the uh, the west side of the the Hudson. Uh, and that's a serious, and and that's 
I mean, yeah, it's a military institution, but uh, to my understanding, the the guys and ladies now at his at Leary's time, I think it was probably all men. Um, that's a serious education too. I mean, you oh, come out is. of there incredibly yeah. well educated. Yeah. By my understanding, it's like it's it's IV adjacent, right? I mean, it's, right. it's considered to be. Yeah, it, I mean, you're you're positioning these you're positioning these students to be full bird colonels and admirals, and you know, right? So mm-hmm. yeah, they're not mm-hmm. fooling around. Yes, they are not. <laughs> we need to start the equivalent for podcasts. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm a I don't even bird, know what that would look like. I'm a yeah. full bird podcaster. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to read a little bit about this. Uh, so this is during this incident. Tim refused to resign. I wouldn't have minded leaving West Point, he would later write, but I knew my resignation would have been a cruel disappointment to my mother. A week later, a meeting from which he was excused was held after supper in the basement sinks. His roommates returned to their room with tears in their eyes. Because of the decision reached at the meeting, they would have to move out of the room. But it was all for the best. In a month, Tim's court-martial would be held. Then he could leave this hellhole and start all over again at a co-ed college. This outcome would be just fine for him because, as one of his roommates pointed out, he wasn't an army type anyway. Because Tim had decided not to resign, opting instead to make his case before a formal court-martial, the Corps did what it had always done to those whom it believed did not belong at the Academy. Tim was silenced. Mm. By order of the Honor Committee, he was excommunicated from the Holy Order. At West Point, Tim Leary was now strictly on his own. Mm. So I'm going to read a little more because I think this is very interesting. By the next morning, as Tim Leary would later write, he had become a non-person at West Point. The two seats on either side of him in the mess hall remained empty at all times. If Tim wanted food past him, he had to write his request on a pad of paper, which he refused to do. Part of me watched in amazement, enjoying this astonishing turn of events, realizing that something important was happening. Although he never mentions it in his autobiography, Tim was hardly the first cadet to be silenced. In 1807, just five years after the academy was established, the Corps decided to punish one of their own for ungentlemanly ungentlemanly behavior by enforcing silence. Mm -hmm. Although no superintendent ever officially sanctioned the custom, it quickly became a tradition at the point. Being silenced did not mean that a cadet could not graduate or go on to a distinguished career in the military. General Benjamin O. Davis Jr., the first black cadet ever to graduate from West Point in the 20th century, was silenced for four years because of the color of his skin. Oh, my God. There's a story. After graduating 35th in his class, David led the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, Huh. Yeah. So, and and there was some business here too. Even within his own class, Tim was not unique. The two black plebes who entered the academy with him had also been silenced, but at least they could talk to each other. Tim could now speak only to Father Murdoch at the Most Holy Trinity Chapel and friends like Jimmy Bryce and John Beach, who, although they had been ordered to find new living quarters, were still willing to converse with Tim in private. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just terrible. Yeah, that's tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I mean, they had a good point. He's he's not really in the right place for him. I mean, there is a certain go where you're wanted sort of thing, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he just doesn't belong there. Yeah. Right. So this is funny. Uh... (laughs) <laughs> so there was uh they do like a recognition for the class one moment here so tim wrote this in his autobiography finally the time awaited by all plebes june week the end of the year of torment the corps moved from the barracks to summer camp in preparation for the graduation parade and recognition for the plebes. Old graduates returned. The walkways were crowded with proud families, girls in flowered dresses, thousands of tourists. From the moment of recognition in June, the plebe was accepted in the lifelong fraternity of West Pointers, the elite club. The upperclassmen and no longer plebes shook hands, laughing, embracing each other, pounding backs, whooping in delight. A storm of of brotherly acceptance swept through the ranks around me, alone, invisible, ignored. I was jostled and pushed by the embracing cadets. I hurried to the northeast corner of Central Barracks and stood facing the rough granite wall, weeping in self-pity. So, yeah, he, Hmm. uh, yeah, this was not a, this is not a good situation for him. Uh, They... The honor committee would eventually revise its position based on the court martial verdict. So the court martial was overturned. The honor committee revised it, but at that point it was just 
way too late. Uh, um, he uh, Leary then resigned and was honorably discharged by the army. Oh, okay. Uh, about 50 years later, he said that it was the only fair trial I've ever had in a court of law. <laughs> uh, and we're going to see in part two uh, that in the 60s and 70s, part two of this episode, it's all one yeah. episode, but my part two, yeah. Yeah. we'll see in the 60s and 70s, he was arrested 36 times. Whoa. <laughs> I knew there was a handful in there. I did not realize it was 36 times. Wow. All right. Hey, what's shot the record? The, I uh, <laughs> in that day and age for a, for a, a person who had been a professor at Harvard, I'm yeah, sure he yeah. has the re- yeah. yeah he has the record. Wow. Um, to his family's chagrin, Leary transferred to where do you think Leary went after this? I don't think you're ever going to guess it. Where would he go? I mean, you want to say like Berkeley or something like that, but I mean, this is what this is the late total the opposite 40s. end of the spectrum. Go really? all the way opposite Berkeley. Oh, What's the gosh. most opposite of Berkeley you could think of? Y- uh, Yale. Uh, <laughs> you're you're not. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna solve this for you because we're gonna okay. be here all night. Yeah. <laughs> Leary, Leary transferred to the University of University of Alabama. What? Bama. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Roll tie? Nothing against Alabama, uh, <laughs> but yeah, that seems completely yeah. left field. Yeah. In l- well, I'm going to explain why. In late 1941, because it admitted him so expeditiously. Ah, yes. Mm-hmm. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I think they call that a safety school. Right. <laughs> uh, nothing against the University of Alabama. I went yeah. to state schools, but, you know, yeah. uh, both, both schools. Mm. Yeah, you just don't. I mean, you just don't see that happening. I, I, yeah, you think but, you'd be on the, mm. I think there's okay. a quality of get me the hell out of the Northeast. Sure, um, yeah, get me away from my folks. Yeah, he well, and rolled. he had this fantasy about being about Huck Finn too, right? Mm. Mm. Yeah, mm. yeah. Something there's about we'll go to that. the South. We'll go to the yeah. Mm. Okay, yeah. He enrolled in the university's ROTC program, maintained top grades, and began to cultivate academic interests in psychology under the aegis of the Middlebury and Harvard-educated Donald Ramsdell and biology. We we already <laughs> saw he's really interested in biology. Yeah, he's yeah. interested in the uh, in, in as long as it's sperm and eggs and yeah, yeah. his own <laughs> conception. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, so what do you think happens to? Okay, and of course, by the way, it's 1941, so. He's getting a deferment from World War II because by hiding in, out, in mm-hmm. hiding out at the university. Yeah, yeah. Yes, as you do. Huh. So, uh, Brad, I'm not going to play a guessing game this entire episode, but right, these are just right. too funny not to. No, no. Uh, what, what What do you think happens to, to Timothy Leary, based on what you know of him now, at the University of ba- of Alabama at Bama? Well, and he's in the ROTC. You said he's in the ROTC. Yeah. yeah. What happened? Oh my gosh. I mean, I want to say they try to recruit him into recruit him into the military. I don't know how it works, but he's got a deferment. So so no. Mm. Um yeah. Okay. I'm gonna I don't tell know. you. I don't know. This is I'm gonna tell you. He he got kicked out. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was pretty yeah. low hanging yeah, fruit, Brad. I don't know layup. why. Should have been a layup. <laughs> yeah, that was a layup, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it was the the ladies oh yeah well <clears throat> here we go one saturday night in november 1942 tim found himself talking to betty who was mm-hmm. the the best looking woman on campus described as uh betty harlow mm-hmm. uh in uh, alabama was co-educational uh tim would later put it she loved to fuck uh so there you go um here we go tim found himself talking to betty through her window screen She had been put on restriction for staying out too late and could not leave her dorm room. Removing the screen, Tim climbed inside and spent the night. Mm. Dawn, his friend, did the same with her sister. Mm. Her sister liked to party. Uh, Her younger sister. At sunrise, Tim and his friend returned to the Theta Chi house on campus where they were both living. Tim was awakened at noon and told that the dean of men wanted to see him in his office at once. (laughs) in an eerie re- replay of the Sunday morning scene at West Point following yeah. the Army Navy game. The, de- oh, the dean demanded to know whether Tim had spent the night in the girl's dorm. Hmm. Tim admitted that he had. Had Tim been copulating with co-eds other than his girlfriend? Tim replied that he had not. 
You mean how coitus? Use... Yeah, yeah, I mean coitus. <laughs> yeah. Had he used a contraceptive? Wow, they're getting into it. He had. Had he engaged in oral copulation? You mean oral coitus? <laughs> uh, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping to get there. <laughs> right. Out, it's funny because the order is different now, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> outraged, the dean shouted that this sort of scandalous behavior had no precedent in the long history of the University of Alabama and that Tim had sullied the honor of Southern womanhood. Jeez. In, his de- in his defense, Tim brought up, well, you got this Irish Yankee coming down. Yeah. yeah. In his defense, Tim brought up his excellent scholastic standing. (laughs) Having received, (laughs) uh, I'm good at this like I'm good at my classes. (laughs) Having received phone calls from two of Tim's professors, the dean already knew about his academic record. Despite Tim's outstanding grades and his complete candor, the dean had no choice. Tim was expelled. Huh. When he called the girls' dormitory, Tim learned that both Betty and her sister had already been bundled off to their home in Washington, D.C. The expulsion was, yeah, the expulsion, I believe their father was some kind of a general. Uh, So, so, whoa. Uh, Yeah, yeah. I want to confirm that. I don't think it's that important, but Mm. uh, uh, it's, anyway, I believe, I mean, if the family's in D.C., there's some muckety-muck. Yeah. Uh, So this is funny. Uh, There's a little more here. The expulsion was more than an academic setback, he would later write. I lost my draft deferment. Whoa. Yeah, it's a big deal. His mother cried. Aunt May, completely dismayed by this new demonstration of leery wildness, could only shake her head in disapproval. When Abigail read Mary a letter from the dean, which said that Tim was a fine young man whose attitude was Christ-like, Aunt May was not impressed. Aunt May said, Jesus would never spend the night in a girl's dormitory. (laughs) (laughs) This is a pretty high bar to try and match. Yeah, wow. Oh, man. So I I have something a little bit about this from uh, from flashbacks from his book. Uh, Let me see here. Uh, Yes, here's the business. The wildest, sexiest girl on the Alabama campus was Betty Harlow, the daughter of an army general. She zeroed in on me with unerring accuracy, and I surrendered instantly. She loved to fuck. Uh, (laughs) So, uh, yeah, I mean, he basically just goes over it. And uh, what a shame that this, you know, this like this poor woman, she fools around with some, you know, this Tim Leary guy. And decades later, his biography comes out and her name's in it (laughs) next. She likes to fuck. It's like, jeez. (laughs) He Give may have break. He may you have changed me, the names. I hope so. You you got me booted out of college. My father right. never forgave me, and now decades later, my grandson's got to read that I like to fuck. Oh, yeah. oof! Intense. I just want to point out we're only like four or five pages into this outline. That's twenty three <laughs> pages. So okay, All right. I'm not going for Crowley level, but yeah. I'm going to try to cover it as best I can. Sure. So, yep. Uh Toward the third part, I'm just going to start to read a little more like Wikipedia. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. yeah uh, right. But I really think it's important for somebody like Leary, who we feel like we know so much in the 60s and is, who is such a pivotal figure there, that we try to understand this childhood. And yeah. Because yeah. mm. he does seem to come out of nowhere in a way. I mean, mm, I guess many mm. people do, but he certainly yeah. does seem to just kind of. Well, and, and hopefully the pieces are beginning to fit a little bit in your mind uh, mm-hmm. around good old uh, Timmy. Yeah, Leary was drafted into the U.S. Army and received basic training at Fort Eustis in 1943. He remained in the non-commissioned officer track while enrolled in the psychology subsection of the Army Specialized Training Program, including three months of study at Georgetown University. Ooh. All right. <laughs> so we're starting to get ooh, spook central. Yeah. And six months at Ohio State. With limited need for officers late in the war, Leary was briefly assigned as a private first class to the Pacific Warbound 2D, I think it's probably 2nd Combat Cargo Group, which he later characterized as a suicide command whose main mission, as far as I could see, was to eliminate the entire civilian branch of American aviation from post-war rivalry. Uh, He was at Syracuse Army Air Base in Mattadale, New York. 
Hmm. Uh, after a fateful reunion with Ramsdell, the previous profession, professor, I believe, mm-hmm. who was assigned to De- Deshaun General Hospital in Butler, Pennsylvania, as chief psychologist in Buffalo, New York, he was promoted to corporal and reassigned to his mentor's command as a staff psychometrician. He remained in Deshaun, Deshaun's deaf rehabilitation clinic for the remainder of the war. So the deaf rehabilitation, probably from shell shock from shells, things like that. Mm -hmm. While stationed in Butler, Leary courted Marianne Bush. They married, it's Bush with a a CH. Mm -hmm. They married in April 1945. Uh, Timothy Leary was George Bush's real father. Uh, (laughs) Uh, Oh, and also his real father was George Patton. Mm -hmm. Yeah, LOL. Yeah, <laughs> Leary. Leary was discharged at the rank of sergeant in January 1946, having earned such standard decorations as the Good Conduct Medal, the American Defense Service Medal, the American Campaign Medal, and the World War II Victory Medal. Hmm. Hello, okay. boys. The Soviets and and the United States of America defeated fascism. Good job. <laughs> you did it. Here's your, you participated doing psychometry for, for deaf soldiers. I'm sure I wonder what he made of all that. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, he would later say he was devoted to the overthrow of the American Empire. So, uh, as the war concluded, Leary was reinstated at the University of Alabama. Hmm, probably well, for well, he he served honorably in the military. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. and you've got yeah. this professor, and okay, right? Uh, he received credit for his Ohio State psychology coursework. He completed his degree via correspondence courses, that's kind of funny, Hmm. and graduated in August of 1945. After receiving his undergraduate degree, Leary pursued an academic career, which to me is just like... It doesn't make any sense. I mean, in a way. It does, I guess. He really did become quite interested in psychology, so here we are. Yeah. Um, Different time, too. Well, Any absolutely. one of these things would totally murder your entire yeah, you'd life. You'd be now. derailed. You'd be do it. You'd be working a fryer at KFC, right? Yeah. Although yeah. worth remembering that Leary does come from a certain class of person, despite mm-hmm. the the Irish Catholic business. There's there's mm-hmm. a lot of uh, power there in the family. Mm-hmm. Um, in 1946, he received uh, a MS, Master of Science in Psychology, at the State College of Washington in Pullman where he studied under educational psychologist Lee Kronbach. His MS thesis was on clinical applications of the Wechsler Adult Intelligence uh, Scale. So some pretty serious science. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah, no joke. In 1947, Marianne gave, gave birth to their first child, Susan. A son, Jack, arrived two years later. Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> so now I have a little business here, I believe, about the children. Uh, give me a little... Uh, moment here brad to just take a break just tell where are you at with timmy leary right now help me out yeah well so i mean some of this stuff isn't too surprising to me just because i know how much of a sort of a contrarian he is and you know what we would call a free spirit so it doesn't surprise me that he's getting kicked out of these institutions i i think i sort of knew somewhere in the back of my mind that he was a total hornball and so that stuff doesn't quite surprise me either. Um, but as you're telling the story, I am sort of surprised that this turn to taking taking the academic route quite seriously um, to go from not taking it seriously at all to, you know, devoting your life to it is a, that's that's quite a that's quite a transformation, you know, and I don't you wonder if that David Ramsdale guy kind of took him aside and said, hey, listen, Tim, you're smart. You know, you can, you know, we can work together. I, you know, it's, it's a very interesting transition. Um, and, it, you know, I'm sure it's also to be working in psychology at that time. It's not, I mean, it's not, a, it's barely a science now, but then it's it <laughs> certainly, it was certainly the wild. It must have been the wild west. I mean, you talk about this Wexler IQ test. I don't even know how long that test had been around at that point. Well, um, you're you're presaging something that I wasn't sure I was going to read from, but I'm going to read yeah. this now uh, <laughs> because it's important. And then I'm going to go on and talk a little bit about what happens next for him. Um, mm-hmm. They they went out to California now. Now they're at Berkeley. OK, right? OK. So now they're headed to Berkeley. You <laughs> yeah, were ahead you of things. You, just, okay. you, you just had to go to Alabama first. That's Alabama right. is a known uh, feeder school <laughs> to Berkeley. Um, 
Roll Tide. Right. Uh, the field of study Tim had chosen was an academic growth industry. Much as World War I had introduced widespread psychological testing to select personnel within the armed forces, World War II had created an overwhelming need for clinical psychologists to treat those who had returned home suffering from the after effects of battle. On April 1st, 1946, Ernest R. Hilgard wrote in Psychology in America, there were 44,000 neuropsychiatric patients cared for by the VA and only 30,000 of all other types. So hmm. more mental and neurological patients than, or neuropsychiatric patients than other types. Hmm. At the start well, of World War II. That's interesting because we hear, we hear that they didn't do anything at all for these guys. That's kind mm. of the narrative we hear. That's interesting. Mm. Okay. Not so much about World War II, I don't think, Brad. I think that yeah. generation got everything. They got a lot. Mm. They got the, mm. the GI okay. Bill and all. I think it was more Vietnam that yeah. they got yeah. wrecked. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't know. I'm not a, an historian yeah. of that. So um, so let's see. By 1945, there were... Uh, uh, excuse me. At the start of World War II, there were only 35 psychiatrists in the regular Army Medical Corps. By 1945, there were 2,500 but because of sheer need, the Veterans Administration had granted clinical psychologists the same rank as psychiatrists, and the National Institute of Mental Health had, uh, was established in Washington. Uh, FedGov filtered grant money through both agencies and began funding a multitude of university-based psychology research programs. Woohoo! We know what's yeah. coming. Yeah, MK right. Ultra. MK Ultra. <laughs> you can hear it. You can sort of hear uh, it off in the distance. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Clinical psychology was burgeoning. Mer uh, Merv Friedman, a fellow graduate student who became one of Tim's best friends, would later say, the world was opening up, and I don't think any of us felt that we couldn't find or wouldn't find a niche. All right? Hmm. So- Tim enrolled as a doctoral candidate in what was reputed to be the best psychology department in the world. He and Marianne lived in a house uh, they were renting for a while before moving to a tiny apartment uh, on the south side of the university. She found a job teaching in the speech department. What Tim never mentions in his account of their arrival is that after three years of marriage, Marianne was eight months pregnant. She gave birth to a daughter, Susan. Uh, Tim stayed at her side to comfort her as she went through a wild period of distress and or disorientation, finally muffled by medication. After the birth, he was taken by her doctor to see their baby girl. The way in which he recalled his first reaction to his newborn daughter speaks volumes about their relationship. Behind a glass window in the nurse's arms was this tiny new being looking at me with my own eyes. In his mm -hmm. firstborn child, Tim saw only his reflection. And we are dealing with a bit of a... I think it's fair to say we're dealing with a bit of a grandiose narcissist in in Tim Leary. We don't, mm -hmm. I don't diagnose. Uh, we don't yeah. we try to avoid that on the show. However, he is a psychologist. Yeah, so well, he's got yeah. yeah, he's got messianic tendencies for sure, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, and his own children later would go on. They would have drug problems, and mm -hmm. and probably not surprising. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's see here. He would say, "I recall that the two years." Um, well, hang on here. So on September 29th, 1947, a delighted Abigail, his mother, wrote, a, wrote to congratulate Marianne on Susan's birth. In closing a generous check, she proudly signed the, le the letter grandmother. I know you will be very happy with your baby, Abigail wrote. I recall that the two years Tim was a baby were the happiest of my life. And I know the years Susan is a baby relying only on you will fill you with completeness and happiness that is unforgettable. Go mobs. Unfortunately, this did not prove to be true for Marianne, or so Tim Leary would later claim. After Marianne and Susan became, came home, this is Tim writing, an agonizing problem showed itself. When mother offered the breast, baby took one sip of milk and let out a fearful shriek. After a week of this torture, I went out and bought the formula works. Susan took to the bottle greedily. Marianne was never the same. The fun-loving, competent young woman changed with the motherhood imprint into a duplicate of her mother, worried, introverted, increasingly dependent. I became an industrious father robot, dutifully getting juicy worms for the nest. Hmm. Going hmm. on, those who knew Tim and Marianne in Berkeley tell a different story. Nancy Adams first met the couple in the fall of 1949 when she and her husband Charles lived across the street. Nancy became particularly close to Marianne. As young mothers, they often babysat for each other. 
She was not depressed when she had her babies, Nancy Adam recalled. She never said they would not nurse. As far as her being depressed after delivering her children, no, I certainly didn't see her that way. She was a complicated, rather rebellious person, but not depressed. Not then. Hmm. Tim Leary may not be the most reliable narrator. <laughs> uh, yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> yeah. His autobiography is called flashbacks <laughs> yeah, he tripped like... <laughs> acid at least 500 times and that yeah. that's not including mushrooms that's not including mescaline that's not including mm. any other business yeah yeah so yeah. five trips can be enough for a lot of people right scramble scramble up some scramble up some connections for sure mm -hmm. yeah 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 and now i found myself and i can move on and Right, but right. Timothy Leary yeah. was doing it weekly for a long time. Yes, yes, yeah. So this is very important. <laughs> this is this is art of darkness. Yeah. Now, why would Timothy Leary misremember this business? We're gonna come to we're gonna come to the reason why here soon. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Pressing on. Mm -hmm. We're now in the 1950s. I'm gonna I'm gonna do kind of a dance or something when we get to the 1960s. I'm gonna yeah yeah yeah. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna light one up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in 1950, Leary received a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of California, Berkeley. In the post-war era, Leary was galvanized by the objectivity of modern physics. His doctoral dissertation, The Social Dimensions of Personality, Group Process and Structure, approached group therapy as a cyclotron from which behavior uh, characteristics could be derived and quantified in a manner analogous to the periodic table. Wow. Foreshadowing his later development of the interpersonal circumplex. This was this is work that was influential uh, at mm -hmm. the time. I don't know how germane it is now, but this was he was moving the needle. He got a PhD at Berkeley in a relatively young field. Yeah. Um, Leary stayed on in the Bay Area as an assistant clinical professor of medical psychology at the University of California, San Francisco. Concurrently, he co-founded Kaiser Hospital's psychology department in Oakland, California, and maintained a private consultancy. Full-blown, wow. petty bourgeois, upper middle class success on the yeah. other side of the country. Absolutely. Here we are. Yeah. We've arrived. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so now, now the life is going to Life is good. Life is going to change a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he's made it. He's got two children. Uh, they're traveling to Europe. In 1952, the Leary family spent a year in Spain, subsisting on a research grant. Ha -ha. According, nice, give us a nice. Give us a grant. Give the yeah. pod a grant. Yeah. We'll podcast <laughs> from Spain. I, uh, yeah, Easy. support the pod. Yeah. <laughs> According to Berkeley colleague, why aren't there grants for podcasts? What's going on? I don't know. Wrong? Yeah, they're coming. Yeah. They're coming. Maybe it, we'll get the first one. Yeah. It's over. Yeah. Doomer <laughs> over. It's oh, so over, bro. <clears throat> According Wait, we're to back. Berkeley, we're, we're, now, now we're back. It's over. We're back. It's over. We're back. Uh, <laughs> According to Berkeley colleague Marv Friedman, something had been stirred in him in terms of breaking out of being another cog in society. Leary's marriage was strained by infidelity and mutual alcohol abuse mm. so we've come all this way here nearly nearly to the end of part two or part one of my outline mm -hmm. dad's an alcoholic mom's a pious catholic grandpa's a bit theatrical we have all sorts of problems in school despite it all where we become kind of a ladies ladies man at a young age, get kicked out of different places, bucking society, and now you still land with this this PhD from Berkeley. You're still part of the establishment, and now you and your wife are struggling with alcoholism mm. and infidelity. Right. So for all of that, you're in your mid thirties. So it's yeah. 19, we're, we're going to flash forward to 1955. He's 35 oh, years old. Yeah. 35 years old. Yeah. yeah. And then this happens. <clears throat> and this is reading from his, uh, from flashbacks. And this is where he starts October 22nd, Berkeley, California. This is chapter one of his, of his book. Exactly in the middle of the allotted term of this life's journey, my 35th birthday, I entered a dark place. Marianne, my sweet, loving wife, mother of Susan and Jack, killed herself. 
It was a cloudy Saturday afternoon or Saturday morning. We had tickets for the football game between the California Golden Bears and the USC Trojans. I woke with a a hangover, but sensed at once that Marianne, Marianne was not beside me. I jumped up, then lugged my leaden stomach around the house, shouting, Marianne, no answer. I ran outside. The garage door was closed, but I could hear the motor running inside. I wrenched the redwood door open and smelled the stale breath of exhaust. Marianne Marianne lay on the front seat, relaxed and cold. Our two children, Susan, age eight, and Jack, age six, awakened by my shouting, stood in the driveway in their pajamas, eyes bulging. Susan, I shouted, run to the firehouse and tell them to bring oxygen. The firemen came. It was too late. Marianne had left us to our own devices. Whoa. Yeah, that's real heavy. Oh, my God. Dark. Yeah, that's dark. Dark. I think it's such an important uh, thing to understand him. And yeah, and you, and, and you place this before. This is before the Tim Leary we know, right? So this is the the villain origin story is somehow mixed up in this, right? Or the hero origin story, however you look at him, is mixed up in the, the in that moment where he opens that garage door. Wow, hundred oh, percent. And the two kids standing there, right? How devastating oh, that must have been. And you think, thinking back to the a few beats before. This could be why he maybe he misremembers. Maybe he's trying to sort of cast around for blame, maybe a little bit. She couldn't nurse. Yeah. She was always she, depressed. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, maybe that, maybe that, you know, in his head excuses him a little bit for his crappy behavior because she was kind of headed that direction anyway, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow. All right. Well, we're going to do part two here now. Uh, and part two is called Experiments in Escape. Mm, and okay. Brad, hmm. this guy has got to escape to the restroom real quick. <laughs> Do you want to tell people tell people about the Patreon, tell people sure. about uh, the book club and yeah. a little bit of what we have planned there. And I'll be back in a quick 60. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, so... Um... Patreon.com uh, slash Art of Dark Pod. Um, we're just steadily building support there. And, you know, here's the, the deal. Right now, what you get for $3 a month is you get access to primarily what you get is you get access to the After Dark episodes. This is another 20 to 30 minute, um, sometimes longer uh, extension of the core episode where we often dig into a um, something that's maybe salacious or juicy or just fascinating um, from that could have gone into the main episode, but we're saving it for our beloved patron folks. Um, at the end of the year, we're going to bump that entry rate up to five dollars. So that's as we go into 2023, we'll bump that up to five dollars. Um, those who are in at the three dollar a month rate, you guys get grandfathered in. And we're doing something else next year in addition to the After Dark episodes. The After Dark episodes stay. We're never going to stop doing those. But we're going to add uh, what we're calling Bookends, the AOD Reading Club. And what we're going to do with that is every six to eight weeks throughout the year of 2023, we're going to read a book um, together. Basically, we'll read a book. Usually, they'll be either be germane to a core episode that we've just done, or there'll be a uh, contemporary piece of uh, literature from you know one of our friends usually. <laughs> and what we'll do is we'll have a we'll have a uh, a private Zoom link for patron subscribers, and we'll all get in and share our thoughts, what we think, ask questions, get to know each other, generally talk about uh, the book that we read. We're gonna start with Heart of Darkness, but we got a whole slate of great books that I think anybody who's into the show is either going to be excited about reading, is going to be something that they kind of always wished they had read. We've got a couple of those in there that are sort of, you know, easy to easy enough to fall between the cracks, but you know, you feel like you should know them. Um and I think it's going to be I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Um I'm really looking forward to looking forward to doing that. And it's it, I feel like it's part of our our unstated mission statement really is ultimately to do this right it's like let's make reading books uh i don't even want to say cool again let's make it interesting uh let's make it find the others which is something that tim leary said all the time we're the others you guys are the others so let's kind of do this thing together so art of uh patreon.com slash art of dark pod 
Well played, Brad. All right. I'm very excited about 2023. Yeah, I love absolutely. chatting in the Telegram. We love our patrons. We love our listeners. We know you're yeah. out there. Please consider supporting the pod. We put in the work. We're getting our books paid for now, but mm-hmm. it would be wonderful to, to be able to free up even a little more time. And your support permits that. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Shall we dig in? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. All right, let's talk about experiments and escape. So uh, in 1955, 56, uh, 55, Leary and Mary Della Chiapa, the woman with whom it's Chiapa, I don't know how to say it, Mm. C-I-O-P-P-A, the woman with whom he had been having an affair were married. Mm. So she kills herself, wife kills herself, you you marry the woman you're having an affair with. Fabulous. Okay. Dark. Yeah. Greenfield uh, notes, this is our friend Greenfield from the uh, book, an occasion of police being dispatched to the Leary household in reference to a complaint of Leary hitting his wife, although no report was filed. Huh. Also mentioned is a report by this second wife claiming that Leary and his doctoral thesis faculty advisor were having a homosexual relationship. Oh, interesting. I had never heard this before. Huh. Uh, this could be you hit me. I'm going to get back to you. Right. Da da da. We don't know. Finding mm-hmm. themselves in a less than perfect arrangement, uh, the Learys were divorced in 1956. So a, what, a year, year later. Yeah, wow. yeah. You marry the woman you were cheating on your now suicided wife with, and it lasts a year. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And again, the whiff of alcohol in the background here uh, right. is my impression. Um, he must have been devastated. I mean, it's yeah. Uh, obviously just mm-hmm. horrific yeah so now we're going to move more uh forward here to 1959 and we're going to look at how he finally gets to, gets to harvard ah okay interesting. that's pretty yeah. interesting isn't it yeah not quite there yet so here we go huh, we're in flashbacks again so in florence italy I was living in a penthouse overlooking the domes and towers of this medieval Tuscan city. From the patio, I could look down on Dante's slow-moving Arno River. Susan, now 12, and Jack, now 10, were with me attending the American school just east of the old bridge. I was almost broke, and employment prospects were dicey. Until the preceding year, I had been a successful psychologist, author of many scientific papers, and two well-regarded books on the diagnosis of personality. After 16 years of research and teaching, I had quit my post as Director of Psychological Research at the Kaiser Foundation Hospital, Oakland, California, because I felt confused about my profession. For 10 years, my research team had been keeping score on the success rate of psychotherapy. We found that no matter what kind of psychiatric psychiatric treatment was used, the same discouraging results occurred. One Hmm. third of the patients got better, one third stayed the same, one third got worse. Control groups receiving no no treatment showed the same scores for all its efforts psychology still hadn't developed a way of significantly and predictably changing human behavior i had found myself practicing a profession that didn't seem to work for the last year i'd been in self-imposed european exile living on a small research grant and cashed in insurance policies reading philosophy and thinking and thinking i wouldn't accept the apparent fact that humans Even university educated humans couldn't solve the problems of human nature, unhappiness, stupidity, and conflict. This personal and professional malaise spread out to the Cold War and the bomb. Nothing had really been right since Hiroshima. I just finished typing a manuscript called The Existential Transaction on an old-fashioned rented Olivetti. This book suggested new humanist methods for behavior change. For the first time since my 35th birthday, I was feeling some flickers of enthusiasm. I thought I knew how humans could direct their personal evolution. The next step was to find a clinic or university where I could put these ideas to the test. The penthouse bell rang, and there, Shaggy Tweedy, his Celtic eyes twinkling with intelligence and rebellion, was Frank Barron, my old friend and drinking companion from grad school in Berkeley. Hey, Brad. Yeah. <laughs> Since then, he had earned a reputation as one of the world's leading authorities on the psychology of creativity. In the course of his studies, Frank had become passionate in his belief that only psychology, by affecting a fundamental reprogramming of the human human mind, could prevent a nuclear holocaust. Serious business. Yeah, wow. The stakes are, there in their minds at least, the stakes are very high. That's incredible. Yeah. And I do, Mm -hmm. and I do, sorry, I I do like this thing. I I do respect Leary saying, Hey, this isn't, doesn't work. 
Like we've been doing all of this. I've got my life invested in it and it doesn't work. Like I just respect that clarity and honesty with himself. It's, right. It's, I could yeah. do this for the rest of my life, make mm-hmm. lots of money. Right. Become crank be out renowned. a scientific cr- mm-hmm. crank out a scientific paper every year, every six months and a book every three years. And yeah. 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 So, Leary himself was not a science truster. Right. Right. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yep. Yeah. He would later liken LSD, I think, to like nuclear energy for the brain for rewiring yourself, something like that, if I'm not, if I'm not mm-hmm. mistaken. All right. So his friend was uh, burning to tell him, uh, tell me about some unusual experiments he performed recently. He said his research was on creativity had led him to Mexico, where he interviewed a psychiatrist who had been producing visions and trances using the so-called magic mushrooms. Mm. Frank, ooh. Frank had taken a bag filled with the mushrooms back to Berkeley and ingested them, starting a long tradition at Berkeley. At this <laughs> point. <laughs> Uh, Berkeley, roll Berkeley means different, something different from roll tide. (laughs) Frank had taken out, yeah, okay. At at this point, Frank lost me with his talk about William Blake revelations, mystical insights, and transcendental perspectives produced by the strange fungi. I was a bit worried about my old friend and warned him against the possibility of losing his scientific credibility if he babbled this way among our colleagues. Frank left two very practical gifts of friendship. He offered me, (laughs) excuse me, a lot of reading. Mm -hmm. He offered me $500 from his Ford Foundation research grant to go to London and interview Arthur Kessler on creativity. Then he told me uh, that the director of the Harvard Center for Personality Research, Professor David McClelland, was taking his sabbatical leave in Florence. He might help me get a job. Isn't that how it always works? Yep, yep. Professor McClellan had read my book, The Interpersonal Diagnosis of Personality, and was eager to talk shop. He invited me for lunch the next day. The professor was a lanky, Lincoln-esque man, about 45, married to Mary, a petite, dynamic Quaker. They bubbled with New England academic charm. McClellan and I sat on a patio with a view of the fabled city, hometown of Dante Alighieri, who we're doing next year. Drinking pale Chianti, uh, ate his liver with fava beans and a nice Chianti, <laughs> and discussing the future of psychology. I had to do it. <laughs> McClelland examined the title page of my manuscript. He wanted to know what it was all about. I explained that by existential, I meant that the psychologist should work with people in real life situations, like a naturalist in the field, observing behavior in the trenches, gonzo psychology. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, yeah. We should treat people as they actually are and not impose the medical model or any other model on them. McClellan lit a twisted Italian cigar in motion for me to go on. By transaction, I mean that psychologists should remain detached from their subjects. Shouldn't remain detached. They should get involved, engage in the events they're studying. They should enter each experiment prepared to change as much or more than the subjects being studied. McClellan raised an eyebrow. The scientist should change himself. He picked up my manuscript and flipped through the pages with concentration. Nerds. Yeah. I poured more wine and wondered whether I'd ever again be able to make a living in psychology. (laughs) Yeah, this guy's looking at him like he's a wacko. But he is, you can hear this, he's building himself an on-ramp to the psychedelic experience, though he doesn't even know that yet. Yeah. McClelland uh, took off his glasses and looked still more solemn. What you're suggesting in this book is a drastic change in the role of the scientist, teacher, and therapist. Instead of processing subjects, students, and patients by uniform and recognized standards, we should take an egalitarian or information exchange approach. Is that it? Mm -hmm. Uh Uh-oh. That's Mm -hmm. what I had in mind. (laughs) I gather you're hoping some unsuspecting educational organization will hire you to set up activist research projects, which will require the institution to change itself. That's it, I admitted. I figured it was time to collect my manuscript and pedal Susan's bicycle back down the hill. McClellan poured us both more wine. He lit another stogie. Okay, I'm prepared to offer you a job at Harvard. Oh. Are you are you serious? I'm intrigued, said Professor McClellan. There's no question that what you're advocating is going to be the future of American psychology. You're not a lone voice. There are several hot shots in our profession, like Benjamin Spock, Carl Rogers, Abraham Maslow, Harry Stack Sullivan, Milton Gloaming urging that we emphasize inner potential and personal growth through self-reliance so patients avoid dependence on authoritarian doctors and dogmas. You're spelling out frontline tactics. 
You're just what we need to shake things up at Harvard. Okay. Hey, that's pretty cool. That's a pretty All big right. meeting. Yeah. All right. All right. Pretty good. <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty good. Yeah, not yeah. so bad, Timmy. You're going to make it after all. Yep. <laughs> well, so here's what he, he how he describes Harvard. Uh, Harvard at the beginning of this new decade was a prestigious academic coral reef, a solid accumulation of academic traditions piled up over the centuries, supporting a great variety of shoreline creatures, barnacled full professors, quick darting lecturers, nervous slippery graduate students, grayly, uh, gaily covered, colored tiny undergraduates who were snapped up by scuttling faculty crabs and occasionally by Kissinger Schlesinger type killer whales who swept through these <laughs> sheltered waters on annual migrations to and from Wall Street, Washington, and other feeding grounds. That's a great so, description, man. That's mm -hmm. pretty That's pretty brilliant. Okay. Yeah, 100%. Well, and who do you think we're going to meet here at Harvard? Uh, well, we eventually we meet Richard Alpert at some there point. There you go. Yeah. You got yeah. it. So I'm going to uh, <clears throat> read a little more about it, and then we'll get to uh, Richard. Mm -hmm. I got off to a fast start at the Harvard on the Harvard academic track. There was much student dissatisfaction with the Freudians, whose theories of psychopathology thrived in the damp atmosphere of the back bay. The Skinnerian conditioners had alienated many of their clannish, humorless manipulators, manip uh, manipulations. They alienated people with that. The Social Relations mm -hmm. Department had just completed a statistical survey of diagnostic systems used in psychology, and my interpersonal diagnosis of personality, named the best book in, this, in psychotherapy for the year 1957, fared well under this analysis, attracting much interest in its new approaches to behavior change. The graduate students were especially ready for new techniques. They had hoped to find human psychology the most thrilling, lively, and optimistic area of science. So... Mm -hmm. All right, we got a new mm -hmm. lease on life. First wife kills herself, a few years go by, get married, get a divorce, and somehow manage to get your way to Harvard. No slouch. Yeah. And he's yeah. he's not he's not married at this time. Right, right. So here we go. But his kids are with him, right? I mean, he's mm -hmm. toting these kids yep. around. Okay. Yep. Indeed. Yeah. So let's see here. I believe so. Yeah, he would Must obviously be. he would take. Yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Upon arriving in Cambridge, Susan and Jack and I moved into a two bedroom suite at a hotel one block away from the Center for Personality Research. Hmm. The next day, I enrolled them in public school and visited Calvin Pembroke, famed Harvard Square tailor. I've just joined the <laughs> faculty, Mr. Pembroke, and I need a varsity uniform. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, right yeah, wonderful. Right All right, let's meet uh, Ram Das. Yeah. Uh, well, and for people who don't know, who's who's Baba Ram Dass? Who's Dick Albert, Brad? Yeah, I mean, I can I tell you just a quick hit. I mean, he's he's Richard Albert was a uh, similar to Tim Leary. He was on this sort of I, I guess you'd call him sort of the second generation of psychologists or maybe the third generation of psychologists after after Freud, um, who was actually kind of this bi-coastal guy. He would t teach at Harvard. He would teach um, out west someplace. I'm not sure if Stanford or something else. Until he had himself had a psychedelic experience with magic mushrooms, realized that, you know, the, the path that he'd taken wasn't going to work, started himself down this route that would lead to him getting kicked out of academia. Despite being a wild success, he might have been actually a more successful sort of academic than Leary up to that point. And just in terms of accolades and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and eventually went to India and found himself a guru, took the name Ramdas and brought back a sort of modernized version of Hinduism uh, back to the United States that was hugely influential on the 60s counterculture and going forward. I mean, he just Ramdas just died like two years ago and was he was still leading retreats and and that sort of thing had a, had quite a big quite a big group of people. Um, I'm sure there's some darkness with him, too. But but, you know, one of those guys who to the end seemed like everybody who came into his circle had good things to say about him. So, right. Yeah. Well, now we're really getting into the thick of it, the stuff that everybody kind of knows Timmy Leary for. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm going to read about Dick Elpert, uh, later to be known as Ram Dass. Down the hall in a high prestige corner office was a most engaging faculty member, someone who was to play a major role in the events to follow. Assistant Professor Richard Al Alpert was a tall, boyish, 30-year-old psychologist, an ambitious academic politician, engaging, witty, a big, tail-wagging puppy dog, <laughs> a bachelor. Dick was the only other faculty member to keep night office hours. 
It was my custom after dinner when the kids were in bed in our hotel suite to walk the two blocks past the tiny jewel box chapel of the Swedenborg Church to my office where I read, wrote, drank California white wine from half gallon bottles, smoked Marlboros and chatted with graduate students. What a life. Oh, yeah. Oh, and, and please. I mean, I, I don't expect you to know about putting your hot seat. Where are the kids? Just, they would, I'm sure they'd be with care or a nanny. Right. Yeah. You have a yeah. nanny. I mean, yeah. he's a Harvard professor with the best book in psychotherapy in 1957. Yeah, he's that's got, true. He's not, he's yeah. got scratch. He's not worried. And his yeah. family had money and things. So he's, right. he's a made he's man right. to mm -hmm. a point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, an endless procession of ill at ease young men paraded past my door for after hour interviews with Dick. Often he joined the group in my office to listen to our discussions. Later, we'd catch a beer and a midnight sandwich at Harvard square. At this time, Dick's father was president of the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad, a bankrupt outfit still loaded with prestige and lootable assets. Dick <laughs> made playful use of his connection to the railroad, enjoying the penthouse apartment the company maintained on Park Avenue, the limousines, and access to the inner sanctums of Grand Central Station. A fun-loving kid, he was the last person you'd accuse of religious or spiritual potential. Got that trust money. We got he that does. that railroad yeah. money. Yeah, his dad was a founder of Brandeis University. Richard Albert's mm. dad. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they're he's, yeah, yeah. So they they partner up, and he sort of saw it as a uh, Tom Sawyer, Huck Finn kind of a <laughs> yeah. They had fun. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're gonna get into the magic mushrooms in Mexico, and him finally getting turned on. Mm -hmm. In Cuernavaca. So we're in 1960. And here's his description of Cuernavaca. In 1960, Cuernavaca was a charming spot. For centuries, a retreat for sophisticated Aztecs, corrupt politicians, and wandering scholars. Charles Lindbergh, one of my heroes, courted Anne Morrow there. Hmm. So they went there. His son and he scouted the town. And they got together. And we, were you talking about Gerhard Braun? Is that the person who turned him on? Uh, no, I, I could be wrong. I thought it was um, Wasson, Gerald, Gerald, George mm. Wasson. Yeah, that I, name I could be coming. wrong. Mm, yeah, that's yeah. fine. That name's not coming up here. Uh, it's it's possible that someone named Wasson told him to go down there. But in any case, uh, uh, he here, here he is describing his first trip. All right. I picked one up. The mushroom. It's stank of dampness. The smell is like crumb crumbling logs or certain New England basements, and it tasted worse than it looked. Bitter, stringy. I took a slug of carta blanca, jammed the rest in my mouth, and washed it down. Everyone was listening to his or her own stomach, expecting to be poisoned. Five of us sat on the sunlit terrace in our bathing suits, waiting, waiting, asking each other, how many did you take? Do you feel anything? Nothing changes. Nothing changes. Yeah. <laughs> Two people abstained. One was Ruth Dettering, who was pregnant. Well, good for her. That's, yeah, mm -hmm. you don't, yeah. She had a degree in nursing, so I was glad she would be there as an observer. The other abstain abstainer was Bruce, who said he suffered from nervous fits and feared a reaction. Also reasonable. Yeah. These, they're, they're doing this pretty smart for yeah. right out the gate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 This is not party time. This is something yeah. else. He was wearing bathing trunks over flowered undershorts, green garters, black socks, leather shoes, and a silken robe. I could just, <laughs> what what a look. And then you start coming up and this guy's yeah. wearing that. Oh. Yeah, you're like the sixth white person to eat mushrooms at this point. <laughs> like, that's, that's so hilarious. we appointed the most white person alive. <laughs> uh, let's describe it again. Uh, bathing trunks over flowered undershorts, green garters, black socks, leather shoes, and a silken robe. Too funny. <laughs> It sounds like that scene in Boogie Nights. He's yep. going to start throwing firecrackers. Yeah. So we appointed him official scientist. He was he was to take detailed notes of our reactions. Mm. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I began Scientific. to feel. Mm -hmm. And that was a feature that would persist throughout his stuff. People had to, even, even uh, when he would finally kind of set up his quasi cult compound type thing, people were expected to write about their experiences. Mm. I began to feel strange like going under dental gas. Ah, father. Mm -hmm. Mildly nauseous, detached, moving away, away from the group in bathing suits on a terrace under the bright Mexican sky. Everything was quivering with life, even inanimate objects. Dettering said he felt it too. Bruce busied himself writing. His thin shoulders bent over the notepad like a Viennese psychoanalyst, the scientist. But he had no idea what he was observing. This professional revelation struck me as immensely comic. 
laughing, laughing, laugh, couldn't stop laughing. Mm. Everyone looked at me in astonishment. Their wonder increased my amusement. Bruce looked up, his, up, his red tongue flicking out from the shrubbery of his beard. I laughed again at my own everyday pomposity. The narrow arrogance of scholars, the impudence of the rational, the smug naivete of words in contrast to the raw, rich, ever-changing panorama that flooded my brain. I walked into the house, fell on the bed, deadering followed watching. Do you see it, Dick? Our little minds. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. He nodded. Good. He saw. He began to laugh. I gave way to delight as mystics have for centuries when they peeked through the curtains and discovered that this world so manifestly real was actually a tiny stage set constructed by the mind. There was a sea of possibilities out there. In there, other realities, an infinite array of programs for other futures. Starting back to the terrace, hello. My walk had changed into a rubber leg slither. The room was apparently filled with invisible liquid. I undulated over to poet Betty. Her classic face unfolded like a sunflower. She was in some place of bliss. There was Ruth Dettering standing by the door. I swam to her. Look, Ruth, I said, sounding surprisingly normal. These mushrooms are stronger than I ex expected. I think you should send the kids to the movies in town and give the maid <laughs> the afternoon off. Stay close and keep your eyes on things. Then... I was gone into the fabled optical department, Nile palaces, Hindu temples, Babylonian boudoirs, Bedouin pleasure tents, gem flashery, woven silk gowns, breathing color, mosaics flaming with muzo emeralds, Burma rubies, Ceylon sapphires. Here came those jeweled serpents, those Moorish reptiles sidling, coiling, tumbling down the drain in the middle of my retina. Next came the trip through evolution, guaranteed to everyone who signs up to this brain tour, slipping down the recapitulation tube to those ancient midbrain projection rooms, snake time, fish time, down through giant jungle palm time, green lacy fern leaf time, calmly observing the first sea thing crawl ashore. I lay with her, sand rasping under my cheek, then floated down into the deep green ocean. Hello. I am the first living thing. Whoa. He got some good shit. They got some good shit. They got some good shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they did. Yeah, they wow. did. Wow. Wow. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, you can see, especially when you don't have, I, I'm always fascinated. <clears throat> One of the aspects of sort of history of psychedelic use in America that I'm interested in is these first people because they, they have so few reference to other people's experiences. Now, like if somebody out there, you know, eats mushrooms for their first time and they've heard this description or they've heard any of the other thousands of descriptions, all of these things, they have their context already. And it doesn't necessarily mean make it a less significant experience. I I'm just fascinated with that. Like, I know I don't, I've never read a description of anybody doing this. I don't have any idea what's coming my way, right? It's got to be I feel like it would be even more earth shape, earth shattering for you in that context, right? You feel like I'm drinking a bunch of booze and I smoked a joint one time and I did laughing gas at one point, and then all of a sudden you're like encountering the first living thing in psychic space. Like, yeah, it's a whole different, it's a whole different ball game for sure. Of the people they may have had to reference, who would they have had? Who's the big guy? All all this Huxley. Yeah, that's, we're, we're yeah. gonna we're gonna meet Huxley oh, okay, in a good. little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Huxley comes around. That's I knew yeah. you'd get that one. I knew you'd get that. One. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna be getting to uh, bits and bobs here now about Huxley, Allen Ginsberg, Neil Cassidy, and Jack Kerouac. Oh, All yeah. right, okay. so get ready. Yeah, yeah. Well, on vacation in Mexico in the summer of 1960, Leary ingested the psychedelic mushrooms he had heard so much about, an experience he claimed changed his life. From then on, he became obsessed with various psychedelics. At Harvard, he started the Harvard Psychedelic Project. With what seemed a never-ending supply of psilocybin, which from the mushrooms, mm -hmm. uh, pills from the Sandoz Corporation, Leary began administering the drug to faculty, graduate students, and as many celebrities as he could. 
including writers Allen Ginsberg, Jack Kerouac, and William Burroughs, mm-hmm. who we know. Yes. Accused constantly of recreational drug use, Leary only led several psychedelic sessions that resembled a scientific approach to research. One su- such project was the Concord Prison Project, where researchers and prison inmates would take the pills together in an effort to curb res- recidivism rates. The results were illegitimate, though, as Leary and his follow- fellow researchers worked tirelessly to find these inmates' homes and jobs after their release, contaminating results. Mm-hmm. So at this point, the science is gone. The science right. is slipping. All right. right. So here are but, but, four... but Tim Leary also, to be fair, though, Tim Leary, based on what we're saying, is he had decided that the future of psychotherapy was something a little less scientific anyway, was going to be this engagement with the person, right? And living the experience with them. So it's sort of like, yeah, you're cheating on the thing, but but you could still, I mean, what if it's, uh, yeah, anyway, it, it's, there's a little bit of, he's kind of putting his money where his mouth is a little bit, just uh, trying to, I guess, give him his uh, fair shake, I suppose. They got what they ordered, but they got too much of it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I wanted exactly. a dozen. I didn't want a gross. I don't right. want an entire palette of Timmy Leary. Surely yeah. when he gets the, the accoutrement of a Harvard professor and the the idea that he might be a full professor one day, he'll get his act together. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's that he's giving acid to everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, mushrooms at this point. Mushrooms. Soon mushrooms to be sorry. Acid. Yes. Soon yeah. To be acid. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I don't. I think he may have used acid in that Concord prison experiment. In any case, let's yeah. meet Aldous Huxley. Mm-hmm. Um, someone at a faculty cocktail party told me that Aldous Huxley was spending the semester in Cambridge as visiting professor at MIT. I wrote him a long letter describing our research plans. Two days later, he telephoned me at the office, even more excited than I was. He volunteered to participate in our experiments. We set up a lunch for the very next day. Huxley was staying in a new MIT faculty housing complex overlooking the Charles River. I rang the bell and he appeared at the door, towering, frail, friendly. I drove him to the Harvard Faculty Club, talking all the way about my mushroom visions. Through his magnifying glass, he examined the menu as though it were a a scientific specimen. It seems to be preordained that we order the soup, he said. Good. What kind is it? mushroom he burst into, <laughs> into high laughter which i came to recognize as characteristic of him mm. aldous huxley was exactly the person you'd cast as a british philosopher a serene buddha type uh with an encyclopedia encyclopedic mind his elegant uh oxford voice bubbled except in moments of amused indignation when it pitch its pitch rose at the uh, at the arrogance of the power holders who labeled altered states of consciousness as disease. Mm -hmm. I was thrilled by his immediate understanding and approval of the existential transactional design for the research. Hmm. All right. So now he's getting into it. Yep. Uh, Here is Allen Ginsberg. Uh, Then came a hand scrawled letter from Allen Ginsberg. He wrote that he was a longtime student of altered states. He had heard about our experiments from a New York psychiatrist and wondered if he could come up to learn more about our research. I wrote Brack in the affirmative. A few days later, I met Alan at the Boston Railroad Station. With him was his boyfriend, Peter Orlovsky, a tousle-haired, handsome fellow with a mischievous bohemian presence. All right. So let's see here. He comes over to the house. They start talking about it. And they trip. Mm -hmm. Let's read about the trip. That evening, Frank got out the little brown bottle and gave 18 magic mushroom pills to Allen Ginsberg and Peter Orlovsky. Sometime later, I went up to check on the lads. Allen was lying on top of the blanket. His glasses were off and his pupils were completely dilated. His eyes were patiently searching. He was working with the drug, actively, voluntarily, pushing himself into panics and fears and into nausea, trying to learn something, trying to find meaning. Peter lay next to him, sleeping or listening to music. Alan asked me what I thought of him. I leaned over and looked down into the black eyes, fawn's eyes, man's eyes, and told him that he was a great man and that it was good to know him. He reached up his hand. On the way downstairs, I checked Susan's room. She was curled up on the floor with her books scattered around her, reading in the shadows. I scolded her for ruining her eyes and flicked on the wall switch. I went to check on Alan and Peter again after a half an hour. Jack was standing sleepy-eyed and cheerful at the head of the stairs. I wanted to hug him, remembering my father. 
Hmm. There would be further scenes with uh, Ginsburg, which we'll we'll come to. Sure. Uh, yeah. But he now he's having he's a Harvard professor. Poets are coming up from New York City with their boyfriends and yeah. tripping mushrooms at his house. Yeah, it's a slightly the scene's a little different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, here's Neil Cassidy. And who who's Neil Cassidy? Uh, yeah. Brad? So, yeah, Neil Cassidy was um, he's sort of the he was kind of Jack Kerouac's muse. So he features as a character in on the road um, under the name Dean Moriarty Um, for people who've read that, that you're going to know exactly who that is. Um, And a a few other um, Jack Kerouac works. He's also a little bit of a writer himself. He's got one or two books, maybe just one book. Um, And Cassidy was one of these guys. And there's a handful of them who bridged the, the, the beat, the beats to the hippies. So um, you see Neil Cassidy is a character and on the road, but he's also uh, driving the bus of the merry pranksters. So he's sort of, he's one of these guys that bridge both of those scenes and known to be a very charismatic, very handsome, very masculine uh, kind of jock dude, but, but a party animal and um, uh, not a uh, bookish, like perhaps Ginsburg was, but, but um known to be quite intelligent um and sort of adventurous intellectually adventurous i would say yeah he's known as the johnny appleseed of dope uh and <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, that too. yeah this is from leary's autobiography yeah. he's, he's considered to be the inspiration for the beat movement one of the key right. players that, and um, it was that so. energy it's it's it, a lot of that comes from his sort of like energy this like we're gonna go and you know vitalism it, right just, just steal a car if you need a car you just steal a car and you take it and you drive it and wherever we want to go and then you leave it there and then you go do the next thing and he's just like yeah just yeah. start that podcast right. friends <laughs> right. you don't know what'll happen all uh, right. So December 1960. Because of Allen Ginsberg, the existence of our drug research project came to the attention of the Beatnik Network. The first ambassador from Bohemia was a swaggering cowboy of medium height with clothes, cropped hair, and insolent blue eyes. Dressed in jeans, string tie, Texas boots, he had come to find out what those square Harvard professors were up to. Professor Leary, country western voice, what a flash, a smash, a gas to meet you. <laughs> what a long stemmed, long remembered honor. I cannot begin to tell you what a chilling thrill to press your flesh and look into your merry Irish eyes and pinch myself to ascertain I'm not dreaming. After all I've heard about you, you understand from coast to coast across this great land and what you are doing for the cosmological illumination of America. You understand, not to mention the world. So permit <laughs> me to introduce myself. I am Neil Cassidy. <laughs> well, some have called me beatnik. You understand, I prefer to identify as wandering poet, amateur philosopher, autopilot outlaw, sent here by destiny and the advice of good friends to gobble down everything you are learning about these <laughs> wonderful, magical, mystical drugs. <laughs> <laughs> I could do, I could, I could play, uh, do, I, yeah, I don't know if that's yeah. that accent is, I don't care. Oh, that came uh, off pretty good. Yeah. yeah. I like that. So yeah, good. So, you know, he goes on, this goes on for like three pages, but it's like groovy, man. Now let me tell you, I've done the magic mushrooms in Oaxaca, Oaxaca. O- 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 How do you say that? Uh, in Wa- Oaxaca. Oaxaca. Oh God. Yeah. I, I can't edit that. Oh no. God. <laughs> oh. I was too focused on the accent. Please, no, uh, please forgive me. Oaxaca. Uh, yeah. That is a tough one. It is. It, yeah, saying? that's one of those words. It doesn't really, for an American, it doesn't look, it doesn't sound anything like it looks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, in any yeah. case, I'm going to read this because it's good. And I've done peyote with the Navajo in Arizona in a hogan, you understand, with the fire carefully guarded through the long wolf howling desert night. And the, I'm going to start talking like this in real life. And the chanting and the drums and the feathered scepter. But psilocybin is new to me. Can you lay some on me? We don't work that way, I said. We spend considerable time before the drug session training our subjects, alerting them to what they can expect. We found that with adequate preparation, subjects have little trouble and can master the fears involved. Cassidy shook his head dubiously. Why are you making it sound so dangerous, Leary? Mm. The social atmosphere, even in an enlightened place like Harvard, reeks with fear of the strange and the new, particularly when the word drug is involved. Mm -hmm. So we've had to deal with that reality. We've had to build up the aura of safeguards and guidance to counteract the dread. Otherwise, no one would want to experience. At this, my visitor hooted with laughter. Dread? 
not not want the experience man what are you talking about i should yeah. think you'd be driving away candidates with a stick leary the undergraduates are e eager for the experience i said but we've agreed not to use them as subjects unfortunately the older the subject the more fear seems to exist it's my guess they're afraid of losing something that the young haven't gotten themselves attached to here's neil you got to stop this pedantic nonsense. You're defiling <laughs> and corrupting something, you understand, that is beautiful and free and wild and spontaneous. Why? You're running a defloration clinic where people can lose their virginity in a sanitized medical health situation. <laughs> it goes on. <laughs> that's pretty, that's, a, that's actually a pretty great, like, uh, I love this encounter. Because, yeah, I can, I, I, having read deeply in Kerouac lore and actually read Neil Cassidy's book, which I'm, I'm failing to remember the name of it right now. The fact that somebody would say, well, we want to make sure that people aren't afraid. It's like, what do you like? The whole afraid point of is that you're not afraid. Right. That's mm. what we do mm. is like, mm. yeah, it's, that's very interesting. That's a very interesting uh, interaction of very two, two very different subcultures. This is, this is too good not to read. Uh, so, Two things. You do know that the English romantic poetry of the 19th century was almost entirely drug inspired. Shelley, Keats, Robert Louis Stevenson, Coleridge, Byron, this is uh, Cassidy, Byron, mm -hmm. even Charles Darwin dug his inspiration from the opium bottle. Not to mention our own homegrown dopers like Edgar Allan Poe, Samuel Clemens, Jack London. Dope inspired the mainstream of French poetry for the last two centuries. Don't you know that the great minds of the last generation, Freud, Joyce, Gurdjieff, Crowley, got their wisdom from drugs? My God, man. Don't you know that there are hundreds of hip human beings hanging around New York City right now ready to help with your research? That's interesting, I said. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> you, don't, you don't say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> interesting, he shouted. Don't you want to get out of the Ivy Tower and see what's really happening? All right. Yeah. Now he gives him his address. Neil Cassidy, if you were alive, I'd yeah. want you to come on the pod, buddy. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. All right, here we go. The door. To, this is New York uh, that Sunday evening. Uh, the door to Cassidy's apartment was opened by a young woman in tight blue jeans and a tight sweater. I'm Salinas. I've heard of you from Neil and Betty. Betty from Berkeley. She was my roommate at UC last year. She talked about you all the time. She led me into the living room. Where's Neil? Salinas, uh, Salinas motioned to an open door. He's in there bawling Patty Bell. Go in and tell them that you're here. I walked to the bedroom. Two naked bodies were writhing and bumping on a single bed dog fashion. The girl was blonde, her pretty face jerking back and forth in rhythm. She smiled at me and waved her hand. Cassidy was on his knees pumping away. He waved cheerfully. I was embarrassed, transfixed. <laughs> I was 40 years old, and this was the first time I'd ever watched two people copulate. Hello, Timothy, gasped Cassidy, uh, gasped Cassidy breathlessly. Please, uh, please excuse me for a moment. This is... Patty Bell, and if she doesn't get her juicy, streamlined <laughs> chassis overhauled every day, you got to understand, she gets pouty. <laughs> Cassidy closed his eyes to narrate. So I got to grind her sweet, soft valves, lubricate her tubes, fire her spark plugs, you understand, lay down some tire tracks across her rumble seat, oil her transmission, grease her gearbox, you understand, <laughs> tune up her soft little cylinders and jam her throttle to the floor. <laughs> Good God, man. <laughs> uh, you know what? It's funny Woo! as you read this. I'm picturing uh, Tyler Durden. Yeah. From, from Fight Club. Yep. Shirtless. Yep. Just sort of like what? You 100%. Know, all hanging out. Like you yep. want to be like me. Everybody I meet wants to be like me. They just don't want to admit it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. A bit of that. A bit yeah. of that. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna finish this little round robin of this period. I, I hope I'm painting a vignette of what's going on here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, fall 1960, New York City. Allen Ginsberg phoned from New York, eager to begin our campaign for the politics of ecstasy. He had lined up mushroom sessions for Jack Kerouac, Robert Lowell, and Barney Rossett, famed avant-garde publisher. Allen and Peter lived in a terminally dingy apartment on the Lower East Side. I had never seen such domestic repair disrepair but alan's cheery uh abbess bustling made me feel at home jack kerouac sat at the kitchen table drinking red wine and unleashing a non-stop stream of consciousness monologue about the hinge in the middle of alan's penis and about barracuda buddhas etc etc between the word games puns boastful teasing and locker room jokes we fell to discussing sports 
It turned out that, like me, Kerouac had developed a game of baseball solitaire with rosters of imaginary players whose statistics, hits, runs, errors, he recorded. Mm-hmm. So they they bond over uh, imaginary solo baseball. Yeah. So here's a little more of Kerouac. Having spent most of my early life in the chambers of romantic invention, I felt a bond with the introverted drunken novelist. But Brett Jack Kerouac was scary. Behind the dark good looks of a burly lumberjack was a New York, New England mill town sullenness, a Canuck Catholic soggy distrust. This is one unhappy kid, I thought. So what are you up to, Dr. Leary, running around with this communist faggot Ginsburg and your bag of pills? Can your <laughs> drug absolve the mortal and venial sins which our beloved Savior, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, came down and sacrificed his life upon the cross to wash away? He was teasing, and yet he wasn't. Why don't we find out, said Ginsburg quietly. I should have said it quietly. Why don't we find out? I produced the (laughs) bottle, counted the pills, and we all launched off. Here we go. Kerouac continued to drink and rant like a sailor. Don't drink before you do these things. Uh, Rant like a sailor in a port town bar, striding around the room, jumping on chairs, declaiming funny, poetic gibberish. He leaped on the couch. I'm the king of the beatniks. I'm Francois Villon, <laughs> vagabond poet rogue of the open highway. Listen while I play you hotlick. Spiral improvisations from my tenor typewriter. It was charming, witty, and lovable, but when the drug started to expose my tender tissues, the noise became jarring. I longed for the familiar mushroom silence. By this time, I had shared voyages with over a hundred persons. But no one had tried to control, dominate, overwhelm the experience like Kerouac. He was imposing his saloon style on it. And for me, it was simply too much. Mm. I walked into the dark bedroom, probably reminds him of dad a bit, and flopped on the bed. Kerouac continued to shout and guffaw with alcoholic exuberance. I fell into depression. Kerouac had propelled me into my first negative trip. Oh, my God. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's a great little historical anecdote, man. That's Mm -hmm. that's really cool. Huh. Maybe it was the drabness of the slum, so different from our carefully prepared session rooms. He was all about set and setting. Where are you doing it? Who are you with? Um, Perhaps it was jittery New York itself, never a town for serene philosophers. Or was it Kerouac's French Catholic gloom? Anyway, down I went. No kidding around. The world was a dismal, dreary place. Aunt May and Kerouac were right. It was folly trying to change human nature. Who was I to eliminate suffering when now, from my own soul, oozed a pus of despair? Yes, the Catholic nuns were right. This world was a veil of suffering. My life was a fraud. Behind my cheery facade, I was a miserable child, abandoned by my father, breaking my mother's heart, driving my wife to suicide, incapable, incapable of true love and levity. Alone and lonely. My father had never paid much attention to me. I remembered that terrible day when I came home from school and mother told me that dad had wanted to take me to Lake Kangamond uh, Kangamond for the afternoon. Since I wasn't home, he just left without me. I ran down the three flights of stairs to the apartment parking lot. Dad's car was pulling out of the driveway. I ran shouting, dad, wait for me. He didn't hear me. He drove off. Was it possible for him or me to really love anyone? Mother and Aunt May waited year by faithful year for me to break their hearts again. I was always driving off, leaving dear ones in the lurch. Marianne, sweet lost bride, my poor abandoned children, Susan and Jack. I rode to the hospital with Marianne's motionless body. They rolled her into the emergency room. A young doctor, short, black-haired, bent over for a moment. Then he threw the sheet over her face. Mm. Wow. Alan found me curled into a fetal ball on the bed. Oh, no, he explained. This time you're the cosmic worrier. Are you all right? We (laughs) miss you. He was reminding me of his first mushroom trip when he had come safely through a painful moment with my help. It was exactly the right thing to say. I felt better reassured by Alan's loving eyes. (laughs) This is what he says, though, and I was just going to say this myself. Sounds like he got there. He... he, He's working on himself through this stuff. Mm-hmm. This is not party time. Uh, yeah, you don't. That's the thing. Mm. I, I and I think any sort of modern person who's working with this stuff will tell you that you don't get to you don't get to avoid. Your wife committed suicide a few years before. You don't get to not deal with that 
if you're going to use this to try and become a better person or whatever, like you don't get to avoid that stuff. So no, yeah. eventually Leary ingested LSD and instantly became an advocate of the drug, spending the next decade running psychedelic sessions for all he could. However, well in trouble with the law, Leary would repeatedly claim to never have been an LSD advocate, which is a joke. What? Um, <laughs> it's a joke. I'm sure he's just ridiculous. He, I'm sure he was just having a laugh too. Yeah. He wrote in flashbacks, I have never recovered from that ontological confrontation. I have never been able to take myself, my mind, or the social world quite so seriously. Since that time, I have been aware that everything I perceive, everything within me and around me is a creation of my own consciousness and that everyone lives in a neural cocoon of private reality. From that day, I have never lost the sense that I am an actor surrounded by characters, props, and sets for the cosmic drama being written in my brain. That's, you got to be careful about that kind of uh, psychedelic solipsism that can occur. Uh, sure. Yeah. That insight is true. Your brain creates your reality. And yet, right. objectively, other people exist in a latticed, beautiful cosmic constellation of being right right and yeah you can't you, that yeah you, it yeah sure reality is a hallucination but like you can cause suffering like that doesn't mean that there aren't other players on the board right yeah totally and i'm gonna read mm. now from the wikipedia about the harvard psilocybin project mm. uh so the experiment experiments began sometime in 1960 and, in la and lasted until they don't even know when they began and lasted until March 1962, when other professors in the Harvard Center for Research and Personality raised concerns about the legitimacy and safety of the experiments in an internal meeting. Leary and Alpert's experiments were part of their personal discovery and advocacy of psychedelics. As such, their use of psilocybin and other psychedelics ranged from the academically sound and open Concord prison experiment in which inmates were given psilocybin in an effort to reduce recidivism to frequent personal use. The Marsh Chapel experiment, an example of the project's activities, was run by a Harvard Divinity School graduate student under Leary's supervision. Boston area graduate divinity students were administered psilocybin as a part of a study designed to determine if the drug could facilitate the experience of profound religious states, and all of the 10 divinity students reported such experiments. Wild. They they were getting the uh, psilocybin from the Swiss based company Sandos. The first test group was composed of thirty eight people of various backgrounds. Soothing environments were chosen to conduct the experiments. Each subject controlled its own intake dosage, and the lead researchers Leary and Alpert also ingested the substance. This study led to the conclusion that while seventy percent of the seventy five percent of the subjects in general described described their trip to, as pleasant, sixty nine percent were considered to have reached a marked broadening awareness. Um, yeah, so seventy five percent thought it was positive. Sixty nine percent described a mark marked broadening of awareness. That squares with my experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, one more uh, line here. 167 subjects in total participated uh, in the 1960 study. At the end of the study, 95% of the subjects declared that the psilocybin experience had changed their lives for the better. All Wait, right. that last statistic, 95%? 95% had said that the subjects wow. declared. Yep. Hmm. One day we will be free, Brad. One day <laughs> we'll be able to go and buy these pills instead of the, an array yeah. of other junk. Right. That the that the government and that the state. <laughs> I'm just going to pause and fume for a second. They don't want. Yeah. They don't want people to have this stuff. They don't. They no. don't. No. 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 They don't. Not, it, not this should all. be in my. This should be just as easy to get as alcohol uh, or as marijuana. No. Well, yeah. I mean, it's one thing. Okay, so it doesn't seem to be physically harmful for the most most people, right? And we already have this stuff we're allowed to do that's harmful, so there's no precedent there. Um, and then there's just the basic freedom aspect, like if you get to put whatever you want in your body. And then, uh, wait, there's also at least some people think it's beneficial? Like, how are you not... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's they pretty don't. much just hippie talk at this point, but it's like, how is it not legal? It's, it doesn't make makes any, it, it makes it really hard to get up at 830 for that nine o'clock Zoom meeting. Right, 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 right. Is right. what it amounts to or yeah. for to go manage the, the Chipotle. No offense yeah. if you manage the Chipotle, right, but right. maybe you need yeah. to take a week. Yeah. And maybe uh, study Timothy Leary a little bit. All right, moving on. 
Um, despite the mounting controversy over his experiments, Leary managed to renew his contract with Harvard, but shirked his duties. His supply of psychedelics from Sandoz was now limited. Most of the experiments, using the term loosely, were mm. now conducted with psychedelic chemicals like LSD and DMT. Mm. Whoa. Leary was also beginning to alienate his children, who would eventually experiment heavily with drugs and do time in jail. Oh, boy. Ooh. <sighs> kind of hard to be a good father when you're tripping all the time, helping other people trip, hanging out yeah. with the likes of Ginsburg and Kerouac, watching Kerouac bang some gal and then you come home and you've got to be like normal dad doesn't work that way Uh, right yeah by this time leary was was looking south for a place to experiment freely with psychedelics in whoa zihuatanejo mexico in an old hotel oh i think you nailed it yeah uh leary's summer camp would be established as would become his style Leary wore out his welcome in Mexico and was made to leave the hotel along with his patrons and students who had followed him. Now, we're going to get into some government interest in his work. And this is from flashbacks. And we're going to meet a character who's going to um, be a recurring figure here. Kind of a B story for this episode. Mm -hmm. One fall afternoon, I received a phone call from Mary Pinchett. My mist. Oh, I, it's the sixties. I forgot to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, man. <laughs> hey, man. Yeah, yeah I received. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever listened to Art of Darkness on acid <laughs> on <laughs> on weed, man? Yeah. Uh, uh, he re- <laughs> he re- he received a phone call from Mary Pinchett, my mysterious visitor from Washington. Can you meet me right away in room 717, Ritz Hotel? At the door, I paused to smooth my shirt and my trousers and hand brush my hair. Enchanting as before, she motioned to a silver ice bucket with a bottle of Dom Perignon tilting out. I'm here to celebrate, she said. I twisted the bottle to make the cork pop gently. Your hush-hush love affair is going well? So they'd already met. We're picking it up midway. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Everything is going beautifully. On all fronts, in fact. I can't give details, of course, but top people in Washington are turning on. That's what they call dropping Mm -hmm. mushrooms, you know, dropping acid, doing mushrooms. You'd be amazed at the sophistication Mm -hmm. of some of our leaders and their wives. We're getting a little group together, people who are interested in learning how to turn on. Really? I thought politicians were too power-oriented. You must realize, implausible as it may seem, there are a lot of very smart people in Washington, especially now with this administration. Power is important to them, and these drugs do give a certain power. That's what it's all about, freeing the mind. She held out her glass for more Mm -hmm. champagne. Until very recently, control uh, control of American consciousness was simply uh, was a simple matter for the guys in charge. The schools instilled docility. The radio and TV networks poured out conformity. No doubt about it, I agreed. You may not know that dissident organizations in academia are also controlled. The CIA creates the radical journals and student organizations and runs them with deep cover agents. Oh, come on, Mary, I said. That sounds pretty paranoid to me. (laughs) 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 Woo! (laughs) Woo Here we go. (laughs) Mary sipped at her glass and shook her head. I hate to be the one to break the news to you. Do you remember the American Veterans Committee, that liberal GI group you belonged to after the war? The CIA started that. Just like Teddy Roosevelt started the American Legion after the First World War. Remember your liberal friend, Gilbert Harrison, who ran the radicals out of AVC? And later he bought the New Republic? That so-called progressive magazine from Michael Strait, your hero? Do you know why Michael Strait backed Henry Wallace for president in 1948? To, To siphon liberal votes away from Truman? How do you know all this? How do you know I knew Michael Strait? (laughs) (laughs) Well, Well, uh, (laughs) I knocked you with those facts to get your attention. It's a standard intelligence trick. I could tell you hundreds of little stories like that. She held out her glass again. I filled it, drained and refilled my own. My head was spinning. And guess what these guys are most interested in right now? Drugs, I suppose. You got it. A few years ago, they became absolutely obsessed with the notion that the Soviets and the Chinese were persuading our POWs in Korea to defect by brainwashing them with LSD and mescaline. 
Mm, that's certainly possible. What with with what we've discovered about set and setting, we know that almost anyone's mind can be changed in any direction. Any direction? Mm -hmm. With a minimum of information about the subject's personal life and two or three LSD sessions, you could get the most conventional person to do outrageous things. And then she goes, mm -hmm. suppose the person wanted to be brainwashed in a certain direction, wanted to change himself, Leary. Easier yet, our research is conclusive on this. Changing your mind, developing a new reality fix is a simple and straightforward presupposition. Proposition. Of course, altering your mind is one thing. Changing the outside world to conform to your new vision remains diffi a difficult problem for us. I struggled with the word utopiates. Mary clapped her hands together like mm. a birthday girl. Utopiates. <laughs> Beautiful. That's what it's all about, isn't it? Make it a better world. She sat down uh, next yeah. to me and held my hand. Let's make a deal. As one utopiate to another, I'll tell you some things about yourself that are very important, and then you'll tell me the same. What do you want to know? She laughed. Let me start off. Since drug research is of vital importance to the intelligence agencies of this country, you'll be allowed to go on with your experiments as long as you keep it quiet. You are doing exploratory work the CIA tried to do in the 1950s. So they're more than happy to have you do their research for them as long as it doesn't get out of hand. What do you mean out of hand? Timothy Fink, you're involved in the big game here. Mind change is the key to power. They'll deal with you about the same way the Soviets would handle a nuclear physicist with liberal libertarian ideals. They'll indulge your utopian fantasies. They know that creative scientists tend to be free thinkers. They'll run you with a loose silken cord as long as you don't stir up the masses. Okay, I'll try not to stir up the masses. And what can I do for you? <laughs> I told you the first time we met, I want to learn how to brainwash. That doesn't sound very ladylike. At this, she burst into laughter. If I can teach the use of utopias to the wives and mistresses of important people in our government, then we can, well, shit, Timothy, don't you see what we can do? What? We can do on a bigger scale what you are already doing with your students. Use these drugs to free people for peace, not war. We can turn on the cabinet, turn on the Senate, the, su the Supreme Court. Do I have to explain further? And then it goes on. Okay, what do you want from me, the drugs? Just a little bit to get started. With our connections, we'll be able to get all the supplies we want. And all we need, all you need to do, main, uh, mainly... I want advice about how to run sessions and how to handle any problems that come up. We spent the next four hours in a cram mm. course on psychedelic sessions, set and setting, centering. Room service brought more champagne and then dinner. I drove her to Logan to get a night plane back to Washington. The next day, I mailed off a stack of session reports. She, uh, since she had sworn me to secrecy, secrecy, I told no one except Michael Hollings it. <laughs> Woo! Wow. The plot, the plot thickens. Yeah. Tim Leary in the big game, huh? This mm -hmm. is, yeah. You know, I, I always kind of wonder about this thing. And like, I, I know that some of this is this specific interaction and, and some of the details there are new to me, but obviously the the, the overall pattern of it, I'm, I'm sort of familiar with. And there is a part of me that wonders like, well, Okay, so there were people in MK Ultra involved in say MK Ultra trying to learn how to control people's minds, but there may have well been people who were in intelligence who were will well intentioned who thought, hey, maybe we can like make things better by doing this, like legitimately better. And I and yeah. I'm always wary of social control, right? But like it could have been well intentioned for some people. Oh, I'm um, sure that it I think was. at this point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I I think we're at this point Tim Leary is well intentioned. Sorry, mm -hmm. go ahead. No, no, not at all. I've gone on a lot and I will, but it's I've got to yeah, do this. Okay. But, yeah. No, you're right. I I think <laughs> Absolutely. The, I think the thing about uh this is that all that's good and fine and there I I I'm certain there were good well-intentioned people but th this was they were operating in this arena with the same game theory that they were operating under around mutually assured destruction with the Soviets and nuclear war. They believed that the Soviets were pure mm -hmm. evil. So now you've got to imagine, mm -hmm. well, if the Soviets are pure evil and willing to do anything with psychological mm -hmm. experimentation, there was an arms race in that on that side of things. And I think that's how we got MKUltra. 
Yeah, so right, right, right. Yeah, in their minds, if we, it, right. if we don't do it, the Russians will do it. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah that's a, a fixture of this business. So, all right. So now mm -hmm. we're going to talk about this Zawatanaho project briefly. We're in sixty two, sixty three. This was a psychedelic training center and intentional community created during the beginning of the counterculture of the 60s by Leary and Alpert under the umbrella of their nonprofit group, International Federation for Internal Freedom, if if. <laughs> <laughs> Reminds me of Crowley's detective, Simon If, yeah. I -F -F, yeah. if, if, yeah. if then if. So there's mm -hmm. Crowley's already in the mix. Uh, yeah. Leary and Elbert first discovered the town of Zihuatanejo in 1960. After the Marsh Chapel experiment in 62, they decided the area would make uh, a good location for a training center. The idea for the community was influenced by Aldous Huxley's fictional novel, Island. Mm -hmm. Thousands of people applied to the IFIF -IF, uh, in the hopes of joining the project. Out of this pool of applicants, a small select group of people were chosen. Amenities cost $200 a month per person, including food and lodging in, near, in bungalows near a secluded beach. Fishermen supplied a bounty of fresh fish from the bay. During the first training session in 62, Leary and 35 guests rented the Catalina Hotel for a month using their own version of the Tibetan Book of the Dead as a guidebook for LSD sessions. Ralph Metzer and Richard Alpert helped manage the group. Group LSD sessions began in the morning with the consumption of liquid LSD with a dosage of 100 to 500 micrograms ingested by participating individuals. The experience would usually last until late afternoon. Immigration officials were tipped off to the project when the Mexican media began reporting stories about an LSD paradise. In the summer of 1963, after only six weeks, the Mexican authorities shut the community down. They removed the group, sent them to Mexico <laughs> City ab aboard a chartered DC-3. Several failed attempts were made to move the training center to Dominica and Antigua in August of 1963 with the help of wealthy patrons. Leary and their group moved to the Hitchcock Estate in Mi Millbrook, New York. And we're going to get the Millbrook period is coming up here. And this is a really big period that we're going to be talking about. So there was more time in Mexico now uh, doing the uh, LSD. I want to read from flashbacks this very funny uh, fantasy that he had about Marilyn Monroe at this point, uh, because he's turning <laughs> everybody on. Uh, yeah. And I had to go and get clarity because I thought, wait a minute, did he actually give LSD to Marilyn? Turns out, again, I mean, it wouldn't no. be, it, yeah, it wouldn't be that surprising, though, right? If he I had... think, I think spiritually, he's responsible for it. So I think he's writing about that, mm -hmm. but it's a fantasy. So here you go, May nineteen sixty two, Hollywood, mm -hmm. California. The voluptuous intruder upon my sleep slid her hand under the pillow and rumpled my hair. Come on, she whispered. Just let me have a look at you. I sat up, my face six inches from hers. So you're Timothy Leary. And you're Marilyn Monroe, I presume. She held my hand. Listen, you've got to turn me on. I've never let anyone into my brain. Oh, how come? I asked. There are lots of great acid doctors right here at this party. Or ask Cary Grant. I don't want to do it with anyone else, she said. <laughs> I just think it's so funny. He's got this whole two-page thing about giving Marilyn Monroe <laughs> acid. <laughs> he wrote decades later right yeah yeah i think he's yeah. having i think i think he's just doing a thing that's uh yeah i think he's just he's playful he's funny it's quite funny mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah uh, mm -hmm. uh i want to talk about um we need to get back to the woman who we met from washington the sort of spook woman but first mm -hmm. i want to talk about Aldous Huxley's death and LSD. Now, I don't think I'm getting ahead of things because this is a very this is very tied in with Leary, and yeah. we will do a Huxley episode one day. But <clears throat> you're going to know how it ends if you listen to this episode. Yeah. So Huxley, his faith in this experience, the experience of LSD, persisted to the end of his life. It was for him an initiation, a great change in the realm of objective fact. So profound were Huxley's experiments with psychedelic drugs that on his deathbed 10 years later, he requested that his wife, Laura, inject him with 100 micrograms of LSD. In the um, So Laura remembered the, same, the day, the same day John F. Kennedy was assassinated. In the letter above, uh, there's a letter here that I'm reading. Um, so we've got this description. According to Laura, 
Huxley struggled, struggled in his last two months to accept the fact that he was dying of cancer. She read to him, she writes, the entire manual of Dr. Leary extracted from the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Huxley reminded her that Leary used the manual to guide people through their acid trips and that he would bring people who were not dead back here to this life after the session. After several painful days, however, he came to terms all of a sudden and made out his will. Laura had already consulted with Sidney Cohen, a psychiatrist who had been one of the leaders in the use of LSD, and learned that Cohen had given the drug to two dying patients. In one case, it had brought up a, a sort of reconciliation with death, and in the other case, it did not make any difference. After she had offered it to Huxley several times over those two months, he finally wrote out his instructions for his do dosage. She injected it herself, and then a few hours later gave him another 100 micrograms. As he died under the effects of what she called his moksha medicine, Laura coached him toward the light. As the Bardo counsels, willing and consciously, you are going. Willing and consciously, and you are doing this beautifully. You are doing this so beautifully. After several hours... Huxley died. These five mm. people, the ones with him, all said that this was the most serene, the most beautiful death. Both doctors and nurse said they had never seen a person in similar physical condition going off so completely without pain and without struggle. We will never know if all this is only our wishful thinking or if it is real, but certainly all outward signs and the inner feeling gave indication that it was beautiful, a beautiful and peaceful and easy exit. Cool. So very interesting to wow. think about. Yeah. Yeah. Bit of an aside, yeah, but sure. Leary's in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it squares with, I mean, a lot of the, the at least a, de a chunk of the uh, psychedelic research going on now uh, is around this death stuff. Is around, it's like people who have terminal cancer are given doses and taken through a session and, and express that the, as, eased their anxiety around their impending doom significantly right and i mean you know you think about it too there's like some people who define the whole point of sort of faith and philosophy and everything is sort of preparing you for that moment right and if this stuff can help then hey like as the um, boomers age and head toward death they're gonna they're have a they have a tremendous amount of political power and it is nice to see these things being somewhat normalized you would like mm -hmm. to think that this this could be uh something that many years hence right. we could be in hospice and say uh i'd like i'd like the huxley treatment please right. <laughs> yeah as i as i yeah as i sidle out the door on this whole life yeah yeah, yeah absolutely yeah all right so Mary Meyer Pinchett is back. I think it might be Mary Pinchett Meyer, the, the woman from D.C. Mm. He's in uh, Mexico here. A few days before my departure from Mexico. Oh, he's leaving for Mexico. <laughs> a phone call came from Mary Pinchett. I hadn't talked to her in several weeks. Could I meet her again at the Ritz? She sounded tense. She was. When I walked in the room, there was no bubbling champagne, no happy smiles. I had to see you. Things are getting more complicated. I got exposed publicly. The drug experiments, I asked? No. Everything there is going fine. It's my love affair. She walked to the phone. Let's order something. Are you hungry? No, just coffee. Tell me what happened. Oh, God, where to begin? Well, there's this tremendous power struggle going on in Washington. A friend of mine was losing the battle, a really bloody one. He got drunk and told a room full of reporters about me and my boyfriend. Your boyfriend's married, I gather, <laughs> to say the least. Was there much publicity? I didn't read anything about <laughs> a big Washington scandal. No, here's the scary part. Not a word printed about it. That's scary. I said, it's really scary. You wouldn't believe how well connected some of these people are and nobody picked it up. There came a sharp knock at the door. We both jumped, then looked at each other and laughed. After the room service waiter left, Mary came over and hugged me. Don't let me get you alarmed. There's nothing really new in what I've been telling you. I've seen it a hundred times in media politics and the manipulation of news, cover-ups, misinformation, dirty tricks because of the drugs. I can now step back and see what's going on and the horror of it. Now I see that it doesn't have to be that way. America doesn't have to be run by these Cold War guys. They're crazy. They really are. They don't listen. They don't learn. They're completely caught up in planning World War III. They can't enjoy anything except power and control. But that's where you're supposed to come in, I said. You're going to loosen them up. Mary stopped pacing. You're so right. Thank you. you. You restore my hope. I guess that's why I came to see you. Why don't you come to Mexico this summer and get some intensive training? You'll become the best brainwasher since Cleopatra. 
Don't get carried away, she said dryly. I'm too exposed already, (laughs) and you should be careful too. Things are getting edgy in Washington. As we start loosening things up, there's bound to be a reaction. Keep doing what you're doing, but try to keep it low key. If you stir up too many waves, they'll shut you down, she paused for effect, or worse. How can I get in touch with you? I don't trust the phones or the mail, she said. I'll stay in touch with you and do be careful. Pretty heavy, uh, heavy stuff here. Yeah. Um, wow. And we're talking about like wow. winter 62 and 63. Uh, that reminds me, I just wanted to look up when Kennedy became president. Uh, I think it was, yeah, it would have been, what year was that? 61. Uh, yeah, 61. So Kennedy's president. So, yeah, Leary, it really mattered to Leary whether it was a Democrat or a Republican in office. Yeah. Uh, especially sure. going forward when he, and it, this was a period where, like, in the end of the 70s, where it, re- for a dude like him, it was an ex- yeah. existential matter and a matter <laughs> yeah. of his own freedom, yeah. whether the Democrats or the Republicans were in office. Well, I mean, you're talking this 63 time period, LSD is not illegal yet. Or or psilocybin for that man. None of this stuff has been none of this stuff has been made illegal yet. So yeah, I mean, he doesn't necessarily know that they're going to leave. But you have to you have to sense that there's a crackdown coming. I mean, I, I don't I don't know how you wouldn't be sort of aware of that that was looming on the horizon. Well, and more than that, you could lose your standing at Harvard, and they could drive you from public life. I mean, the same old cancel. Mm-hmm. We're going to destroy you uh, for for playing with yeah. fire is right there. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, when was that law yeah. passed? Yeah. What for the that included psilocybin oh, and acid? It was it sixty seven. Mm-hmm. It wasn't Kennedy. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that yeah, sounds I'll, right. I'll look that up. You. All right. Okay. Yeah, yeah I'd be curious. <clears throat> All right. So now we're getting to another major event in his life, and this is the firing from from Harvard. Uh, and we're going to read from flashbacks from 1970. Leary. Now it's 1970. Uh, it's 1970. Right. The sweeping psychedelic Su- fact. Summer of love and everything and, and the civil rights movement. And then they get that. What a, what a lame law. Ridiculous. <laughs> Just absurd. Mm-hmm. All right. So here we go. Uh, let's see. One afternoon and he's in Mexico. This is in May of 63. One afternoon, a jeep raced into the compound driven by the captain of the port. It seemed that I was being called on shortwave radio from Mexico City, urgent. He drove me to his office, and there, crackling with static, came the voice of a Newsweek reporter saying that Richard Alpert and I had been fired from Harvard University. Did I did I have any comments? I said something brash to the effect that I was honored and it couldn't have happened to two nicer guys. The captain, a handsome athletic fellow in a yachtsman cap, drove me back to the hotel. Good news, senior team? He asked me in Spanish. Uh, uh, who is the other person to get fired from Harvard, aside from these two guys? Do you know? He's the only person I don't who cares the... No. Yeah. No, it was no, not Jeffrey, it? Jeffrey Epstein. Epstein never had a, <laughs> never actually had a position. Um, no, it was it was Emerson. They fired Emerson, Emerson from uh, from Harvard. Oh really? I did not mm-hmm. know that. Yep, very interesting. Famously, so they're pretty so, good cup. So they're in good. Pre- yeah, I was gonna say good company. Yeah, good company. Uh, I shrugged and flipped my hand in that Latin non-committal gesture. I changed into trunks and swam out to the motor bo- boat moored in the bay. As I lay in the sun, listening to the waves lap against the hull, I tried to sort out my feelings. My first reaction: my mother would be very upset. <laughs> Second, why had they fired me? He's already showing a little more empathy there. I like that. Uh, why had they fired me when I had already left for good? So he's, he sort of moved on. Professor McClelland was away from the campus, and our old rival, Brendan Mayer, was in charge. Apparently, he meant to discredit us. Remembering the conversations with Inspector O'Connell and Mary Pinchett, I felt a flicker of fear about the security of our Mexican project. A telegram came from Dick the next day confirming the news. He was not coming to Mexico, but would stay in Boston to administer the affairs of IFIF, which were booming. Our firing attracted wide coverage, much of it sympathetic. The media announced that it was the first time in 300 years that Harvard had fired faculty members. They didn't recall that a similar fate had befallen Ralph Waldo Emerson. So they had neglected to mention Emerson. The official reason for my sacking was that I failed to show up for classes, a phony rap. I had completed all my coursework. Dick was ousted for something more romantic. 
he got caught in the middle of a love triangle involving an editor on the Harvard Crimson staff. It seemed that Dick had been turning on a brilliant and handsome student, heir to a famous American fortune, whose friend, racked by jealousy, denounced Dick in a fiery edit editorial. Dick's violation of our promise not to give drug drugs to undergraduates was just thus brought to the attention of the authorities. It's against the rules of the Association of College Professors to fire a faculty member without a hearing. Although civil, civil liberties groups and the association expressed a willingness to file suit against Harvard, we didn't want to waste time on litigation. I didn't want to be a professor anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then he just talk, he goes on to talk about how you know it, it confirms Aunt May's worst expectations of the Leary family, and it hurts his mother. Uh, the Harvard firing and the scandals sure. that followed just couldn't be explained away uh, to her circle of retired Irish Catholic school teachers. So he felt bad about that. During the last decade of her life, when the ladies gathered for tea to gossip about their families, no one ever mentioned the name of her son, the doctor. So that's – he's bummed about that. So – Sure. Yeah. And he's – I mean, yeah. Oh, that is that is a bummer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. At least yeah. you, you can, it, at least I think you can say in that reaction, he's not a sociopath or something. Yeah. So he says that that's the end of his 43 year friendship with his mother, uh, that it really kind of broke her heart and she was hurt because he didn't tell her, uh, himself. So, mm -hmm. but as this is happening, they have their own, and maybe this is a little takeaway for people because I know that the discussion right now on certain quarters of the internet are about parallel institutions and creating your own uh, siloed realities. They already have that in motion. It's like somebody who's already started a new job before they quit their old job. Uh, so, right. Yeah. So you don't care. Yep. Yeah. So here we go. Leary's psychedelic experimentation attracted the attention of three heirs to the Mellon fortune. Sort of Carnegie Mellon, right? The Mellon fortune. Siblings Peggy, uh, Billy, and Tommy Hitchcock. In 1963, they gave Leary and his associates access to a sprawling 64-room mansion on an estate in Millbrook, New York, where they continued their psychedelic sessions. Okay. Patreon.com slash Art of Dark Pod. <laughs> if you are an heir to one of these fortunes that we've been talking about, and you're a fan of the pod, DMs are open. We we That's would right. I would love to have a, a 64 room mansion to conduct experimentation in podcasting. That that's a good <laughs> idea. We can maybe yeah, have I a, like it. I like it. Yeah, mm -hmm. let us know. Yeah, I mean, like, we could set up a tier on the Patreon. That's hmm. mansion. Yeah, mansion right. donation or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We call it, uh, <laughs> but the robber baron tier would be your. You know, right? <laughs> and ten thousand dollars a month, <laughs> a piece. And we just start yeah. adding hosts. <laughs> nice. With all nice. this fine print, every guest we have on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, a nice. good episode title for this is probably Tim Leary and the Big Game. I think that's quite good. Uh, I, do, I do. I do like that. Yeah. Yeah. Kudos, Brad. All right. So. Yeah. Peggy directed the uh, International Federation for. I'm just going to call it if if. Their New York branch and Billy rented the estate mm -hmm. to uh, if if Leary and Alpert set up a communal group with former psilocybin project members at the Hitchcock estate, Millbrook. One of uh, if if's founding board members, Paul Lee, a Harvard theologian who had participated in the chapel experiments, uh, was a member of uh, Leary's circle, said this. There was a big discussion about whether to go underground with it and make it a kind of secret initiation issue or go public. But Leary was an Irish revolutionary. He, he wanted to shout it from the rooftops. So it went that way. It simply became a tsunami. The if if was reconstituted on the Castalia Foundation after the intellectual colony in Hermann Hesse's 1943 novel, Das Glas Perlenspiel. I think it's Das Glas. Yeah, any case, the glass bead game. Are you familiar with the, the glass bead game, Brad? Oh. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a it's a top. That's a that's on my top shelf. I didn't know mm -hmm. that Leary. I didn't know about this name. That's very interesting to me. Yep. 
the Castalia's group journal, uh, the Castalia group's journal was the psychedelic review. The core group at Millbrook wanted to cultivate the divinity with each within each person and regularly joined LSD sessions facilitated by Leary. The Castalia Foundation also hosted non-drug weekend retreats for meditation, yoga, and group set their group therapy. The 60s, <laughs> we've made it. Here we go. And of course, Millbrook is in upstate New York. It's mm. it's near the, it's in the Hudson Valley. It's mm. ground zero for uh, eventually where, uh, you know, uh, Woodstock, that area. You can still feel those vibes out there if you go out. I love that part of the world. I'm yeah, not going to lie. And also weird American spirituality. There's a long history of you know, and not saying that in a disrespectful way. There's a long history of weird American spirituality in upstate New York. So they fit they fit right in there with the spiritualists and all of that. And, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Leary would write, we saw ourselves as anthropologists from the 21st century inhabiting a time module set somewhere in the dark ages of the 1960s. On this space colony, we were attempting to create a new paganism and a new dedication to life as art. Lucy Sante of the New York Times later described Mil the Millbrook estate as the headquarters of Leary and gang for the better part of five years, a period filled with endless parties, epiphanies and breakdowns, emotional dramas of all sizes, and numerous raids and arrests, many of them on flimsy charges concocted by the local assistant DA, G. Gordon Liddy, who would go on to have a rather oh, yeah. uh, robust career. And he, he made his name uh, messing with Leary and company. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. So meanwhile, they, you know, they, they're fired. Uh, they travel to Mexico. This is all we've covered this. Now there's a period where, so they're at Millbrook and they're attracting lots of guests. Charles Mingus comes, Ken Kesey and the pranksters come. And I'm going to talk about that shortly. On December 12th of 64, Leary and fashion model, Nina von Schulebrugge. See, I, I no, I got it wrong. Nice. Sh, um, the, my mic was covering it. Schlebrugge um, were married at the estate and soon divorced in 1965. <laughs> Schlebrugge. Okay, so here's the thing. Here's the thing. Acid, <laughs> LSD, mushrooms, psychedelics, they are famous. And this is one of the things that Leary talks about. They do allow you to make new childlike imprints as an adult. You trip acid. If you want to be a painter, wake up the next day, come up, go to a painting class. Right, right. Read a book on painting. Paint. Mm -hmm. You want to be a writer. This is well known to anybody who does this. Uh, it doesn't always work that way. There's no guarantee, but you're allowed to re-imprint. It seems to me that Leary lacked some of these strong emotional bonds when he was a child. Maybe a chilly mother. Mm -hmm. a very pious, devout mother, an alcoholic father. So I think what happened to Leary is that, after, and then of course his wife, his first wife commits suicide. That's, there's a, it's a it's an attachment problem there. Um, yeah. I think Leary became attachment crazy a bit. And that makes sense. Was, he's yeah, married. That makes okay. Sense. Uh, trip acid. Wait, why don't we get married again? A little similar to Crowley. We just said, mm -hmm. let's get married. So uh, in any case, this woman uh, von Schlebrugge uh, is Uma Thurman's mother. <laughs> what? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yep. yep. There are Not... only 50,000 people <laughs> on Earth at any at given, given time. time. <laughs> this is a huge simulation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What, once we, this month we got nearly yeah. 10,000 streams in November. Once that gets to yeah. 50,000, mm -hmm. it's we've reached every single living person mm -hmm. on the planet. It, it doesn't even matter that it's only in English. <laughs> the, there really is only. Yeah, That's you're right. right. That is one of the theories yeah. of this show is that. Yeah. But how strange is that? Yeah. Well, so here we go. Uh, the Millbrook estate would also attract attention from government officials and lead to numerous arrests and raids. Uh, and of course, G. Gordon Liddy was involved and he was incriminated in the Watergate scandal later. Uh, he, he'd be a fun one, even though he's not really like, he's not really a, an art of darkness subject. Liddy. No, this is Tim, no. Tim Leary is, is kind of a stretch just in terms of art. But yeah, Liddy is fascinating, but not quite. I don't think we could really do him, but well, and here here comes Ken Kesey. And 
Brad, do you care to introduce who do you think Ken Kesey is here? Yeah, I, I can talk about Ken Kesey a little bit. I mean, he's a pretty interesting figure. Um Known primarily for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, um, also wrote a, a, a very, very good book, um, Sometimes a Great Notion. Those are really his two major publications. Um, he's a sort of an interesting figure because he's a very he's a he comes from sort of like lower working class uh, Oregon, Pacific right? North, yeah, Oregon yeah. Pacific Northwesterners, and he sort of inveigles him way, his way into academia through wrestling. So he's this big, you know, he's like a big burly man's man um, who ends up finding his way to Stanford and into the Stegner program, I believe. I think he might have even studied under Wallace Stegner, um, and and you know gets is a is a is a very talented writer, um, and then sort of he ends up the same uh facility that inspired one flew over the cuckoo's nest he worked at that facility um like on as as you know he was i don't know if he'd be a nurse or like an order he might have been like an orderly or something and he worked with um gordon lish just coincidentally who went on to have his own own writing and editing career um at that same facility ken kesey was subjected to mk ultra experiments with lsd and became a huge LSD advocate. And so while um, Timmy, Timmy Leary is doing this stuff on the East Coast, um, Ken Kesey's launching a different sort of effort on the West Coast to get LSD out there in the population. He's responsible for starting kicking off the Merry Pranksters um, and, and various acid tests. Ken Kesey is instrumental in pulling these things off, pulling, you know, the the light, the set designers and the light show guy and Neil Cassidy and Owsley Stanley getting all of these kind of players on, on, the, on the board to make these acid tests happen. Um, so that's hundred percent. Yeah, right. And the Merry Pranksters took a bus uh, from the the West Coast all the way out east. This happened in 1964. Everything you said mm -hmm. about Keezy squares with what I mm -hmm. what I learned. Um, yeah, and, and that this. trip. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that trip was literally. I think they were going to like Ken Key. Sometimes a great notions the the book release party or something. Mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he's he's right in all all of this. Hundred percent. All right. So. The, the pranksters famously visited Leary at Millbrook. And you got to imagine like in Millbrook, they're doing like Buddhist prayer. They're listening to Joan Baez. They're doing trip reports. It's all very high minded, uh, hippie flavored, but very intellectual. And here come the pranksters in the psychedelic bus who are doing mixed media sh shows, parties, filming everything. The pranksters were crushed by Timothy Leary's mm -hmm. lack of interest in them and their experiences when they arrived. They viewed the two groups as halves of the same whole, but Leary's friends viewed the pranksters as uncouth, shabby acid heads who couldn't possibly contribute to the world's understanding of LSD. This was a huge blow to Ken Kesey's contingent, who had spent the past few weeks accepting everyone and everything. At the time, Kesey was preaching non-judgment non and universal access to LSD, while Leary still believed it should be reserved for academics and the upper-class elite. I don't know how true all of that is. Within three years, Leary would change his position to resemble Kesey's, rocketing him to worldwide rec recognition while Kesey was on the run in Mexico. So there's a ton that we could talk about uh, with the pranksters. In the interest of time, I'm just going to move forward. Tom Wolfe wrote The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test. If you want to read about this, this mm -hmm. go read that. Um, the notoriety of DMT as a perilously mad trip was amplified in The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test as author Tom Wolfe related an episode where troubled prankster Sandy Lehman Haupt, a.k.a. Dismount, was administered DMT by a main guru during the prankster's drive through visitation at Leary's expansive new digs in Millbrook, New York. It was the summer of 1964, and Ken Kesey and his band of merry pranksters, having been set alight by LSD, liberated from a federally funded research program at the VA hospital in Menlo Park, and having sailed across the U.S. in their re-envisioned school bus further, docked at the big house. They parked that is, in the shadow of a mansion on the 2,500-acre estate. Thanks to Peggy, Peggy Hitchcock and her brothers, Leary and followers had called the forested Wonderland home in 1963. The ultimate setting for the psychedelic experience, Millbrook was the center for the diverse activities of the Castalia Foundation. All right. So let's see here. Uh, I want to get into this. So, da-da-da-da-da. 
Yeah. So in that in that book, they describe her psychedelic her DMT trip, and she had some trouble. Here we go. Here's a little bit of um, Crowley. So hang on here. Um, I don't know if I have a, a recount of the DMT trip. Here we go. Sandy had a mad sense of the world torn apart into stained glass shards behind his eyelids. No matter what he did, eyes open, eyes shut, the world erupted into electric splinters. And the main guru said, I wish to enter your metaphysical soul. But to Sandy, paranoia, he seemed like a randy painted Lulu bent on recto goth. Sig Gassigial Shoals, a randy boy enjoyer. Well, the world exploded and there was no antidote antidote for this rocketing, 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 rocketing. <laughs> so you do, you know, DMT and Timothy Leary saying, I want to enter. Oh my yourself. god. Ay, ay, ay. Bad trip. Not good. Uh, they probably didn't know how to handle DMT. Um oh boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, that's a whole different, that's a whole different thing than LSD. Yeah. Yes. And, and a different vibe. The pranksters have their own their own crazy vibe, and Leary and his company uh, have a different mm. vibe. That's probably more hierarchical, probably more influenced by the old way. They're trying to break it down, but the pranksters are coming from the West Coast, and it's already broken down. It's already busted. They've already taken a bus across the country. They aren't ensconced with old money in upstate right. New York. Yeah, that's that's I mean, their method of giving LSD to a bunch of people. Timothy Leary is like, well, we should do this and this and then this and then this it, the very pranksters were like let's just have a bunch of people show up and we'll just throw a bunch of uh acid in that vat of kool-aid and we'll just see what happens you know it's a i very, will very very i will confess approach. that i have a very strong bias for the leary side here i really do i find that other that other same here same here yeah. kind of degrading for all involved um but in any case, widely circulating yeah. accounts of the East versus West Coast Congress uh, portray a cool parlay between alien tribes, a countercultural myth originating in Wolf's story. It's true Kesey and Leary pursued unique pathways into the coming con crescents of psychedelia. Juxtaposed to the scientific research community of the mind that Leary and his colleagues were pioneering, the prankster's approach was protean punk. Kesey's position, Kesey's position via V. Leary is well stated by Lee and Schlein. We did... Um, how to say this? We did to, to, we did acid and didn't require picturesque countryside or a fancy apartment with objects of art to groove on and box sweet and B minor playing on the stereo. A psychedelic experience on the bus needed no preconceived spiritual overtones. It could be experienced in the context of a family scene, a musical jam, or a plain old party. And for a mutant guinea pig like Kesey, who had escaped the laboratory, any medically sanitized or controlled psychedelic ex experience was abhorrent. So they, that does make sense. Um, let's see. By the time Kesey met Leary at Millbrook, Leary's scene had become unhitched from its academic moorings and was mutating on a day-to-day -day basis. Millbrook displayed the symptoms of a kaleidoscopic cultural movement in, for, in formation. That place changed every, every 72, uh, 72 hours, Leary had once said. <laughs> You'd be there one weekend and we would be doing, it's like the pod. And we would be doing yeah, Tai yeah, Chi, yeah. and the next weekend we would be following following Alistair Crowley. All right, I had to get around to Crowley, so yeah, for sure they for were sure. in it. Okay, so you've got a sense of what's going on at Millbrook, the kind of vibe that a vibe that it is. The Merry Pranksters show up and they're they're partying. I don't know how many days they stayed, um, but it was a, an iffy thing. It, it's probably a little overblown that it was like this kind of East versus West battle. Uh, it wasn't really mm -hmm. quite that that much, uh, you know, of that. But there were differences, uh, yeah. which are reasonable when you when you think mm -hmm. about it. There was Lunacy Hill <laughs> um, it, uh, it, in Millbrook. There was Ecstasy Hill. So we've got yeah. a an early hippie head compound out here. Um, backed by yeah, Big they're Man. trying to do a burn. They're trying to do a Burning Man situation mm -hmm. or burning man is trying to do their situation sort of yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah what happened is that leary wouldn't wouldn't come out of his room for the first i think 72 hours or the first day or two and that kind of offended them because they had come all the way across the country but i think leary was in the middle of the trip but what happened is he eventually came out of hiding he and kesey and another one of the pr pranksters injected dmt together and formed long-lasting friendships uh so there you go okay uh problems so, problem solved just 
There you go. All right. So now we've got in 1965, and I'm going back to the biography, Timothy Leary, our CIA, our woman, I don't know if she's CIA or not, but this this gal returns. Uh, let's see. I think she's a fascinating figure. Ooh, do I no, have absolutely. the wrong? This stuff mm-hmm. about her is great. Yeah. Yeah. I have, I think maybe it's in his book. Let me, let me grab it. Would you go and hang out for a weekend at Millbrook bed? I would, uh, I, 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 not like enthusiastically like charging towards it. I'd be a little afraid, but I would do it just, I mean, yeah. What do you get it? Especially imagining that you're the pr- appropriate age, like you're whatever, 20 something at that time. It seems like you got to, get a sense of what's going on there i mean if you have oh i mean it, oh it just sounds incredible doesn't it yeah all right so we've got this woman she's back okay meyer seemed to know a good deal about the cia's use of mind expanding drugs all right tim leary would write about three more meetings with mary pinchett meyer over the next two years in 65 tim discovered to his great horror that she had been murdered on october 12th Crowley Miss, 1964, as she walked along the canal path, towpath in Georgetown. Her body was identified by her brother-in-law, Ben Bradley, executive editor of the Washington Post. Tim also learned for the first time that Meyer was married to CIA Division T- Chief Cord Meyer. Tim's nemesis at the American Veterans Committee during his graduate student days at Berkeley. When it was revealed that Mary Pinchett Meyer had been one of John F. Kennedy's mistresses, Tim immediately suspected she had been killed for giving LSD to the president and then recording this information in her diary, which was never found. Well, Tim did have contact Whoa. with Mary Pinchett. <laughs> uh, did have contact with her during this period and probably did supply her with psychedelics, which she may well have taken with someone in power in Washington. There's no evidence the man was JFK. But then a good deal of what Tim reported as fact in flashbacks is pure fantasy, most notably a sexual liaison with Marilyn Monroe during this period in L.A., which never occurred. Mm. Did did Tim get his friend from Washington killed because she was having an affair with JFK and gave him acid? Maybe. Maybe. (laughs) Maybe. Hmm. Wow. Wow. That's... yeah 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 okay we'll just keep put a pin in that and just yep. know that that could have happened just yeah. put that aside and and uh you know we're gonna blast on through we are we are making steady progress we are into hour four this is gonna be another long one i could not help myself i just i went really hard and hopefully no you're no finding it there's a lot to talk about mm-hmm. all right so in 1966 millbrook is raided and Liddy comes in uh, with, I think, 26 local sheriffs. It's a night operation. Liddy said, we hope to find not only a central supply of LSD belonging to Leary, but also his guests' personal supplies of marijuana and hashish. It was necessary to strike, which at the time was illegal. So they had to find that stuff because I think, like you say, the LSD would not have been illegal. Uh <sighs> So they had to catch him by surprise and it did not go as Liddy planned. Uh, they stayed up later. They were showing a movie that night. And so the, <laughs> the deputies assume assumed that the movies were pornographic and there was some competition for the assignment to move into binocular range to obtain further information. But presently, <laughs> the lucky man <laughs> returned to report in a tone of complete disgust. It ain't no dirty movie. You'll never guess what them hippies are watching. A waterfall. <laughs> 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 There's a bunch of stoners <laughs> watching a waterfall. Like the, we gotta. The get, film yeah. did not finish until nearly one a.m. <laughs> All right, so good. Uh, so Liddy and these and these sheriffs, uh, they raid the house, and uh, it's there's a, it's like a no knock raid, and uh, so there you go. It didn't really lead to much, although it did establish uh, Liddy as a, it gave him a reputation for being hard on drugs. All right. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Liddy, not Leary. All right. So now we're into 1965 and legal troubles. Leary's first run-in with the law came on December 23rd, 1965. This is, it really isn't his first run-in with the law, but like this, I think this is where he first really properly gets arrested when he was arrested for marijuana possession. And this was in uh, customs, I think. Leary took his two children, Jack and Susan, and his girlfriend, Rosemary Woodruff, to Mexico uh, for an extended stay to write a book. I want to get this right here about Rosemary. Yeah. They would eventually be married. Um, I think one of the one so that of would the be women, that would be wife number four, right? Uh, correct, correct. Yeah. So okay. In any case, uh, on their return from Mexico to the U.S., a customs service official found marijuana in Susan's underwear. They had crossed into Nuevo Laredo, Mexico, in the late afternoon, and, and discovered that they would have to wait until morning for the appropriate visa for an extended stay. They decided to cross back into Texas to spend the night and were on the U.S.-Mexico bridge when Rosemary remembered that she had a small amount of marijuana in her possession. It was impossible to throw it out on the bridge, so Susan put it in her underwear. Ah, uh, after taking responsibility for the controlled substance, Leary was convicted of possession under the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937 on March 11th of 66, sentenced to 30 years in prison fined $30,000 and ordered uh, to undergo psychiatric treatment. He appealed the case on the basis that the Marijuana Tax Act was unconstitutional as it required a degree of self-incrimination in blatant violation of the Fifth Amendment. It's Hmm. around this time we're going to get into him um, now becoming a mega guru, right? So here it Mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. This is the period where he popularizes his phrase, which is. Tune in. uh, Uh, It's that turn turn on on and tune in, drop out, turn on. I always forget (laughs) Ah, it too. It's no, it's not your fault. I get it mixed up. Turn. I do too. Turn on, tune in, drop Mm -hmm. out, drop. All right. Yes. So the the history of the the phrase is very interesting. In a 1988 interview with Neil Strauss, Leary said the slogan was given to him by Marshall McLuhan during a lunch in New York City. Leary added McLuhan was very much in Marshall McLuhan, the great media theory, theorist, the, the fellow who invented the, the phrase, the medium is the message. Um, also a Catholic, uh, Canadian. McLuhan was very much interested in ideas and marketing, and he started singing something like psychedelics hit the spot, 500 micrograms, that's a lot, to the tune of a Pepsi commercial at the time. Then he started going, tune in, turn on, and drop out. The phrase was used by Leary in a speech he delivered at the opening of a press conference in New York City in September or on September 19th of 1966. It urged people to embrace cultural changes through the use of psychedelics by detaching from the existing conventions and hierarchies uh, in society. It was also the motto of his League for Spiritual Discovery. In his speech, Leary said, like every great religion, we seek to find the divinity within and to express this revelation in a life of glorification and the worship of God. These ancient goals we define in the metaphor of the present. Turn on, tune in, drop out. And then he would go on and make that wildly popular at an event, I believe, called the Be-In, which we'll get to. Uh, Yeah, the Human Be-In a few years later. Um, Now, he's reached a level of fame where a band like the Moody Blues was starting to reach a level of fame where the band like the Moody uh, yeah. the Moody Blues make a song about him. It's called Legend right, of a Mind. Right, right. Yeah, and it's it it came out in uh, 68 and uh, the lyrics are he'll f- uh, so it's here's he'll fly his astral plane, haha, takes you trips around the bay, brings you back the same day. He'll take you up, he'll bring you down, he'll plant your f- feet back firmly on the ground. He flies so high, he swoops so low, he knows exactly which way he's going to go. Timothy Leary. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very very interesting. It's a very yeah. here here are the uh here are the instruments. Huh. Lead lead vocals, flute, six and 12 string acoustic guitars, electric guitars, backing vocals, bass, backing vocals, mellotron, piano, backing vocals, drums, percussion, tabla. 
<laughs> it's so a funny. Lot, a tabla. A lot, yeah, yeah. A lot yeah. going on. For There's sure. a lot wow. going on. I, I, I strongly <laughs> encourage you after this episode, put on Legend of a Mind and uh, trip out a little bit with the Moody Blues. All right. Yeah, I've never heard that song before. Oh, it's it's yeah. really fun. Yeah, let's uh, yeah. Uh, let's listen to it ourselves after we're done on the uh, on the After Dark. <laughs> Oh, actually, you know what? You know what we'll do between the core episode here, the main episode, and the after dark. Let's both listen to uh, "Legend of a Mind," and we'll be able to talk about it a little bit on on the after dark for Patreon subscribers. Like patreoncom slash Art of Dark Pot. All right, we're gonna start blasting through the bio a little more because this is a lot. Hmm. Uh, in December of '68, Leary was ag- arrested again in Laguna Beach, California. This time for the possession of two marijuana roaches. He claimed that these were planted on him. But he was convicted. Uh, in May, the Supreme Court of 69, the Supreme Court concurred with Leary in Leary versus the United States and declared that the marijuana tax was un- unconstitutional and overturned his 65 conviction. So he was just getting arrested all the time now. Like he just Leary's around, we're gonna get him, we're gonna arrest right. him. Uh on right, that right. same day, Leary announced his candidacy for governor of California against the Republican incumbent Ronald Reagan. <laughs> His can- <laughs> campaign slogan was come together, join the party. Mm. That's where mm. come together comes from. On yeah. And if you look at the lyrics of come together, it's obviously about Timothy Leary. Is that is yeah, that not clear? He's one spinal cracker. Yeah. You crack your spine, you know, because you've taken so much acid, you can just crack your spine and like. Right, like, right. Microdose. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, on June 1st of 69, Leary joined Lennon and Yoko Ono in their Montreal bed-in. Uh, and he, this is where John wrote the campaign song, uh, come together. And we'll, we'll talk more about that on the, uh, on the after dark. Um, uh, Leary was also, um, uh, in that, uh, that song, all we are saying, give peace a chance. He, his name is mm-hmm. mentioned in that he's there mm-hmm. hanging out. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that they mentioned Rosemary in that song, which is, would be Leary's wife. I think they're married now at this point. Uh, let me make mm-hmm. sure what year did they get married? I want to get it right. Good old, good old Timmy Leary. Uh, the, the the five wife. <laughs> that, that's a lot. Uh, yeah, they got married Jeez. in 60, 67. This one. That's, sticks. A bing, that's a bing, that's a bingo square. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. M- many wives, yeah. many partners. Uh, okay. All right. So mm-hmm. here we go. In 1970 now. So, oh, no. The party's over. Uh the greatest decade in the history of, of mankind has come to an end. And here comes the, the great come down. Here comes Pink mm. Floyd. Here comes Zeppelin. Here come, comes Black Sabbath. Great music. Just um, probably more yeah, cocaine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, in 1970, right. cocaine, Leary, mm. a little bit of a bummer. Yeah. yeah, yeah, bit of a bummer. Leary received a 10-year sentence for his 1968 offense, with a further 10 added later while in custody for a prior arrest in 65 for a total of 20 years to be served consecutively for marijuana. On his arrival in prison, Jeez. he was given psychological tests used to assign inmates to appropriate work details. Having designed some of these tests himself, including the Leary Interpersonal Behavior Inventory, Leary answered them in such a way that he seemed to be a very conforming, conventional person with a great interest in forestry and gardening. As a result, he was assigned to work as a gardener in a lower security prison. (laughs) (laughs) That is a hack. That is a life hack. Design yeah. the yeah. the mental uh, test, the psychology test that you're going to have to take in prison so you get the best position. That is wild. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, so here we go. We've got uh, the Beatles and Come Together. Uh, okay. I just got to get my... This is what I meant about it possibly getting a little uh, out of order. Just hang tight while I find what I need here. So he he had done the that be in already, obviously, uh, which was the human be in, which was a yeah. huge event, uh, and I believe in California, uh, and that's where yeah, that was in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sorry, that was in San Francisco. That was the sort of uh, uh, almost like the apex of hip- hippie culture. I mean, anybody who is a name 
in Bay Area, the quote unquote Bay Area Renaissance is definitely involved with that. 100%. Coming to the end of part two here, and uh, he had his bail revoked. The judge held up his book, held up one of Leary's oh my God. books about psych- psychedelic country uh, culture, and basically said, I'm happy to send you away for for 20 years. You're done. Uh, and this is around the time Tricky Dick called yeah. him the most dangerous man in America. And that is the end of part two. Going into part three. I'm going to take another 60 second break. Yeah. Part three is flash forward. Flash forward. So his book is called Flashbacks. This is called Flash Forward. And that's going to take us from 1970 until the end. Brad, can you okay. can you maybe tell people a few of the episodes we have coming up in, in season uh, three here? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we'll talk, I'll talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so I guess first we've got a couple still left in season two that we are developing. We're hard at work developing. Um, those are uh, Emil Choran who I'm not going to say anything about because Kevin, I don't want to give anything away to Kevin, but if you're a Choron, if you're interested in Choron, that's going to be a great episode with the author Caleb Caudell. Um, then we are going to be doing an episode on Norm MacDonald, the great uh, Canadian comic Norm MacDonald, gone far too soon with um, uh, Blake Hammond, fantastic comedian who joined us for the Bill Hicks episode for folks who've been following along for the last year or so. Um, and then we're doing a, uh, a episode on Gilda Radner, um, with a special guest that I think we'll reveal maybe a little bit later. Now, as we get into season three, bookends, the reading clubs coming up, we're also going to be doing, uh, uh, and these aren't in any specific order, but just some of the highlights. We're going to be talking about Joseph Conrad, the uh, the author of Heart, Heart of Darkness. And if you're a Patreon supporter, you'll be hopefully reading along uh, Heart of Darkness with us. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, Victor Gruen, who is a uh, the man who invented excuse me, the man who invented the shopping mall. We're going to be talking about Ernest Hemingway. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, who else we got going on. We're going to be talking about uh, Mish- Mishima later on in the year. We're going to be talking about uh, Nina Simone at some point, which is a very one I'm very interested in. We're going to talk about Marilyn Monroe. We're trying to okay. get, uh, we're trying to increase the number of ladies that are yes. well covering for sure. Yes, yeah. that was fantastic, Brad. So now you're getting a taste yeah. of what's coming next year. Go Watch the trailer at artofdarkpod.com. That was yes. not comprehensive, but thank you, Brad. That all. gave me enough time to, to get a little break. Flashing forward now, we are here in the 70s. He's been arrested. I'm going to get into the uh, the Timothy Leary biography book again. This is part three, and uh, I'm going to take us home. <laughs> We're going to land. We're going around the bay and back again. <laughs> The same day. I don't think we're going to go past midnight. We're not going to turn turn into pumpkins here. Uh, Leary was in prison. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Leary was in prison. And you know who the weathermen were, Brad? In the the 1960s I do know who the weathermen were. Um, yeah, I do know so, something about the weathermen. I, I, I'm not an expert by any means, but they were a uh, an activist group who were sort of against Vietnam and generally all of the, the, the sort of hippie politics who started bombing things. They did a bit more, and there was a group called the Brotherhood of Eternal yeah. Love uh, that was an organization of drug users and distributors from the mid sixties through to the late seventies in orange County, they were dubbed the hippie mafia by the police. They paid $25,000 to the weathermen to help smuggle Timmy Leary out of prison. And this is what happened. Oh, Leary gave an interview in, in prison. You can go find this online. It's quite humorous to watch. Uh, He, he said that, being in prison was the best thing for his writing that had ever happened. <laughs> a lot of good books have been written in, in prison. Uh, so here we go. That makes sense. It, yeah. Inside prison, Tim continued doing his homework. One of his jailhouse buddies told him that the best time to escape was on a foggy Saturday night at around 830 when everyone would be watching a movie or in uh, the TV rooms. If no one saw him, Tim would have at least an hour and a half to make his way to freedom. 
If he was seen, prison authorities could get cars on the road in 10 minutes, but they would not be able to stop him from reaching it. Down by the visiting room in cell block 324, a cable between telephone poles was strung high above the wire fence crossing the perimeter road. Because the cable hung above the lights, it could not be seen at night. To escape, Tim would have to climb the pole, grab the cable, and pull himself over the fence. Tim later maintained he had discussed the plan with Rosemary. Her memory was different. The only shaky memory, Timmy Leary. The only person who knew how he mm -hmm. got out of the prison was Tim and the man who gave him the plan. Based on the shape he was in and the wire, he could have done it. He was a wiry, sinewy, racquetball-playing, handball-playing man. He could have done it, but it was also a full moon. I remember sending him a telegram saying, do eagles fly in the full moon? I was terrified. On September 9th, uh, nine, day 204 of his captivity, Tim was informed that he would be returned to Poughkeepsie in handcuffs to stand trial in Dutchess County on September 15th. This is where Millbrook was. He was asked, asked whether uh, he wanted to move to a two-man cell, which was closer to the handball court in cell block 324. On Thursday, Tim changed into shorts and started doing yoga on the lawn six feet away from the pole. Standing on his head, he stared at the cable through half-open eyes until a guard came up and told him it was against the rules to exercise within sight of the outside gate. On Saturday, Tim rehearsed in his mind what he would do that night. He took the white laces out of his black sneakers and replaced them with brown ones. Then he covered the white strip on the sneakers with black paint. He blackened his handball gloves. Behind him in the prison locker, Tim left a typed farewell letter, which read in part, in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost, Ave Maria, prison guards, listen to Cage, a living creature is, a sin against God. Listen, guards, to the ancient truth, he who enslaves is himself enslaved. The future belongs to the blacks and the browns and the young and the wild and the free. When the 830 whistle sounded, certifying that all hmm. prisoners were where they should be at that hour, Tim put on his black sneakers and a dark blue denim jacket. Into a pocket, he shoved his eyeglasses, Rosemary's letters, his prison IDs, the me and meditation beads. Moving silently across the brightly lit yard just before nine, Tim climbed a tree, dropped onto a corridor roof, stripped off his sneakers and socks, and padded silently to the roof of building 324. He put his socks and sneakers back on and slipped on the handball gloves, slipped on the handball gloves. He grabbed the cable with both hands, hooked his ankles over it, and began to pull himself along. Every 10 inches, the cable had wire looped below it, holding a telephone cord. So there were no long, easy stretches. He pulled 10 inches and then another 10 inches, a process made even more arduous because the cable bounced and swung. After 50 pulls, Tim was completely exhausted, gasping for breath, his arms and body weak, he realized he could not go another foot. Still only a third of the way across the wire, he hugged the cable with his elbows and knees and tried to rest. Down below, an interior light went on inside one of the gun trucks. Thinking he had been discovered, Tim managed to shimmy another five feet. He wished he had quit smoking. Desperately hooking his elbows over the cable, he pulled himself along like a crab until he had to rest again. Below, he could see into the rooms where prisoners were, were watching TV. Suddenly, lights glared. Forty feet away, a patrol car had turned off the compound road and was heading straight for him. It came closer and closer until Tim could look down and see the guard crush his cigarette out in the ashtray. Then the patrol car rolled past him. Tim's only thought now was to make it over the fence so that when he fell to the ground, he would be outside the perimeter. Wanting to be Errol Flynn, he felt instead like Harold Lloyd. Then a sudden uh, energy flowed from some inner reservoir. He started moving again in a steady rhythmic pace. When he reached the far pole, Tim lost his glasses. He wrapped his legs around the splintery wood, slid all the way down, and found his glasses. Under a full moon, he scrambled down a hill and across a field to the railroad tracks that ran parallel to Highway 1. Seeing car lights, he drove, dove down on the tracks until they had passed. He then made his way to a ravine bordering the tracks, hid in the tall grass, and watched for a car with its right blinker flashing the signal. No more than five feet from the road, he waited in shadows for what seemed like hours as cars rolled by. Finally, he spied one with its right blinker flashing. A girl with long, dark hair got out as he approached. She asked if he was Tino. When Tim said he was, she identif identified herself as Kelly, like Brad Kelly. After they embraced, she told Tim uh, they, there was another girl with blonde hair behind the wheel, had already driven by twice and had been about to go looking for him along the tracks. She helped him inside the car. In the back seat, 
Tim stripped off his prison denim so that they could be transferred to a second car. To make the police think he was heading south, Tim's prison clothes would be dumped in a gas station restroom somewhere near L.A. The girls drove him north toward Morro Bay, where a camper was waiting. He escaped. <laughs> yeah, I wow, love. man. Serious this is business. Our first, this is our first prison escape, I think. Yes, I believe it is. Yeah. And yeah. it's so funny because the reason he was able to escape is because he took his own test. He knew how to hack these tests. So who says college doesn't pay? You might be able to... <laughs> You might be able to sneak yourself out with the help of the Brotherhood of Eternal Love and the Weatherman. Right. All right. So wow. we're gonna we're gonna move on in the interest of time. But so the truck met Leary after he had escaped from prison. The Weatherman then helped both Leary and Rosemary out of the United States and eventually into Algeria. He uh, sought the patronage of Eldridge Cleaver for ten thousand dollars and the remnants of, mm-hmm. of the Black Panther Party's government in exile in Algeria. But after a short stay with them, said that Cleaver had attempted to hold him and his wife hostage. Cleary had put Leary and his wife under house arrest due to exasperation with their socialite lifestyles. So he he morphed himself into a businessman. Like he he uh, he shaved. I think he shaved his hair, changed his look, and he he put he had a, a password. He posed as like a Republican businessman abroad, which is hilarious. Uh, so they're out there in Algeria and flaunting around and he and Eldridge Cleaver got along for a while, but then they kind of had a falling out. Eldridge Cleaver of the Black Panthers was a little too much for Leary. And I'm sure he looked at Leary like, what, what's this dude's deal? Uh, Strange bedfellows for sure. In 1971, the couple fled to Switzerland where they were sheltered and effectively imprisoned by a high living arms dealer, Michelle Hochard, who claimed he had an obligation as a gentleman to protect philosophers. (laughs) <laughs> Bouchard intended to broker a surreptitious film deal and force Leary to assign his future earnings, which Leary eventually won back. So he's in the underworld now. Uh, he kind of played with fire and he got more than he ordered at this point. Uh, he's in 19- a He's a fugitive. In 1972, yeah. Nixon's Attorney General, John Mitchell, persuaded the Swiss government to imprison Leary, which it did for a month, but refused to extradite him to the U.S. I practically guarantee his Swiss uh, prison accommodations were better than those I had in grad school. Uh, and the bread and the food was, <laughs> the food was probably better. Um, no shade. It's just the sure. reality. Yeah. Leary and Rosemary separated later that year. She traveled widely, then moved back to the U.S. where she lived as a fugitive until the 1990s. Shortly after his separation from Rosemary in 72, Leary became involved with uh, Swiss-born British socialite Joanna Harkert Smith, uh, a stepdaughter of financier Arpad Plesh and ex-girlfriend of Hochard. The couple married, quote-unquote, in a hotel under the influence of cocaine and LSD two weeks after they were introduced. (laughs) And Harcourt Smith used his surname until their breakup in 77. They traveled to Vienna, then Beirut, and finally ended up in Kabul, Afghanistan. In 72, according to Lucy Sante, wow. yeah, Afghanistan had no extradition treaty with the United States, but this stricture did not apply to American airliners. American authorities used that interpretation of the law to inter- interdict Leary. Before Leary could deplane, he was arrested by an agent of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. Leary asserted a different story on appeal before the California Court of Appeal for the 2nd District. Namely, he testified further that he had a valid passport in Kabul and that it was confiscated while he was in a line at the American Embassy in Kabul a few days prior to the day when he boarded the plane. After his passport was confiscated, he was taken to Central Police Headquarters. He did not attempt to contact the American Embassy. The Kabul police held him in custody and took him to a police hotel. The cousin of the king of Afghanistan came to see him and told him it was a national holiday, that the king and the officials were out of Kabul, and that he, the cousin, would get a lawyer and see that Leary had a hearing. On the morning the airplane airplane left Kabul, officials of Afghanistan told him he was to leave Afghanistan. Leary replied he would not leave without a hearing until he got his passport back. They said the Americans had his passport and he was taken to the airplane. Leary's bail was set at $5 million. <laughs> the judge <laughs> the judge at his remand hearing said, if he is allowed to travel freely, he will speak publicly and spread his ideas. 
Facing 95 years in prison, Leary hired criminal defense attorney Bruce Margolin. Leary, Wait, mostly, they're just sorry, they're just stating he's a political prisoner. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's he's not a, even wow. Right. It's thought crime. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Crazy. it's thought crime and crime for writing and crime for he's the Pied Piper of the psychedelic movement and the authorities have got to shut him down. Uh, if there's any argument that could be made, he, he was clearly not some some sort of a spook because mm-hmm. I don't think there's always an outside chance. You don't know. Uh, but somebody else. And, and sometimes the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Right. So true. he could be, he could be under guidance or whatever of one entity and not be known to another entity. But yeah, right. I, I, but this, I agree with you. I don't think he's a spook in any uh, direct way. I think he, you know, he might've been being nudged here and there, but. Right. Uh, okay. So. Leary mostly directed his own defense strategy, which was unsuccessful. The jury convicted him after deliberating for less than two hours, not even uh, like a quarter of an LSD trip. (laughs) and You're out. (laughs) Um, Yeah, we we should measure time for Leary and number of trips. (laughs) Leary received five years for his prison escape, added to his original 10 year sentence. In 73, he was sent to Folsom in California and put in solitary. Well in Folsom, he was placed in a cell right next to Charles Manson, which we will go into further (laughs) on the After Dark for Patreon, patreon.com slash art of dark pod. We will go into that a bit more. And that is wild. The the theory is that they were kind of um they were kind of poking fun at him a bit. Uh we're gonna put you next to this nutcase. You two are uh two peas in a pod. You're gonna right. you're gonna hang out. Right. Uh, so Leary became an FBI informant in order to shorten his prison sentence and entered the witness protection program upon his release in '76. Oh, I didn't know that. That's mm-hmm. crazy. He claimed that he feigned cooperation with the FBI investigation of Weatherman by providing information that they already had or that was of little consequence. The FBI gave him the code name Charlie Thrush. In a 1974 news conference, Ginsburg, Ramdas, and Leary's 25-year-old son, J- Jack, denounced Leary, calling him a cop informant, liar, and paranoid schizophrenic. Now, they would rec- Ramdas at least would reconcile with Leary and ha- would have a lot of nice things to say about Leary later. Yeah. Yeah. No prosecution stemmed from his FBI reporting. Okay, so... Mm. Did Leary play the game? He is playing the big game. Timothy Leary in the big game. Right, right, exactly. Yes, this is a man in the arena. In 1999, a letter from 22 friends of Timothy Leary sought to soften impressions of the FBI episode. It was signed by authors such as Rushkov, Kesey, Robert Anton Wilson, who Leary influenced a lot, Susan Sarandon, uh, and Leary's goddaughter, Winona Ryder, also signed. Huh. Winona Ryder is his hmm. goddaughter. Did not know that. Okay. Uh, the letter said okay. that Leary. Okay. Yeah. The Leary said. Uh, the letter said that Leary had smuggled the message to the Weather Underground, informing it that he was considering making a deal with the FBI, and he then waited for their approval. The reported reply was, "We understand." The letter writers did not provide confirmation that the Weather Underground okayed his cooperation with the FBI. Well, in prison. Leary was sued by the parents of Vernon Powell Cox, who had jumped from a third story window of a Berkeley apartment while under the influence of LSD. Cox had taken the drug after attending a lecture by Leary promoting LSD use. There's a whole period here uh, where he had been doing college lectures, and then later he would go on and do many more. Leary was unable to be present due to his incarceration and unable to arrange for legal representation. A default judgment was entered. uh, against him in the amount of a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> That's what. <laughs> okay, you have. Okay, I'm not gonna. We'll just leave it at that. Uh, okay, post prison, and I'm just at this point because I know we've gone so long, and I had this planned all along. I'm just into the. Mm-hmm. I'm into the Wikipedia uh, in order to hit these hit these beats. Um, in April of '76, Governor Jerry Brown released Leary from prison. After uh, uh, so new governor, new governor, new administration. This is ridiculous. Let this guy out. Uh, a Democrat. 
After briefly re relocating to Santa Fe, New Mexico, with Harkert Smith under the auspices of the U.S. Federal Witness Protection Program, the couple separated in early of uh, 1977. Leary then moved to Laurel Canyon in L.A., and he lived there for the rest mm -hmm. of his life. Now, he wasn't able to get a regular academic or research appointment, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. But he could publish books and maintain his upper middle class lifestyle by doing paid appearances at colleges and nightclubs as a self-described stand-up philosopher. Oh, so <laughs> is, is this busy part of the the book deal speaker fee archipelago or is this yes. so, something a little yes. different? Yeah. Yeah. And I think he he deserved it. He had been yeah. through he gave it all away to pursue his crazy dream. And right. I, I would I'd pay a cold fifty to to hear Timmy Leary talk for 90 minutes for sure. Well, yeah. I think it would be worth it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, mm -hmm. it, just to, to be, to, to, to put your finger on that cur current of American history in a way. Yeah. Fascinating. For sure. Absolutely. I mean, and depending on whether you're for Leary or against Leary or you're on the fence, uh, big figure and mm -hmm. a philosopher really, and quite a life. To be imprisoned for your ideas as much as for the drugs. Uh, he wasn't dealing uh, marijuana. He wasn't bringing, bringing bricks bricks back from Mexico. He was he was put away for these m small personal use amounts, and it was yeah, all political. He, he yeah, he's the most egregious case. They did this to a few other people. Uh, the guy, John Sinclair, who um, led something called the White Panther Party. He's actually a, a Detroit guy. But th in this same era, there was a there's a John Lennon song about him. There's a number of these people who it was like, we want to lock them up. We want to put them away. We want to shut them up. And really, the only thing we can get them on is weed. So, you know, find a way to either find them with marijuana or get them to have marijuana, you know, just give it to them by an undercover police officer or something and then bust them. And then, you know, these draconian drug laws, then we can do whatever we want with them. And thank goodness we don't live in a period like that anymore. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <clears throat> Phew. Woof. <laughs> in, in 1978, he married filmmaker Barbara Bloom, also known as Barbara Chase, sister of actress Tanya Roberts, he adopted Bloom's young son, Zachary, and raised him as his own. So that's lovely. Mm -hmm. He also took on several godchildren, including Winona Ryder, the daughter of his archivist, Michael Horowitz, and technologist oh. Joey Ito. Joy Ito. Mm -hmm. uh, Leary developed an improbable partnership with, with former foe G. Gordon Liddy, the Watergate burglar and conservative radio talk show host. <laughs> they toured the lecture circuit in 1988, 82, yeah. as ex-cons. <laughs> debating a range of is issues, including gay rights, abortion, welfare, and the environment. Mm -hmm. Leary generally espoused left-wing views. Yeah, his brain was cooked. Yeah. Well, literally, <laughs> Liddy generally espoused right-wing perspectives, probably drinking a lot of scotch. Right. <laughs> the two were... <laughs> Liddy, yeah. Liddy was such an attention whore, though. Like, I, I did a little uh, on the Twitter account, you know, I do these, like, daily whatever. It's a couple tweet account of a person and i did one on g gordon liddy he had a license plate that said h2o gate like oh he's, my such God. A, he's such a like a he, he wanted the attention so bad and he wanted that to is... be an important person so bad it's mm. kind of it's pathetic but anyway okay you know. yeah i think it's, it's very boomer it's very funny it is. Yeah. yeah greatest generation whatever it is <laughs> yeah. all right so the tour generated a lot of publicity. Uh, there's a documentary called Return Engagement uh, that chronicled that tour and the release of flashbacks. I did not watch that one. I need to find that. Uh, so Leary's long germinating memoir uh, is flashbacks, but then biographer Robert Greenfield has since asserted that much of what Leary reported as fact in flashbacks is pure fantasy. <laughs> so take that take that for what you will i didn't read exclusively from that book and it's his own voice so uh in september of 88 he held a fundraiser for the libertarian party and presidential candidate ron paul oh so that's interesting yeah so he's he's out and about uh he continued to have a lifestyle through the 80s he's maintaining it he's making money 
Uh, he associated with lots of people, the names of whom we've already mentioned, including, but then David Byrne, which is quite fun. He appeared in Johnny Depp's and uh, Jibby Haynes' uh, film Stuff. Uh, okay, I don't know about that, but it, it, very interesting. He continued to take a wide, wide array of drugs, ranging from psychedelics to MDMA, alcohol, heroin. Hmm. Uh, he hmm. did this in private. He avoided proselytizing in media appearances um, during the war on drugs during the presidency of Reagan. Uh, yeah. He really, at this point, got into space colonization and life extension. He was ah. very, very interested in being cryogenically frozen up until the very end of his life. Uh, he, the, he had the acid, the acid head to I want to live forever pipeline. <laughs> yes, like the well known, the well documented <laughs> like that. LSD yeah. to immortality pipeline. Yes. He expounded mm -hmm. on his eight circuit model of consciousness in books, info psychology, a revision of exopsychology. He invented the acronym SMILE, S M I 2, like the um, exponential 2 L E, as a succinct summary of his pre transhumanist agenda. So now we're getting into SM, space migration, I squared intelligence increase, LE, life extension. So some very interesting, yeah, very so He's a technocrat. Stuff. He's a social engineer now. 100%. I think that's fair to say. And it's it follows with his relationship to Huxley and also with his nature and what he was. He was a scientist uh, and, and a bit of a poet, but fundamentally he, he was a scientist. Um mm -hmm. So let's talk about a little bit about his space colonization plan. Initially, 5,000 of Earth's most virile and intelligent individuals. Well, we've got 4,998 because you've got two right here. Uh, so you, the number has gone That's down. Right. You, you and me. Yeah. We'll be the podcasters in space. <laughs> um, it, it would be launched on a vessel, Starseed One, equipped with luxurious amenities. Uh, this idea was inspired by musician Paul Kantner's concept album, Blows Against the Empire, which was derived from Robert A. Heinlein's Lazarus Long series. While incarcerated in Folsom, uh, Leary became enamored by Princeton University physicist Gerard K. O'Neill's plans to construct a giant Eden-like high orbital mini Earths, as documented in the Robert Anton Wilson <laughs> lecture, Homes on Lagrange, using raw materials from the moon, orbital rocks, and obsolete satellites. Now, in my, let's work on Earth. That's that's my two cents about it. Let's just work on let's work on Minneapolis. Yeah. Thank you. End of story. Yeah. I, I think I think people who get too much money and too much power, it's like just okay. It's maybe a yes and thing. I, okay, I don't want to. I don't want to editorialize. Yeah. But this stuff does drive me absolutely crazy. Uh, yeah, there is a certain sense of like of like. Okay, well, you either ignore the fact that there are problems here, or you like kind of. There is a certain arrogance of like, oh, we won't even need to solve those solve those because we'll be on living on Mars before right, yeah, it's an issue. They, it's like, well, you know how many problems that's going to be, and also. Yeah. Anyway, I'm 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 gen in I'm directionally in agreement with you on this. Yeah, I don't want to get too much into it. Maybe we talk about it a little bit uh, on the after dark. I just think it's the kind of thing that somebody gets who gets paid thirty thousand dollars to go speak for ninety minutes starts to think about. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> well, let's go to space. Yeah. Like, well, okay, you're not everybody <laughs> shares your experience so uh in any case right. in the 80s he became fascinated by computers the internet and vr he proclaimed the pc is the lsd of the 1990s and he enjoined <laughs> historically technophobic bohemians bohemians to turn on boot up jack in he oh became God. a promoter of vr systems and sometimes demonstrated a prototype of the Mattel Power Glove as part of his lectures. Uh, That's way scarier. That phrase is way scarier to me than his original one. <laughs> I, I wonder, and we'll get to this on our final question of the show, what would Timmy Leary be doing now? But mm -hmm. I, I wonder what he would make of the current situation. Uh, okay, moving on. Well, here, actually, I, I got the book. I'm going to read from the book. Uh, we're, we're approaching yeah. the end here. This is from chaos and cyber culture. Uh, 
I do admire him for making for making that connection and for seeing that because more than acid, uh, the internet has affected my life and our lives. Oh, absolutely, I'd be absolutely, hundred yeah. percent lying. Terrence so, McKenna beat this drum too. Actually, that mm-hmm. you know, eventually, that basically the the line between computer and drug would become so blurry as to there be no distinguishing between them at some point. So he has this chapter that's devoted to cyber sex, and he's got a little header in there, the Zen of cyber fuck. Ron and Vicky were using the power of modern electronics to brain fuck, that is, to link up their nervous systems by means of carefully selected signals transmitted between their computers by the phone lines. These lovers have thus become members of a fast-growing erotic network. Those who have discovered the intimate possibilities of cyber sex. The secret is this. Computer screens have a powerful hypnotic ability to create altered states in the brain. Two people communicating through their fast feedback computers can access a range of brain circuits arguably wider than can be reached by bodily contact. This is because the brain and the computer work the same way in the language of electric impulses of light. All of us, I am sure, want to improve the wondrous pleasures that come through the soft tissues and silky membranes, tender hands, soft probing finger, fingers, wet lips, soft curving thighs, sweet satin mounds, and bulging protuberances. No one is implying that the basic skin tissue hardware is in any way outmoded. Nothing can replace the kissing, cuddling, licking, nuzzling, nibbling, smelling, murmuring, sucking, joking, smoking, honeymooning, fondling, biting, entering, and receiving the tender exchange of love, soft bruises. But... However enjoyable, our bodily contacts exist for us only as registered in our brains. We sense the touch and taste and perfume and the membrane softness of our lovers only in clusters of electric signals picked up by our nerve neurons and programmed by our mind wear. People who use computer signals to arouse each other's sexual desires have stumbled onto the next evolutionary step in human interaction. Quantum sex. Cyber lust. <laughs> Multimate, Infocom, Lotus 2, 3, 4, Electronic Arts, Radio Shacking, Broderbund, the Commodore, after all, is the commander of a fleet of pleasure craft. <laughs> <laughs> Man, old Tim, old Tim Leary could get horny over anything. Oh, he you know? was horny. <laughs> old Timmy Leary. Timmy Francis Leary. Yeah. You but, imagine seeing a uh, Commodore, a Commodore gets sat on your desk and you just get hard. Just like, oh boy, <laughs> here we go, baby. Yeah. Bonk. <laughs> All right. Coming to an end here. Uh, he served as a consultant to Billy Idol on the production of the 93 album Cyberpunk. He's a futurist. That's yeah. one of the things that is about. This was his third act. Uh, in 90, 1990, his daughter Susan, then 42, was arrested in L.A. for shooting her boyfriend in the head as he slept. Oh, boy. Uh, she was ruled mentally unfit to stand trial for murder on two occasions. After years of mental instability, she died by suicide in jail. Oh, God. <sighs> for all of this, do you know? It's like Brando. Yeah. yeah. Where you, just, yeah. you just go, for all of this. Mm-hmm. You still have something like that happen. That must have been just devastating. Uh, And then, of course, here we go again. Although he considered her the great love of his life, Leary and Barbara divorced in 1992. According to friend and collaborator John Perry Barlow, Tim basically gave me permission to be her lover. He couldn't be for her what she needed sexually, so it made more sense for him to anoint someone to do that for him. Thereafter, he ensconced himself in a diverse circle of prominent figures, including Johnny Depp, Susan Sarandon, Dan Aykroyd, Zach Leary, Rushkoff, and Spin Magazine publisher Bob Gucciani Jr. <laughs> Despite declining health, he maintained a regular schedule of public appearances throughout uh, through 1994. Reflecting a modicum of political rehabilitation after several failed attempts to adapt, flashback as a film or television miniseries, he was the subject of a symposium of the American Psychological Association that year. Hmm. From 89 on, he began to establish, reestablish his connection to unconventional religious movements. And so he was making these connections. See, they were going to do a symposium in 1994, Winter Star Symposium. That was canceled. Uh, that, that maybe wasn't something he organized, but it was like some sort of a pagan, neo-pagan thing. Hmm. 
Um, in 92, in front of hundreds of neo-pagans, Leary declared, I've always considered myself a pagan. Uh-oh, I got to get the beads. Straight to <laughs> straight to hell, Timmy Leary. You got to <laughs> embrace the one true faith, of course. Yeah, so. after all of this, yeah. this, we can't forgive that. That's... No, that's the one thing we can't forgive. I'm <laughs> rattling my beads. Uh, um, of course, I am. I'm joking to a degree. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He also collaborated with a fellow named Eric Gillitson on Load and Run, High Tech Paganism, Digital Polytheism. I mean, this guy was seeing what was coming wow. for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. He released an album in 96. Uh, he recorded an album, Right to Fly, with Simon Stokes. That was released in July of 96. And now we were, we are arriving at his death. Uh, and the end of the trip for now. Mm-hmm. Timothy Leary's dead. No, 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 no. He's on the outside looking in. Mm-hmm. In January 1995, he was diagnosed with inoperable prostate cancer. He then notified Ramdas and other old friends and began the process of directed dying, which he termed designer dying. <laughs> Leary did not reveal the condition to the press at that time, but did so after Jerry Garcia's death in August. They're all mm. starting to go out. Yeah. Uh, although Ramdas would live quite a quite a few more years. Leary yeah. and Ram. Yep. Leary and Ramdas reunited before Timothy Leary's death uh, in May of 1996, which is love to see. Uh, lovely to see. And this is uh, there's a documentary about this called "Dying to Know Ramdas and Timothy Leary." There's a lot of good media about Leary if you want to get at it on YouTube and all the other streaming. Mm -hmm. We are on YouTube too. So go to the website, artofdarkpie.com, find the YouTube link, subscribe, please. Leary's last book was Chaos and Cyberculture, which I just read uh, from now. In it, he wrote, the time has come to talk cheerfully and joke sassily about personal responsibility for managing the dying process. In his Mm -hmm. book, Design for Dying, uh, which uh, tried to give a new perspective on death and dying that was published posthumously. So that's mm-hmm. very interesting. Mm-hmm. Leary, Leary wrote about his belief that death is emerging with the entire life process. I can co-sign that. Yeah, I'm good with that. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's I think a good way of looking at it. I think you could you could wrap the doctrine the around that if you wanted to. It is where we return bodily, and then who knows what else happens. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, all right. Now, this is some interesting stuff. His website team, so he had a, he had a website early, uh, okay. updated his website on a daily basis as a proto-blog. The website noted his daily intake of various illicit and legal chemical substances with a predilection for nitrous oxide, LSD, and other psychedelic drugs. He was also, wow. man, squad goals. I, <laughs> I want what he has. 77 years old or whatever 76 years old still like yeah hitting the nitrous every once in a while yeah <laughs> wow he was no also noted for his trademark leary biscuit a cannabis edible consisting of a snack cracker with cheese and a small marijuana bud briefly microwaved at his request his sterile house was redecorated by the staff with an array of surreal ornamentation in his final months thousands of visitors well-wishers and old friends visited him in his california home until his last weeks, he gave many, many interviews discussing his new philosophy of embracing death. He was reportedly <laughs> excited for a number of years by the possibility of freezing his body in cryonic suspension. And he announced in September of 1988 that he, that he had signed up with Alcor for such treatment after having appeared at Alcor's grand opening the year before. He did not believe he would be resurrected in the future, but he did believe cryonics had important possibilities, even though he thought it had only one chance in a thousand. He called it his duty as a futurist, help publicize the process and hope that it would work for his grandchildren and grandchildren, if not for him. Although he said that he was lighthearted, uh, lighthearted about it. Hmm. So he, um, he initially announced that he would freeze his entire body, but due to lack of funds decided to freeze his head only. There's a very funny joke uh, that he makes uh, where it's like, you know, so what, what, Timmy, they're going to, they're going to take your brain out. They're going to put you in the body of somebody who dies young and is a body donor. And you're going to wake up like, what do you hope happens then? He's like, I just hope I don't wake up during a Republican administration. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah. Uh, one wonders what he would say now, given the right. circumstances. 
right. have the parties flipped in certain important ways. One one doesn't quite know. Right. In any case, uh, he did finally change his mind again and requested his body be cremated with his ashes scattered in space. And the documentary uh, that I watched uh, has... Ramdas sort of saying, "What's going to happen? Timmy Leary hmm. uh, is going to have his brain frozen. Maybe he goes to a Bardo hell, right? <laughs> we, you know, like, <laughs> you're taking a risk either way, aren't you, yeah. Timmy? Yeah. Uh, so pretty huh. funny, interesting. Yeah. So wait, scattered in space? You said scattered in space? I will tell you. I will come okay. to it, and I will tell you what happens. And there's a good documentary. There's another bit that happened here uh, where he reconnected with the Mary Prance, uh, Pranksters." And they picked him up in a kind of a remodel of the bus uh, and went to a big party. And he got up on stage and he's like, I'm Timothy Leary and I'm not dead. <laughs> you know, like, and, uh, I think it was one of the sons of the uh, of one of the pranksters who huh. put that movie together. That's very fun. Uh, right. So here we are. Uh, one moment. I need to get my place i'm bringing it bringing us in i'm bringing us in yeah in we're for getting a landing there. quite we're a quite there. a quite a life <laughs> man jeez leary died age 75 on may 31st of 1996 his death was videotaped for posterity at his request oh. capturing his final words which we'll discuss hmm. in the after dark on patreon the film timothy leary's dead contains a simulated sequence in which he allows his bodily functions to be suspended for the purpose of cryonic preservation. His head is removed and placed on ice. The film ends with a sequence showing the creation of the artificial head used in the film. So it looks like he's, there was a moment where I'm like, wait a minute, did he have his head frozen? No, it was like right. a, their final prank, their final joke. Oh, wow. Okay. Funny. Right. So seven grams or a quarter of an ounce of Leary's ashes were arranged by his friend, uh, at Celestis to be buried in space aboard a rocket carrying the remains of 23 others, including Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry. Huh. Which is wild. quite fun. That's wild. Uh, a Pegasus rocket containing their remains was launched on April 21st of 1997 and remained in orbit for six years until it burned up in the atmosphere. That's kind of beautiful. Huh. Yeah. Leary's Why ashes, not, man. Why not go yeah. to space? I mean, for him, it makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. The ashes were given to the, the remaining ashes were given to close friends and family. In 2015, Susan Sarandon brought some of his ashes to the Burning Man Festival in <laughs> Black Rock City, Nevada, and put them into an art installation there. The ashes <laughs> were burned along with the installation uh, that, that year. Uh, and that is more or less the <laughs> life of timothy francis leary wild wild oh. dude nice job dude there's a lot of a lot of threads a lot of threads in old duder's head there uh, this <laughs> is... <laughs> a lot of threads in old timmy's <laughs> noggin he won no, that was final that... cracker he say yeah. one oh. and one and yeah Oh man, it uh that this is I mean we've done we say this a lot I suppose but this is certainly one of these people who it's like it's a history lesson getting to know this guy's life. You got in like you, he he's in touch with so many different scenes and so many different people and he you know we say in our in the beginning we're, this show is about the people who move culture. Normally we're talking about people who have um distinct creative output. But I mean this guy did move culture for a whole generation of people. I mean, even the people who hate who who hate him are put, forced into a position relative to him, right? It's it's you know. So yeah, that was that was fascinating. Nice work, Kevin. Ah, oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanna I wanna close out. I had a little bit more about his influence, but I think it's also kind of totally apparent. Mm -hmm. uh, he, I, did I cover the final? I just want to make sure I get the 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 final fifth wife in there uh, to uh, to make sure I do honor to that because that stuff's important yeah Barbara Chase Bar yeah uh, yeah okay so I already got there it was just just a lot to track he yeah. had a daughter Susan a son Jack a son Marlon and a son Zach adopted and he he did have a partner 
Joanna Harcourt Smith, he can be like a common law wife from 72 to 77. Mm-hmm. Uh, he separated from Rosemary in 72 in, in any case. And then he adopted uh, Zach. It also claims Leary was a member of the Church of the Subgenius. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, that sort of squares, doesn't it? I want to let him get the last word. Uh, so I've got Timmy in his own words here from his book flashbacks and then we're going to ask the question and sign off before we come back on after dark talk about come together the beatles timmy leary charles manson and uh his final words and probably a few other things because there's going to be a lot to talk we got a lot to unpack here don't we yeah yeah for sure here we go here's timmy As I look back over this rich, continually changing, and utterly entertaining life, I realize that my dedication to certain concepts has never wavered. I have relentlessly and faithfully pursued self-exploration, evolution, and innovation as the antidotes to terminal adulthood. Changing schools, jobs, geographical locations, turning down officer status in the military and tenure in academia, from my grandfather's exhortations that I be different, to Aldous Huxley's suggestion that I become a cheerleader for change, from my first mushroom trip in Cuernavaca to my recent ketamine experiments in voluntary death, I have reprogrammed myself and encouraged others to resist, question, challenge, indeed do anything to escape the assembly line that would carry us if we are not vigilant into a final commitment to the obsolete past. The discovery of drugs at the age of 40 was an unexpected boom. Boone. Here was a direct method to regress the nervous system to the suggestible state where new reality programs could be imprinted. Exploration of one's neurological and genetic equipment can result in metamorphosis of a particularly beneficial kind. Rejuvenation. DNA's built-in warranty that the future will not be like the past. During the last two decades, it has become clear that those most attracted to processes that bring about rejuvenalization are those born after 46, the post-war wave of young people with whom my fate has been most intimately tied. I've come to respect the importance of generational demographics, which suggests that during periods of accelerated cultural change, a generation you belong to becomes the most important determinant of how you think and act. If I were to ch- were in charge of evolutionary matters on this planet, I would at this precise moment flood the place with advanced humans wired to take over peacefully and initiate the necessary changes. And behold, this is exactly what DNA seems to have done. Just then when the situation looked hopeless, here came 76 million post-war Americans, 40 million more than we expected, fresh, confident program for innovations. A recent Yakelevich uh, poll suggests that 80% of Amer- the American public is currently involved in personal fulfillment projects, most of which involve some form of rejuvenalization. Critics of this trend will say it will bring an end to the industrial age in America, and they are right. The industrial age is over. The information age has arrived. I see this as cause for celebration. Survival in the the future will be based on intelligence increase, expanding the spectrum of information we receive, improving our models for analyzing these facts, and developing more powerful modes of transmitting updated signals to others. I make this prediction with confidence and serenity, uh, serenity. The young ones are ready to turn on the higher circuits of their brains, tune in to the awesome strength of their numbers, and take charge of evolution. It's about time. Oh, dang. Wow. So did that happen? I don't know. <laughs> Are we taking charge? We, we're making a pod. We're making yeah, a pod. We're yeah, doing something. Yeah. yeah. We're making radio. Oh. Old timey radio updated <laughs> for the bird website and for right. our our friends, anonymous and face cucks alike. <laughs> and you can join us on our Telegram and tell us what you thought of the Timmy Leary ep- episode. But I only yeah. allow effusive praise in the Telegram. Right. Of course. Of course. <laughs> Otherwise, you get booted immediately. I mean, it's about it's a free speech zone. So, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, genuinely, we welcome feedback. If you like no, the show, five star it on iTunes. Say something nice on iTunes. Five star it on uh Spotify, hit mm-hmm. us up on YouTube, follow the channel. It doesn't cost you anything. We are growing. The community is growing. We're mm-hmm. having a blast. I'm having a blast. The show's evolving. We're evolving. I think the show's getting better and better as we go. We're getting yep. great guests. We've got the book club coming up. We are not fucking around on Art of Darkness. <laughs> that is absolutely right. 
Kevin, before we go, though, you, we've got to answer the question. What would you, Timmy Leary be doing now? I I will answer it. Okay. You have to answer it. Yeah, it's That's for right. you. I, right. I'm done. I am spent. I need <laughs> between this and the after dark, I need 20 minutes. I'm going to go vape some DMT, right. hang out with the machine elves. Yeah. Uh, uh, Freeze yes. your head for a brief. Freeze minute. my head. Yeah. But put my head in the re- freezer. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I, I live in Minnesota, so I'm just going to go stick it out the window, stick my head out in the snow. Brad. <laughs> Yeah, if what Timmy would, Leary were alive right now, what, 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 what would he be doing? Yeah, see, I think that prediction that he was talking about in that end, it's optimistic and it's not 100% wrong. I think he miscalculated the downsides of increasing interconnected, interconnectedness and technological sort of integration. Because The one thing he's talking about is, you know, the ability for it to basically allow us to actualize completely. The other the part he's missing is the 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 rise of the bug men. Um, And so so there's something something a little bit off there. So I do wonder if he would um, come around to more sort of strongly advocating a more of a Terrence McKenna approach, which was like you actually have to bring some of the archaic practices for forward as well to maintain your humanity. Um, But maybe I'm just superimposing that. I mean, he might be involved. The life extension stuff has come along quite a quite a bit in the last 25 years. I mean, they've done some real science on you can, you know, lower your epigenetic age and your mitochondria mitochondrial efficiency and all of that. So I think he'd be really excited about that. Um, I th- but but I, the the big mystery for me is you kind of touched on it is what would he actually think of the political environment? I mean, what would he think of Twitter? And what would he think of Elon Musk? Because Elon Musk has got some values in alignment with Tim Leary, right? Go to space, get the brains hooked up to the computer, get on renewable. Like a lot of those things on the face of them are Tim Leary kind of values. Um, so I don't know. I think he might. I'm Yeah, that, that's that's an interesting question, I think. Um, and I don't know where to land on it exactly. He uh, whatever the case is, he would be one of the most far out guys. He was one of the most far out guys in the 60s. He was one of the most far out guys in the 90s when he was 77 and, you know, in ill health. So he would still be one of the most far out guys. Yeah. Far out, man. Yeah. All yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We're going to come back on the After Dark for Patreon and we are going to talk about Charlie Manson. We're going to talk more obviously about Timmy Leary. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about the Beatles. But first, I am going to go stick my head in the snow. Lovely, lovely. Okay, Brad. I hope I hope you enjoyed that. Here come old flat top. He come groove it up slowly. He got juju eyeball. He won. Holy roller! That is about Timothy Leary, man. Look at the lyrics. All right, it is. That's a banger. All right, my friend. I'll talk to you. All right, see you a bit later.